Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Optic West. You guys are sitting in the Explorer stage, and if you check the back page of your show specials, you will see the schedule for this stage as well as the main stage. If you haven't checked out the main stage, that's through those doors. I want everyone to be aware of that. And we have a lot of exciting things planned. But before we jump into our presentations, let's see where y'all are from. Raise your hand if you guys are from in and around Monterey. Okay, we got the locals in the house. That's great. How about San Francisco? A few, very good. How about out of state? Let's see, yell it out, Where, what state? Milwaukee? Milwaukee? Well, we yeah, okay. Nice, where else? Utah in the house. Oregon, I love it. West Coasters are here, but B&H brought the East Coasters to come and have an amazing couple of days with y'all. If there are any questions about the show, about the cruise tomorrow, look for a friendly B&H face. Um, there is the help desk down over there. They'll answer all your questions. You'll get that golden ticket maybe, and we'll see you on the boat. But. Let's jump into the education, the inspiration. We are kicking things off with Colby Brown. And without further ado, let's get into it. Colby, we're ready for you. Excellent. Good luck, good luck. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mike, for the introduction. Thank you, B&H. Thank you, guys, for being here today. Um, thank you, guys, for watching on the interwebs, uh, everyone coming in. Today, I am talking about something that I'm very passionate about, uh, wildlife photography. We're gonna talk a bit about gear. We're gonna talk about some kind of tips and techniques that I recommend for you guys. We're gonna talk about some different case studies to kind of really walk through images and what it takes to get certain kinds of shots from the settings, the features, and all the different pieces together. So it's gonna be a bit of mixture of inspirational and educational, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of fun. I try to make them interactive, but I have a lot of things to talk about as well. So if you guys have questions, we can kind of figure out if we can field them here, or certainly afterwards, I'm gonna be able to talk at the Sony booth. Uh, I'm a Sony artisan as well. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So a little housekeeping to start off with, even though Instagram's a little bit of a dying platform these days, you could find me at Colby Brown Photography, or, uh, at Colby Brown Photography on Instagram. Certainly on my website, tons of information, gear setup guides, as well as photography workshops all over the world. And of course, to plug in a little video series that I did with B&H that we uh, filmed this summer in the Amazon, which was awesome. It's a seven part series. Uh, it's all free on B&H's YouTube channel. There's some great stuff on there talking about wildlife, macro, landscape, you know, you know putting together travel and trips. It's a, it's a fun series. Uh, we had a lot of fun with it. Uh, and B&H was awesome to uh, sponsor it. So, with all that being said, let's go ahead and jump right in. So as a photographer, I've been doing this professionally for roughly 18 years. And throughout the course of my career, I have photographed a wide variety of different genres. This is by design. When things get too consistent for me, it kind of freaks me out a little bit. I have to change things up. I have to find new challenges to kind of keep up the passion levels. And so when I started out initially, it was because of a love of travel. And then it was landscape and astro. And the last like six years, it's been tied towards this idea of wildlife and the challenges that it brings itself. And I think for a lot of photographers that get into wildlife photography, it doesn't necessarily start there. It's something where we end up, but it's not necessarily our inception point of what brought us into photography. For me, it was because it was based on opportunity. So I'd find myself in places like Alaska photographing glaciers or, you know, in parts of Africa photographing different cultures, like whatever it was from the travel space that pulled me in. And there just so happened to be some beautiful species to be there. And so initially this love of wildlife photography started out just based on opportunity. For some of you guys, this could be just, you know, uh, certain, you know, birds or species you guys find in your backyard, but whatever it is, it's something that was accessible that wanted that forced me to think about trying to learn new techniques or trying to dip my foot or my toe into this kind of photography. And then from there, it brought me to some amazing locations around the world that allowed me to have the space to, to really digest and invest myself into new challenges. Wildlife photography is not easy. It's not for everyone, especially once you start traveling around the world. You have different gear requirements. You have, you know, a lot of the species you're trying to photograph can be quite far away. 
Um, the species themselves, of course, not like you're working in a studio. They don't know what you want to do. So you have a lot of these elements that you typically don't have in a lot of other genres of photography. And it was that challenge that really brought me together. And then, of course, when it comes to the actual experiences that you can have around the world when it comes to wildlife, it's really just awe-inspiring. There's some amazing creatures out there, like silverback gorillas that I photograph in East Africa every year, uh, to cheetahs like you guys just saw, bald eagles, all sorts of amazing things out there where photography has been the conduit that allowed me to travel the world, to see some amazing experiences, and of course to learn to document them in different challenging environments. We're gonna talk a bit about that uh, throughout the course of our talk here. So starting off, let's talk about gear. Again, there's no way around it. Um, unlike the more accessible you know, stuff when you're shooting in a studio, or you're a landscape photographer and you get your ultra wide and tripod and you can go out and shoot anywhere, Wildlife photography is a little bit different. So let's talk a little bit about gear. As I mentioned, I'm a Sony artisan, so everything is based around the Sony gear system uh, that I'm talking about today. But of course, depending on whatever you guys are shooting, there are usually um, close proximity products that you guys can see or play around with here, or you might own yourself. So starting off, my main camera system that I use these days is the Sony A1. This is a 50 megapixel camera. Um, it is by far the favorite camera that I've ever shot with. You're talking about 30 frames per second, um, high dynamic range, 15 stops of dynamic range, at least at ISO 100. Um, you get true silent uh, capable you know, shooting, which you can get with a, um, a backlit um, CMOS sensor that is uh, stacked on top of each other. So you get crazy sensor readout speeds, 120 times a second, it's tracking autofocus, all sorts of amazing technology. This is my go-to camera that I use in the vast majority of stuff that's out there. Before the A1 came along, I used the A92, which is 24 megapixels. Has a lot of the same technology, just from a few years before. So it still had 20 frames per second. It was really great in a lot of situations. Um, it's obviously a, it's a more affordable option than the A1 if you're a sports or wildlife photographer that is trying to think about getting into this kind of space. A lot of people don't realize the value of resolution, which we're going to talk about during some of the settings and the tips and techniques, but also the dynamic range. The frames per second help, like all these different variables, again, come together to really help for wildlife photographers out there. And then the new released A7R5, uh, which just was announced last week, I believe. Um, I've only been able to use it for a few weeks now. I'm actually taking it with me. I fly out tomorrow to Alaska to go photograph bald eagles for the final um, salmon run of the season up there in Haynes. Um, it is a really interesting camera that I'm excited to put through the paces a bit more, uh, especially because obviously the resolution is 61 megapixels, but it is the first camera in the entire industry that actually has a dedicated processor to AI learning. And what I mean by that is that it's gonna be able to sit there and recognize that I'm photographing a bald eagle or an insect, uh, you know, a spider or a certain kind of bird and then project based on AI learning it's per perceived movements. And what that's gonna do is it helps the autofocus be much more accurate, much faster. And so I'm, gonna, I'm excited to see how this technology moves throughout the Sony ecosystem when it moves up into maybe the next series of the A2 and everything else that Sony has lined up. But for now, this is the only camera that has this dedicated processor specifically to AI learning and AI projection for movement, which is pretty awesome. So lenses, these are a handful of different lenses that I use in a given trip for wildlife photography. Um, there are some I use more than others. I'll talk a little bit about that. And obviously these are at wildly different price points depending on whatever your cup of tea is. So this is the Sony 100 to 400. This is an f4.5 to 5.6 variable aperture G Master Series lens. Um, this lens is a really great lens for those that are looking for kind of a upper mid-tier budget option to get into the wildlife space. At 400 millimeters, you are a bit limited when you're talking about bird photography, unless it's the larger birds, the bald eagles, things like that. If you're looking at more like kingfishers and a lot of the other small things you guys got out there, 400 is really not gonna cut it in most situations. I found myself using this quite a bit in places like Alaska and in East Africa, South Africa, India for tigers, lions, leopards, a lot of the bigger mammal species. It's a really great option, it's very sharp. Uh, it's quite fast. Um, it's been around for a few years, so I'm sure there'll be an update at some point in the next few years for this particular lens, um, but it still is a great lens option for me out there. You have the 200 to 600. This is also another variable aperture lens. This is gonna be a 5.6 to 6.3. So the caveat to this is that it's not the fastest lens, which means that you need a decent amount of light to really be able to use it. Did we just cut out here? 
Hold on. Let's see. Yeah. Well, they'll, they'll talk about tech. Uh, they'll, they'll work on tech to get that back up. But anyway, the 200 to 600 is a really great option. Again, like I said, if you have a little bit of light to work with. But if you're working under dark canopies or dunk, dark jungles, like I often find myself in, it's usually not fast enough. But the beautiful thing about this particular lens is the short distance that you get when you go from 200 to 600. It's about a two inch shift change on your zoom ring, uh, zoom ring to go from 200 to 600, which means that you can really quickly go to, from subjects that are close by to far away really easily. It's quite nice, it's very sharp. It's actually the most affordable. I think it's around like 1800 US for the MSRP for it. So it's a really great kind of starter lens to get into this wildlife space from a Sony perspective. Um, and it does a good job, like I said, assuming you have enough light. Talking about the bigger boy lenses, uh, these are lenses that I use most often that I have to find new and creative ways to shuffle around the world. We have the 400 F2.8 G Master and also the 600 F4 G Master. Now, these two lenses, when they first came out, which was about two or three years ago, they were the first lenses in the mirrorless space designed for mirrorless cameras. These lenses generally were very heavy, usually in the set, you know, seven to nine pound range. And what Sony's done with them, if you guys get a chance to play around with them here at the, uh, at the event at the Sony stage, is that the design for them, instead of being front heavy, which is what most of the glass used to be with these big lenses, where it would be very difficult for you guys to hand hold things for a longer period of time than you know, a few minutes, because they would dip forward. All the heavy glass elements were in the front. So in all these newer big lenses, everything is back towards the camera, which allows it for a lot better weight distribution. So you can hand hold these things for a lot longer. It's not for everyone. Obviously, some people will still struggle because they are still around six pounds but they are phenomenal lenses. The, two, the 400 is something that I personally use most often, again, with larger predators. So these are gonna be your lions, your tigers, your jaguars in Brazil, um, your, your, your uh, bears up in Alaska, uh, pumas, all sorts of fun stuff, anything that is a decent size. And the 600 is something that I use predominantly when I'm going on a, a bird-specific trip. So this is something where I'm photographing, you know, rollers in India or certain types of kingfishers. The 600, both of them are amazing lenses when you compare or when you pair them with something like the A1. As I mentioned before, you have stacked backside illuminated sensors on the A1. So the linear motors found in these cameras mixed in with that high uh, sensor readout speed means that you have just an insane amount of autofocus capabilities to be able to track your subjects and to have tack sharp results when you mix things with like things like eye autofocus, which we're gonna talk about here in a second. And of course you have teleconverters. These are things that I use sparingly. Um, you have the 1.4 and the two times teleconverters. Both of these have trade-offs. 1.4 is a one-stop trade-off. Two times teleconverter is a two-stop trade-off based on your minimum aperture speed. So when you put glass like this in front of your, your lens, or certain lenses that support it, you can extend your reach, but you're sacrificing a bit of that speed of the lens itself. Not shutter speed, but just in terms of the amount of light that you can reach in there with that minimum shutter speed. I've had some amazing results with the two times teleconverter with the 600 F4, photographing from a safari vehicle with like a bean bag. So you're shooting at 1200 millimeters um, and you're getting tack sharp results, which I couldn't get back in the day when I was shooting with digital SLRs. Uh, but it has to be in the right situations. We're going to talk a little bit about that idea of settings and the right type of settings that you need for a lot of wildlife situations based on your choice of lenses. But we're going to do that in a second. And of course, we have the Sony 90mm f2.8 macro. I threw this one in here because later today on the main stage at 2 o'clock, I'm giving a talk on macro wildlife photography. This is the idea of using a macro lens, your camera, and generally a flash in order to photograph some really amazing creatures out there that are often overlooked. Sometimes they're vilified if you're talking about like snakes or spiders or scorpions, frogs, some amazing creatures out there. It's a really fun talk and I, I briefly talk about it during this particular talk, but it's something I like to mention because it is a really great lens to use for a lot of these kinds of situations. So let's start off and talk here now about kind of 10 tips for wildlife photographers. So these are things they're gonna be talking a little bit about settings. We're gonna talk about some of the different features to really help make your life easier as a wildlife photographer. I always say that no matter what camera system you're using, any camera manufacturer in the last few years has really made this industry or this genre much more accessible and much easier. That technology has made 
or, or should always be made to make our lives easier, to take less time to think about the technical side of things so we can focus on the creative side. How can we create the most impactful image possible while allowing technology to help us achieve those goals rather than to get in our way, which used to be the case. So number one, this is the tip that I give really for any of these talks that I talk about wildlife photography or not, is it's customizing your camera. This is something that, again, I think a lot of people don't really put enough time into. Any of the mirrorless cameras can do this. Obviously, again, I'm talking about Sony in this particular case, but customizing your camera is the best way to make sure that any of the features of functionality that you need quick access to, you can always have it at a finger click away. So this is a picture of a Sony A1. Again, these are the, the cameras that I use the most these days. And every button that I have an, an arrow pointed to can be fully customizable. So once I get a new camera, I can go through the menu settings. I'm trying to figure out what are the set settings that I need the most access to. Maybe it's my autofocus zone area. Maybe it's, you know, how do I want to adjust ISO? You know, by default on the A1, for example, I have to press right on the rear wheel, and then I use the rear wheel to kind of dial things in. I personally don't like having that extra step. So I make it so just moving that dial on the back of the camera adjusts my ISO. And I know it's there, but for people that aren't aware, they can accidentally hit that and bump up their ISO when they don't mean to. But it's little things like that makes a big difference when it comes to being out there in the field, needing to make a quick adjustment, and being able to dial in these settings to give you the results that you want. I think the biggest thing that I hear, because I've taught workshops for 18 years now, with clients that come on workshops in the wildlife space especially, is that they've moved to a new camera system and they don't know it. And so they spend a lot of time out there in the field fumbling around the menus, coming to me and saying, how do I do this, how do I do that? This solves that problem. No matter what camera system that you're on, Canon, Nikon, Sony, Fuji, Olympus, like spend time to get to know your camera. Try to think more proactively about the different features that you need, the settings that you need to have access to, and then dial them in so that when you're out there in the field, you're just focusing on what's important which again is taking images to begin with. So sh shutter speed is king. This is something that sounds basic, but I find that a lot of people, again, struggle with it. Um, especially, I, you know, I, I run a handful of large groups on, on Facebook, photography groups, again, titled around the Sony system. And I get a lot of people that are like, you know, why are my images soft in these situations? And more times than not, it's they're not using the right shutter speed when it comes to wildlife photography. The reason for that is that the speed that you use for your shutter speed should be predicated on a handful of different variables. Number one is gonna be the movement of your subject. That's pretty obvious. Uh, you know, a fast moving hummingbird is gonna require a different shutter speed than something like, uh, like a flamingo um, or, or a, a bear or a caiman. Like it really just depends on the type of situation. The other variable that plays into a role that, again, people, I think, don't think about as much anymore for some reason is that the millimeter length that you're shooting at also plays a role. Now, before I talked a little bit about using the 600 f4 and putting a two times teleconverter on it to photograph a kingfisher, which would be great if I had it as a demonstration, but I didn't put it into this presentation. And the reason that that worked is because I was shooting at 1,200 millimeters. And what that means is that I really need to increase my shutter speed, even if I'm stationary, because every single small minute movement can make a big difference in having things just slightly off focus to completely out of focus. And the best analogy that I can give for this is that if you guys are sitting outside and you see a plane moving across your frame, if you're looking at it with the, the human eye and you look up into the sky, it looks like the plane is moving incredibly slow. But all of a sudden, if you look at it with your one of your lenses, even if it's a 7200 or you know, a 600 F4, all of a sudden that thing's moving fastly through your subject, uh, th through your composition. And so that's a good rule to remember is that if you are shooting, or the higher millimeter uh, range that you're shooting at, mixed in with the speed of your subject, you need to use a much higher shutter speed than you might actually think that you need to. And then when you mix that with the situation that you find yourself in, are you shooting from a gimbal? Are you hand holding? If you are hand holding, how good are you about actually holding and being stable? A lot of people have natural sway and movements as they're just standing there. Breathing makes a big difference. Like all sorts of different factors come into play. So the first thing that you should think about when you're taking pictures, if your images are coming out slightly less uh, sharp than you think they should be, especially when it comes to things like bird photography, increase your shutter speed and see if you're getting better results. 
It's a really easy way to kind of jump into it. But in situations like this, again, flamingos aren't the fastest moving birds. They're kind of clumsy, actually. Uh, but because I was close and I was using a 600 millimeter f4 lens, I needed to shoot at 1 200th of a second to make sure that I was getting tack sharp results throughout. I was able to drop that down when I was photographing uh, bears. So photographing uh, brown bears is at McNeil River up in Alaska. And being able to photograph and capture this particular bear, um, because I was shooting from a gimbal head, there wasn't a ton of extra movement. I wasn't shooting at 600 f4s with a 100 to 400. I was able to get really nice results by lowering that shutter speed, saving myself some ISO zones of noise to deal with in post-processing. And then shooting from a boat, photographing a large Cayman in Brazil, same thing, the boat was, uh, wasn't moving very, uh, very much. I was much closer to the subjects. Again, this was something around the 400 millimeter range, and so I didn't have to use such higher uh, shutter speeds. So looking at your images, again, number one, make sure that you're using a shutter speed that is conducive to the speed of the, uh, the creature, the species that you're trying to photograph, but also that it's in relation to the millimeter length that you're actually uh, using in order to try to capture the photograph to begin with. So more frames, the better. This is, again, is another just one of those variables that plays a role when it comes to wildlife photography. Um, this is, again, one of the things that I love about the A1. A lot of people that I know, well, a handful of people that I know when the A1 came out, especially people from other competing uh, you know, brands, said, why do I need 30 frames per second? Says every single person that hasn't used 30 frames per second. Once you actually get used to it, assuming you're using it in the right positions, you're not actually using 30 frames per second with a bird perched on a tree and you have 300 images from you know, six seconds of holding down your shutter speed, it makes a huge difference in making sure that you're getting that exact moment. Wildlife photography is a moment that is measured in nanoseconds. There are times when you know, the you know, specific species of bird, for example, have the sheen that covers, covers, uh, comes over and covers their eye, like bald eagles. And if you miss that one moment where you might have everything else perfect, you have the wings clipped, you have the, the, the claws and talons outspread to pick up the, the, um, the bird, the fish that's in the water, but then all of a sudden you have that one just sliver of moment where it missed. If you had a higher shutter speed camera with uh, higher frames per second, then you would have had better results. So frames per second matter. They're not everything, but they help a big difference. And like for me, when I go from the A1 with 30 frames per second to like the new A7R5 shooting at 10, that's a big difference. I have to think about that when it comes to what type of application I'm gonna find myself using those particular cameras in because 30 frames per second is awesome if you have the ability to shoot 30 frames per second. Animal eye autofocus is a game changer. Game changer is such a horrible you know, terminology that everyone uses way too often. Uh, but I think in this case, it actually is true. Um, it's great to see um, that some of the other major brands in the mirrorless space also have uh, caught up and are offering similar opportunities. Regardless of what camera system you have, if you have the ability to shoot with eye autofocus specifically for wildlife images, it makes your life so much easier. It is so nice to be able to find yourself in situations where no matter, well, I would say no matter what, 99% of the time, you're able to lock onto the eyes every single time and get the shots and the result that you want. You get to focus more on composition, making sure you have the right kind of exposure. But in situations like this, you can literally see on the Sony, you have this green dot that goes around the, the, the frame and it follows the eye wherever it's going. And when you're in APS-C, you're in continuous autofocus mode, then you're sitting there and you're tracking it the entire time, knowing that anytime you take that shot, you know that you have a much higher probability for those images to come out. And if you are a digital SLR shooter or you're shooting with a camera that doesn't have that feature, I'm sure you can relate to the fact that you're like, oh, I nailed the shot, it's great. And then you check it out on your laptop when you get back to your hotel or whatnot and like focused on the nose, focus just behind the eye, all sorts of situations happen out there. Eye autofocus is huge. And what initially started off with just mammals, mostly it was, it was honestly built for cats and dogs, but it, it ended up porting over to a lot of the bigger feline cats is that Bird autofocus has played a big role. So being able to use bird IIF to track your subjects in flight as they're moving at full speed in most situations is incredible. You no longer have to worry about the beak, you know, it, it grabbing the beak and missing the eyes. You don't have to worry about it being off in other certain areas. You always know that you're gonna get the results that you want. And what's happening now is it's also moving down into insects and smaller creatures. 
Um, this is a, a small baby chameleon I photographed in Uganda just a few weeks ago. And being able to see it track the eyes and species that have different facial structures. Because that's essentially how this technology works, is each of these manufacturers load thousands and thousands of images into a processing unit on the cameras to sit there and say, the, you know, these are different types of birds, these are different types of mammals, these are different types of insects, for example, now. And then it's going to look at what you're looking at and try to match it the closest that it can so it has an idea of what the eye is supposed to look like. So that's how it's trying to figure out what's happening. And as technology gets better, as processors get better, like you have in the A7R5 where you have a dedicated processor specifically to AI learning, this is only going to continue to elevate and get bigger and bigger and bigger in terms of the feature sets that you can do with these cameras moving forward. And then the results are pretty astounding when you could find yourself in a situation where you, you know, this is a, a photographing a, a puffin in Iceland. This is with the Sony A1 with the 200 to 600 millimeter lens. Turned around, I was photographing a, a group of puffins um, about five meters to the left of it. Turned around, saw this guy standing on a rock on the outcrop. Turned around, took me about half a second to focus. Took a couple shots. Bird took off, got the shot that I wanted. Wasn't even intended and planning for it. But if I didn't have those other, th th that technology, IAF in there, it would have made it a much more difficult shot, and I might not have been able to capture it. Yes, uh, I appreciate it. I'll, I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah, it was a, it was a close shot, and because they were, they were above me, I was laying on the ground. We'll talk about perspective in a second. But I was laying on the ground looking up at the puffin, and that's why I had the, the blue skies in the background kind of just wash everything else out. And it was so close, it was right there at the minimum focus distance for that particular lens, which I believe is around 10 feet. So I didn't have to crop in at all. This is a full frame shot, 50 megapixels. Um, but yeah, it was, again, it lucked out. It was a, a second, you know, a chance of nanoseconds. You had a, just a couple seconds to grab the shot or you missed it. All right, so let's talk, uh, let's keep going and talk about this because we have 35 minutes left and still a lot to cover. So steady shot modes, this is again is something that is not the most sexy thing to talk about, but a lot of people have these big, you know, beautiful lenses that you guys use to photograph wildlife. And I think the majority of people, probably three-fourths of people, don't even know what the different steady shot modes are or stabilization modes are on your particular camera. Again, these are tied to Sony's latest lenses, but they're similar throughout a lot of the different manufacturers out there. So the first mode, mode number one, is by default, that's your standard stabilization mode. This is essentially just if you don't know the type of situation you're going to find yourself, you leave it in mode one by default, and it just makes sense. The reason for these modes is a little bit of a backstory is that the gyro inside of the lens mixed in, at least with the Sony system, you also have the sensor stabilization work together depending on the type of movement to help stabilize things for you. And so when you have a standard stabilization, it's going to do kind of the generic uh, approach to uh, stabilization based on those, the gyros. Mode number two is best for panning shots. So this means that instead of kind of your standard movement that you have just kind of moving left and back or left and right in terms of breathing or whatnot, is that you're actually panning left to right. You're doing full movements left to right, chasing a bird or a motorcycle, whatever it is you're trying to pan. So mode number two is best for panning situations. Mode number three is for erratic subject movement. This is again, in the wildlife world, this is if you're photographing hummingbirds if you guys photograph hummingbirds, you know that they move fast and quick in, in all different directions. And so this is one of the best ways that you can make sure that the stabilization will help you in those particular modes, making sure that the gyro is accounting for the different types of movement that are out there. So for your particular lens brand, if it's not with Sony, just check your, your manual, but make sure that you know it is a, a feature that can help you with certain types of shots, especially if you find yourself shooting with slightly slower shutter speeds than you might have initially intended to. So being okay to shoot at high ISOs. As I mentioned before, the vast majority of people that I know that have entered the wildlife space did so after they first entered another genre of photography. Especially a lot of people are in the landscape space, and then all of a sudden they're like me. They found themselves with opportunities, and they're like, hey, I want to learn how to photograph birds or bears or leopards or snow, whatever it is. And so they find themselves coming over here, and they take with them the lessons that they learned, especially the landscape photographers, this is the most common, where they're sitting there and they never want to break free from using ISO 100. In a utopian world with beautiful light, which we'll talk about a little bit later, that's great. I'd love for everyone to shoot ISO 100 for all of your wildlife needs. It is just not a reality out there. And the reason for that is because you need to shoot at higher shutter speeds. So higher shutter speeds in order to counter for, like we talked about before, subject movement, millimeter length that you're shooting with. You need to shoot at higher ISOs in order to counter for that. 
So the higher ISOs has been great because it allows you to really freeze moments in time that you couldn't otherwise do. And so with the 3200 uh, 3, ISO, I was able to shoot, I think it was at 6400, in order to get the shot per uh, perfectly with both of these two hummingbirds being in the same plane of focus with a 600 millimeter f4 lens. And the reason that the ISO isn't, well, a couple things. One, Cessna technology uh, is much better than it was before. So it's going to handle your noise much better, especially if you're shooting in daylight or with some light. You're not going to have as much noise to deal with just because sensors are better and they're handling them. On top of that, post-processing tools are much better than they have been before. There are software out there such as Topaz's Denoise. Uh, On One has their own Denoise software. You have, you have Pure Raw with DxO. All sorts of great options to find yourself in situations where you're shooting at incredible high ISOs that you would have normally not wanted to, and they can clean up the results and give you uh, amazing results uh, to be able to work with after the fact. I like to use this particular image. Uh, this is a photograph of a female jaguar in the lower Amazon basin, in the, the Pantanal region of Brazil. And this particular shot was shot after sunset. So jaguars are the only big cats that actually hunt in the water. Almost all other cats hate water. If you have a house cat, you would understand this. They, they, they despise it. Jaguars don't. Jaguars hunt in the water. They hunt caiman, capybara. So they spend the majority of their time in the water, which is why they're actually beefier cats. They have more muscle mass because they have to swim through the water to feed for, uh, to, to get most of their food. And so to photograph these or to find these, you're on boats in this particular region of the lower Amazon basin, going up and down the different river systems. And it was at the end of the day, after the end of a safari, we saw this female that was out there and she was hanging out and the light had already gone down. So even though if you're shooting at 3200 ISO, there was almost no visible light left or very little visible light left. And so this image was incredibly noisy. I shot it with a Sony, I think it was actually the A92 at the time and the 400 millimeter F2.8 at 2.8, trying to ink out as much light as I possibly can out of this particular shot. And then running it through Topaz at the time, being able to clean up the shot and have an image like this, you wouldn't think that it was shot way past twilight with 400 ISO, it would be full of noise, but it's a beautiful shot. It might not be something that I would blow up massive size or license someone to have on Times Square or whatnot because you might still find some noise there, but in the vast majority of applications, including printing, it is a phenomenal shot still. So shooting at higher ISOs and being comfortable with that is a really big lesson for those that get into this space from another genre where, like I said, you'd prefer to shoot everything at ISO 100, uh, and I'd be there with you as well. So. so be silent when possible. This is something that has become, I want to say, an issue, something that's more prevalent now than it ever has been before. And what I mean by that is that now you have so many cameras out there that shoot truly silent. So the A9 series with Sony was the first one in the mirrorless full frame space to actually do this. Now all of the, re uh, the rest of the Sony's lineup does this. You also have this with Canon and Nikon and a lot of the other options out there. And a funny story, um, so when the A9 first came out, I found myself in East Africa, no, South Africa actually, and I was with a ranger that I had been known for years. I, I arrived, I dropped myself at the hotel, we went on our first game drive, and we were out there for three or four different uh, hours photographing a wide variety of different things. We're stopping, we're seeing cheetahs and lions and rhinos and elephants. And after about three or four hours, he turned around to me and he said, hey man, are, Colby, are, are you gonna take any photos? And I go, what are you talking about? I've been taking photos the whole time. I have taken like 1,000 or 2,000 by now. But it was, my camera was on purely silent. He was used to the sound of digital SLRs. And what's happened now is that because the silent mode has gotten so much better with a lot of the issues that they first started with, a lot more of these manufacturers have them. And now when you find yourself on a trip where you have a handful of digital SLR shooters out there as well with their mechanical shutter going off, it's a deafening sound. It makes a lot of sound out there in situations. And in some situations, that actually can still be problematic for certain kinds of species. So if you do have a, a camera that can shoot in silent mode, take advantage of that because the results can be great and you find yourself not distracting from the animals, pulling away from them, or scaring them off, especially when it comes to the macro space. You can see with the frog there on the left, the, the glass frog. So silent mode is, is a big piece. Save custom camera modes. This is something, again, most people don't really think about. This is something I highly recommend. If you find yourself shooting either different types of genres of species at the same time, or if you find yourself dabbling with still and video work 
at the same time. So what this is is essentially the different custom modes you have on your cameras. Most camera man uh, manufacturers, you see this at the top dial. This is where you have one, two, and three here again on the Sony A1. And what you can do is you can custom save very specific settings to each of those different modes. So if you find yourself shooting in a situation, well, let's move forward here. I'll come back to that. So if you find yourself photographing a Jaguar in, uh, in Brazil, and then all of a sudden the boat takes off and you're going down the river and you find yourself you know, grabbing an egret, caching a fish, those two are gonna be generally very different uh, exposures, very different types of shutter speeds. And so you can save different camera modes where you can make sure that you have a faster shutter speed on, on mode one, a slower shutter speed on mode two, and you can dial those in. More times than not, coming back to the settings, I actually dial mine in for photos and video because I take a lot of B-roll of animals when I'm out there. So when I come across a scene like the Jaguar, especially if I have the time, I'll meter for exactly the type of exposure I want, save those settings, change into video mode really quickly, adjust my settings for proper video mode, and that way, for the rest of that session, I can go from mode one to mode two in a second and make sure that I'm dialing in for each of the different needs that I have. So it's a really great tool, like I said, if you find yourself photographing different types of genre, or different types of species, or if you are dabbling with still and video work at the same time. So chase quality light, um, again, this is something that is relatively self-explanatory, but is again, probably the biggest cause of people wanting to elevate their images to be better. Um, oftentimes when I do events like this, I also do portfolio reviews and I walk through and talk to people about their stuff and they're showing me their images and it might be a beautiful species, but it was taking at the wrong time of day and it's backlit and things just, you don't get the detail that you want. Shooting in the right kind of light makes a huge difference. No matter how skilled you are at Photoshop or Lightroom or Capture One or whatever software you use, you can't elevate a bad photo into an amazing one. You can make a bad photo less bad, but you can't necessarily turn it into an epic shot. And a large portion of photography in general, no matter what genre you're talking about, is always about wanting to find the best light possible. For wildlife photography, this generally means at the beginning or the tail ends of the day, like all, anything that is taken really outside. Um, but it makes a huge difference in the quality of light that you're trying to go for. And this is where you can find yourself shooting at lower ISOs than you might uh, you know, otherwise not be able to because of there actually is light within the scene that can allow you to really capture those colors and that, that, that contrast. And the same thing can be happening. It's not just the early morning light that you get like this Jaguar again in Brazil. It can also be overcast skies. Overcast skies are great for wildlife photographers. Every time I go to places like Costa Rica where this uh, keel-billed toucan was taken, I love overcast skies because it gives me that even light. Even though it's a little bit darker, that means that I know I'm not gonna have any hot spots. It's gonna be a really great easy light to work with, especially when I'm in the post-process, really bring back some of those colors that might have been a little bit flat because it was taken during overcast, but really saves things and, and creates, to me, some really unique images. And then the same thing can be said about macro photography. So macro photography, again, I have a talk at two o'clock specifically about this, but the beautiful thing about flash is that when done right, it allows you to pull out so many different colors that you couldn't see naturally, which is really amazing. This is a very uh, unique and rare poison dart frog that I photographed actually in the Amazon for that same YouTube series with B&H you guys can see um, on, on, on YouTube. Uh, but it was amazing to use the off-camera flash system to be able to pull away with results like this with beautiful color, beautiful detail, pull all the different pieces together. And the only way I was able to do that was being able to use flash within my current setup. So don't forget your macro lens. Uh, this is, again, uh, something that we, we talked a bit about. Um, this is that idea that a lot of photographers kind of shrug off this idea of wildlife photography from a macro space. But this is probably the most accessible kind of wildlife photography that most people can get into. There are certainly different types of bird species that you can probably find in most of your backyards, whether you guys are here from Monterey or around California, around the United States, or anywhere you're traveling around the world. But there's so many amazing creatures that you can truly find in your own, your, your parks, your state parks, your backyard, depending on where you live, that you can use macro wildlife photography to really learn to take advantage of, to, to 
to apply new techniques, to, to enjoy new challenges of using Flash, and come away with some really amazing results. Um, to me, for the last couple of years, it's really opened my eyes to a whole different genre or style of photography. It's really caused me to think more proactively about the subjects I like to photograph, uh, the different kinds of images uh, I like to go after. And to use Flash as in a way to elevate the type of work that I'm trying to do is something five years ago, I would have said the same thing that most of you guys that don't shoot Flash or that don't know Flash probably said the same thing, which is, I'm a natural light photographer. It's not something that's for me. The reality is, if you guys, I mean, you guys are here, you guys probably will watch Scott Kelby's talk tomorrow about Flash. He's kind of the Flash king from the education standpoint. Like, he'll tell you that most people that say that don't know Flash. If you know Flash, you know how to do it well, you know how it can help in certain kinds of situations, it can truly be beneficial for certain kinds of photography. And from the wildlife space, I'm personally most comfortable using this in these types of environments rather than with the bigger mammals or species that are a little bit more susceptible to flash and how it affects their eyes and things like that compared to the diurnal animals that you get in the macro space, the amphibians and the reptiles and the insects. But it really opens up, like I said, a lot of doors, stuff you guys can do in your own backyard. And like I said, I won't, I won't uh, focus too much on that because we will have uh, a whole conversation about that for those that have the ability to join at two o'clock for that specific talk. So let's talk about a few different case studies. So we can talk actually about settings and kind of workflow process, what I'm thinking about, and kind of go from there. So Jaguar on the move, this is again uh, a similar image from not too many minutes after one of the images I shared a few minutes ago. This was a particular shot of a female Jaguar that was known in this particular region of uh, the river systems we were navigating. And what was happening is that she was in hunting mode. So she had two cubs, um, mostly more sub-adults than cubs, but two little ones that she was feeding and still hadn't fully trained. So I knew that in the morning she was going out hunting, and generally she's moving from left to right or right to left along the riverbanks. And having an idea of where she might go helps with anticipating the movement. And so what would happen is that as we're down there, I'm talking to my boat driver and the guy that we have down there that I work with uh, on a regular basis. And I sit there and I'm gonna see where the Jaguar is when we first arrive, and then I'm gonna try to predict where that creature is gonna go. And this comes from studying the creatures that you're photographing, or if you don't have the time, or if you're visiting a place for the first time, finding guides that know what they're doing, because this makes the biggest difference when it comes to working on a safari of any kind, whether you're in Brazil or in Africa, is to work with people that can get you in the right positions at the right time with the right gear and having everything kind of come together. But in this particular situation, I saw her, um, it was about 100 meters further to the right, but she was moving left to right. I know from previous experience with this particular uh, uh, female that she liked to jump on these logs to look for caiman. She would go up there, she'd look around to see if there's anything that she could pounce on because the caimans are too fast in the water for them to swim after them. So they will lunge at them to try to go hunting. So I knew exactly where I felt she was going to be, positioned our boat while everyone else that was out there on this particular river system was all photographing her behind weeds and as walking around, no one getting any good shots. And then I parked our boat right in front of the exact tree I thought she was gonna go onto, dialed in for all my clients, sat there and waited for about six minutes, and sure enough, she came, positioned herself, she jumped up, um, and gave us a couple of these shots looking straight down the gullet of the tree that, had, that was down. So positioning yourself, dialing in your shutter speed, if you wanna get that jumping movement of what's happening, and dialing in all the different features to account for the specific kind of light that you have, these are great situations where you have that time um, as we were waiting for the Jaguar to approach to really dial in our exposure. So even though I had myself and the rest of my workshop clients looking at the, uh, just the tree branch and the light that was there, dial in all your settings so that you're not fumbling around once the act creature actually gets there. Dial it in there, wait for it, jumped up, turned around, had about two and a half seconds of it looking straight down, and then I continued to walk down, eventually sat down, um, and we got some great portrait shots and other things afterwards, but these were some of my favorite, where it's looking straight down at you, making eye contact, giving you that kind of look through the window of the soul. But for this particular case study, it's that idea of anticipating moments, of being able to prepare yourself with beautiful light, getting up early in the morning. Every morning out there, we're out around five o'clock in the morning, getting out on the water so we're in the right places at the right time. And of course, making sure everyone has the right gear. As I mentioned before, Usually when I'm photographing larger predators, I love 
the 400 millimeter f2.8 because the background bokeh that you get at 2.8 with that particular lens mixed in with the compression is just, uh, it, it's addictive, to be honest. Um, but it is, that combined with all the different features kind of coming together, that's how we pulled off this shot. So anticipation, right time, right place, right gear, dialing your settings, and waiting for the shot. So birds in flight, as we talked about before, this is that idea of making sure that your settings are accounting for uh, movement speed. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, perch and takeoff shots in a second in another case study. But in this particular case, making sure that you're having, you're dialing in using a high enough ISO. So in this case, it was ISO 100. We're shooting at F4, because so I was shooting with the 600 millimeter F4. And so the plane of focus in most of the situations where I try to place myself, especially when it comes to larger birds like bald eagles, is that I'm placing myself to get the shots that are more um, parallel, or I guess more, I guess more perpendicular for the shot I'm trying to get, which means that my plane of focus is going to be the same. I don't need to worry about shooting instead of f4. I can shoot, uh, you know, f5.6. f4 gives me enough to make sure that the wing tips are sharp, the birds are sharp as long as I nail focus. And then one two thousandths of a second, because bald eagles don't move that fast. They're actually kind of slow birds if you've ever seen them actually flying. But when they're landing, they do or they can pick up speed and have quick jolts of movement. So I always try to make sure that if it's general in flight with bald eagles, usually I'm shooting more so around a thousandth or 1200th of a second, somewhere around there, 1250. But when it actually comes to them landing, feeding, or fighting, I usually quickly jump up my shutter speed for those particular moments. Usually in these types of situations, I will have my ISO set on to auto, and then I'll drop my exposure compensation, which essentially drops that ISO down just a little bit by about a stop just in case, so I don't blow out the highlights. Usually there's more snow on these situations for the bald eagles with the white feathers, snow in the background, but this just helps worry about overblowing your highlights. And then make sure that the rest of the settings are all dialed in. And then you're just tracking the subject as it's coming along. Again, taking advantage of 30 frames per second. I probably should, should have shown the sister images here where you had the different movements of the birds and the feathers, but this was by far my favorite. You get the blood on the beak. Uh, the eagle had just finished fishing on the salmon, going in for the landing. It was, you know, all the pieces kind of coming together. But those were, those were the different elements of the exposure that I thought were most important and, and why I chose to use them. And when you mix that with, again, bold, uh, or sorry, hummingbirds, as we talked about before, this is where we had to shoot higher ISOs. This is a similar situation to that other photo that I shared. But it's still using the 600 millimeter F4. And this is where I positioned myself. This was actually at a, um, it was near a feeder in Catsalas National Park in Costa Rica. Shooting with the 600 millimeter F4, I literally measured out from the feeder to figure out exactly where 12 feet was, which is the minimum focus distance for the 600 millimeter F4. And I literally had to have my tripod and gimbal head against the, the, the back wall of the area that we were at to get that minimum focus distance, knowing that I was gonna get everything in focus because they were always coming in kind of at the side angles. And then jumping up and shooting with that higher shutter speed, making sure, giving you a higher probability to get them mostly tack shark in the winds. It's very difficult to get tack shark wing shots when it comes to hummingbirds because they move so fast. But being able to pull two of them together in a situation like this, uh, pulling in your ISO, using, uh, sometimes they're feeding like this, they're actually hanging around for a second or two as they go for the nectar. And so you actually can get eye out of focus to play a big role in these types of situations, which is pretty amazing to think about just how fast these, these subjects move. Uh, but it can be a lot of fun. And the last one for birds in flight, I actually like to talk about using flash at night. So this is again in Costa Rica. This is actually photographing fruit bats. Uh, we use a four camera, uh, or four flash, uh, four flash off camera setup. And so we set it up around a particular um, a plant, uh, giving it a little bit of, of nectar. This particular area is known to do this. So some of the bats uh, know about this particular experience. So they come out and then dialing in your settings from there. Now, this was shot with the, the Sony A1 7200 F2.8 G Master, because we weren't that far away, but it's super dark. And so what happens is that we light up the, the plant to begin with, manual focus for the front of the plant, shoot at a higher aperture than we might necessarily normally do. So F22, you are gonna get some diffraction issues, which essentially means that it's gonna be a little bit soft in the overall results. Diffraction, we can have a whole conversation about what that actually means. Essentially, when you shoot at too high of an aperture, um, light is hitting your sensor at different depths because of how 
the square or the, the rectangle sensor works in relation to a round lens opening so that as light hits the different elements of the sensor or different portions, it has to travel distant difference or different distances in order to actually reach the sensor. And so this is most common when you shoot at higher apertures. In this case, I'm willing to sacrifice and get some diffraction. We'll have to uh, correct for that with sharpening and post-production so that I ha had a higher chance because I was manual focusing at dark with off-camera flash in order to still get everything in focus and have tack sharp results. Uh, for these particular shots. And then the interesting thing about using flash, specifically with moving subjects like bats or hummingbirds, is that you don't need to use high shutter speeds. First, you can't, because most cameras can't go over 1 200th of a second, except for the Sony A1, which is the only mirrorless camera, only camera in the world, I think, that actually can shoot at 1 400th of a second for a flash sync speed. But even 1 400th of a second during daylight would be not even remotely fast enough for these situations. But when you're using flash, because you're overpowering all the natural light that's there, or the lack of light, you can shoot at very low shutter speeds and actually still get tack shark results in a lot of situations. It's pretty amazing. So these bats are moving high speeds, almost like hummingbirds, but shooting at 1 25th of a second, you can still get that tack shark results um, using flash in these situations. So perch bird and takeoff, this is something I just like to talk specifically about with some of the larger uh, species of birds. This is again, bald eagles in Alaska. This again comes down to knowing the types of species that you're trying to photograph. So knowing the type of species that you're trying to photograph makes a big difference because then you can know the tells for when certain species are gonna do very specific things. So for me, when I'm looking at birds perched, I'm looking at, I'm looking at their eyes, I'm looking at their head movement, I'm looking if they're moving around uh, their feet and their talons. Um, if they've gone, especially with bald eagles or the larger raptors, if they've just gone the bathroom, oftentimes that means they're lightening their load, they're getting ready to take off. And so the whole point of that is to know when you can expect them to get those shots where they've just taken off. This is a little bit busy in the background for this particular shot, but that's where you get those shots where the photographers are literally sitting in, dialing into that one bird waiting for that takeoff moment. And then you're dialing your settings accordingly. Because again, most people when you're shooting or photographing birds that are perched, you're shooting at lower uh, shutter speeds because their birds aren't moving very much so that you can keep your ISOs down. But if that bird suddenly takes off and you're shooting at a lower shutter speed, what happens with your results? You get a blurry bird that just took off from a, a perch. So I like to mention this in terms of our case study because it determines the type of intent that you have when you're trying to capture these types of images. If you want to get that shot of the bird reaching off the perch and going, be prepared, have your settings dialed in for that. Shoot at a higher shutter speed, make sure your ISO zone uh, or your, your, uh, your uh, artificial uh, autofocus zone is correctly set, or you're sitting on tracking mode, like whatever it is, dial in the settings for the shot you want to get, rather than the spaghetti test and just hope you're gonna get all of it. I find if I'm very specific in what I'm trying to get, I have a much higher success rate than if I'm just trying to get everything all at once. Uh, okay, we have a few more quickly and we only have a few more minutes. So the vertical shot, again, this is something I like to mention because the vast majority of wildlife photographers shoot everything horizontally, and I understand the reason for that. And there's actually some technical reason for that is because most of our gyro or IBS systems are actually built more so for horizontal movement, not once you go vertical and track subjects. So if you're tracking subjects that are, are moving, shoot horizontal. Otherwise, you're gonna get horrible results, no matter what camera manufacturer, it just doesn't work the same. And then you can just recrop afterwards if you wanna create a vertical shot. But for situations like this where there's either static or there, you know that there's not gonna be too much leeway movement, get a couple of your horizontal shot, you know you're gonna get, and then quickly rotate your camera Get a couple of verticals as well. Some great shots you can get. This is how you, all the people are getting the shots. You get covers of magazines, all sorts of other fun stuff. Vertical shots are super important, and it's something that I actively have to remind my clients of when they're out there in the field, because like I said, you get done with a shooting ses uh, session and 95% of images will all be horizontal. So mix it up a little bit depending on the situation. And then I think the last one we have here is the, the water level shot. This is mostly about perspective. So. Photographing things at eye level, to me, is always the ideal. Sometimes I like bird photos where the bird's flying overhead, and that's quite nice. But more times than not, I like to meet my subjects at their level, and it's not always easy. In this particular situation, this was a Cayman that was taken, uh, in, again, down in, uh, I think it was in Ecuador or Brazil. But either way, this was a shallow pond. It was a mid-sized Cayman. 
I was photographing with a 100 to 400 uh, millimeter lens. Uh, at the time, I was shooting with the A7R III. And the beautiful thing is that on the mirrorless cameras, you have this articulating screen that comes out. So usually I shoot with a battery grip, but I had it off particular in this case because I wanted to get as low to the ground as possible. And so what happened is that I lowered the camera, I, I put the, the lens um, in my hand um, underneath uh, the, the lens sitting on top of my palm. And then I'm lowering myself to the water so that my hand is getting wet. So the camera stays above, I articulate the screen out, find my composition, and that's how you get those kind of perfect level shots. Now you can't do this obviously from a boat or other things, but because we were on land, because we were close, Caymans are pretty docile, they're not like saltwater crocs. It gave me that opportunity to come away with a unique shot that is much different than if I was a foot or two higher, or certainly if I was standing at six foot three, like you know how tall I actually am. So thinking about perspective and trying to meet as many of your subjects as you can at eye level can make a big difference in the quality of images that you're trying to create. So that's a wrap. That's everything we have for today. Um, I will be at the Sony booth somewhere uh, to field questions for you guys, for anything that you guys want to talk about in particular. Again, uh, if you guys don't get a chance to ask questions, you can reach out to me through social media, through my website. Happy to talk, yeah, talk you through anything. But thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for watching live. And I'll see you guys at 2 o'clock for my next talk. So we're doubling up on Colby. 2 o'clock, he'll be on the main stage. And he'll be doing a meet and greet after that presentation at the Sony booth. That's going to be at 3 o'clock. So write down your questions. Hold on to them. Catch him walking around the show. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, sir. Well done. Yes.
One, two, three, four. Yep. Yeah, can we uh, like put a check on that? Like, can we hold it? Can we check on that? Can we check on that? Well, you ready? Uh, it sounds like I'm on. I have no idea whose water this is, so I'm putting it over here someplace. Cool. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Sure, walk past my class. Thanks well, a lot. What is, what is your class? <laughs> the Pirate's Guide to Z9. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Pirate's Guide to Z9. Yeah, absolutely. Nikon Z9. Okay. It is a camera. Okay. Yes. I don't know it. I am next. Perfect. I'm not sure about perfect, but I'll try to be entertaining. Okay, we are queuing up the next presentation here on the Explorer stage. We have Paul Van Allen, who's going to be talking about the Z9, and he's got a nice headline for it, the Pirate's Guide to the Z9. Can't wait to see it. Really looking forward to it. Thank you guys for joining us, and hello to everyone on the digital streams. Um, we're so happy you're here to join us as well. So without further ado, Paul Van Allen, take the stage. Am I up? I'm up. Thank you, sir. Dun, dun, dun. Am I being recorded? Am I being recorded? Am I being recorded? You're being recorded. So please, hit play now. All right, you guys ready? You guys good? You good? All right. Ye old pirate's guide to... Z of nine. Okay, I build PowerPoint for fun. It seemed like a good idea about midnight when I came up with it a couple months ago. Yeah, it's a good idea. Uh, my name is Paul, for those who don't know me already. Uh, I work for NPS, which naturally means, you probably think it means Nikon Professional Services. You're wrong. In this case, it happens to mean Nikon Photo Sea Dog. I probably, I'll, I'll try to eliminate the args, but I can't help it, so. Uh, anyway, uh, I got my start right out of school as a sports photographer, and it, they, they, they kind of make me take pictures at Nikon. Uh, the coolest job on the entire planet. They, they actually give me all the new gear and make me shoot pictures with it. If you haven't been to my table already, if you're here, it, it, here in Monterey with us, um, this is from the new 600 millimeter F4 built in TC, and I have a sample of it at our booth. So it's one of two in the country, come over and drool on it. So I, I just, I get to play with it a little bit. It just, I mean, I like taking, making pictures. Uh, I try to do a little bit of everything. The different programs we've built over the past couple years during the pandemic, as ranges from sports and sports to landscape to studio to just about everything. Uh, and it's just not stills. It's actually uh, movie stuff too. So I try to get my hand in a little bit of everything. In fact, uh, a couple nights ago, I introduced the brand new class, the new tele, uh, time lapse class. So studio stuff, playing around, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I try to make pictures of everything to answer as many questions as possible for you guys. During the pandemic, like most of you, I try to keep from going bored and totally stupid. So I took up bird photography because there's no model releases required for birds. Go to the zoo, a lot of zoos say, hey, that's my, my snow leopard, you gotta have a model release for it. So no, birds, no model release at all. And I'm the laziest bird photographer you'll ever meet. This is shot remotely through my iPad, using my SnapBridge app, to my camera that's on the front porch, with a telephoto lens aimed at a pile of, pile of bird seed. I am watching the Avengers Endgame movie for the fourth time while making this picture. So truly lazy. Uh, my wife and I finally found something we can do together during the pandemic photographically. She's a non-photographer. She believes that cell phones are God's gift to imaging. Um, I disagree with her. But she's into food and into creating in the kitchen. 
And so we actually come together. She bakes stuff, and I try to photograph it. So her baking is better than my photographing of her baking. By the way, just so you mark it down your calendar, January 29 is National Chocolate Cake Day. Okay? Obviously, I know exactly what that day is. So, um, yeah, it's all sorts of fun stuff. She makes it, and I kind of photograph it. All new techniques to learn is always something new to learn. Uh, we were talking this morning at the booth about uh, focus shift shooting or focus stacking. In fact, at 3 o'clock, come back, and Vincent Versace will talk about some focus stacking stuff that he's, gonna, he's doing. Hi, Ambassador Odom. How are you? So all sorts of fun stuff. Simple pictures like this aren't so simple. You start thinking about it. How do you get the depth of field so that it doesn't fall off from the wingtips to the body and the body wingtip? Because this is equally sharp wherever you are. That's because we're using HDR, but for focusing, called focus stacking. It's 45 different planes of focus stacked together to create an unlimited plane of focus. So anyway, uh, you're bound to have questions. If you're here locally, please come by and see me at the booth after the class. If you're online, that's my Instagram. Drop me an email. We'll figure it out together. Okay? All right. It'll come back up again at the end. So let's start with this. Hooked. A lot of you know that you can access your menus with the menu button. You can use the navigation pad on the back of the camera, the multi-selector, and you can scroll around it up or down, left or right. You can move this around. What you might not know is that there are times when you're, you've got your, your eye up to the viewfinder. You want to access the menu. You know how hard it is to get your thumb in there and use a multi-selector? Well, it, it's almost impossible, right? Did you know that, you know what, tell you what, maybe, maybe it's not up to your eye. Maybe you're just out there. Maybe you're in the cold. You got your gloves on. Wait for it. You got your gloves on. <laughs> or maybe, just maybe, it's your first day with your hook. It could happen. It's a pirate's guide, for gosh sake, OK? If you can't access the, the multi-selector for any reason, what you can do is you can navigate the menus with your command and sub-command input dial. The command dial, the one in the back of the camera, if you're in the menu, scroll it left to right, and you go up or down your menu selection. Slide your index finger forward onto the, so you go do this, do this, sorry, slow animation. Da, da, da. The sub-selector up front goes left or right. So up or down, left or right. Okay, slide this way. So yeah, it's just really that easy. So you can use either the multi-selector or the navigation dials to navigate your menu systems in your Z9. <laughs> anyway. Now, as long as we're talking about that, we'll talk about how to make things not move. One of the biggest questions we had on this one as we moved into mirrorless systems was how do I lock my focus point? Well, on the Z9, it's pretty easy. We're going to access our menu systems. We're going to go into the custom menu at F2. Go right into that one. And we're going to actually select, you can select almost any of the function buttons will do this. I'm going to pick on the one that I use the least. I know that a lot of you have that muscle memory of hitting the upper right left-hand corner of the back of your camera as playback. As soon as I turned my camera vertical, and was like, I figured I could use the playback button without moving my, can my hand. I immediately forgot that muscle memory. So I like the playback where it is now. So I have the, the lock button. It's kind of a useless dead key right now. So I reprogrammed that one to, for my lock function. So I'm going to come in here, hit OK, and the default setting on the Z9, the way it comes out of the box, is actually the picture control mode. So let's slide down, and there's like 40, no, right now, with version 3, I think we passed 50 different options for this button. One of the options is lock. So you simply go down, access, lock, hit OK. Now the way it works after you have it set is using the camera and you want to lock your autofocus point. Maybe you're in a studio or you're mousing around and you don't want the focus point to move at all. You're going to hold your assigned button down, then go to move your focus point in any direction. Use the navigation pad and just lock it. 
Okay? And now, when you go to try to, try to move that, it tells you the focus point's locked and it can't be moved. To unlock it, it's the exact same process backwards. Pull the button down again, navigation pad, and you're all set to go. Now it's unlocked. But as long as we're here, that exact same setting does other things. I find this especially handy in a studio environment where I'm able to lock my shutter speed and aperture, hold the button down, rotate the shutter dial one click, either direction, it locks the shutter speed. Hold the button down and rotate the sub-command input dial, it locks the aperture. To unlock it, you hold the button down and rotate the dial again. One click either direction. It's now locked or unlocked. That's how the lock function works. So if you're looking for a way to lock the focus point or lock your shutter speed or lock your aperture, simply assign one of your custom buttons to the lock function from the F2 menu. Easy? Thank you, you're very responsive. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. All right, autofocus because it wasn't hard enough. That's it, that's the autofocus options in the Z9. Just the area modes, okay? We're gonna go through every single one of these things today and examine exactly a different, no, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna show you the couple that I use. When I'm out doing sports, especially people sports, um, not horse sports, but people sports, where I can actually get a solid shot of a face I will traditionally go with a wide area with a human face or eye tracking. So basically set up like that. So wide area, small is my, is my go-to under most situations. Let me back up and say there is no perfect setting for everything. If you want one setting to do everything for you all the time, you have that. It's in your back pocket, it's one of these things, okay? If you want, I wanna make it, then use, if you wanna take a picture, use one of these. If you wanna make a photograph, you'll have a lot more options and tools to work with. Okay. Now there are times where this doesn't work that well. Team sports. This mode is all color-based tracking. It tracks in part based on the color pattern the camera can see and follow around the screen. And that works really, really well until you have a lot of people in the same color, producing the same color pattern, and the camera goes, which one of these people do you want? This one's pretty easy, I'm on the, on the guy in the white. But it becomes more problematic for things like this. It's the wrong tool for the job. So I need to fix it quickly. Well, obviously, you simply take the camera, you pull away from your eye, you hit the menu button, you scroll through the different options, and then you go back, get the, find the right option, hit OK, put it back up to your eye, and start, okay? For these kind of situations where the color is not doing what I want it to do, it's actually working against me, I'll fall back to dynamic area autofocus, which is a pure math-based tracking. Doesn't look at the color, doesn't look at faces, doesn't look at scenes, it looks at the math. How fast is that subject moving from here to there? Is it moving from here to there faster? Is it decelerating, accelerating? How's it moving? It's projective that way, okay? So it's all math-based. There's no color input on top of the math. So the challenge becomes, how do you switch between one or the other quickly? Your cameras can be customized to do this very, very simply. These are the buttons on your camera that can activate autofocus. There are nine of them. Did I count that right? Yeah, nine of them. Okay. You can assign every one, well, seven of these nine to different autofocus areas at your discretion. So, I don't do that, I do two. My brain is way too feeble to try to get all the different, two, two, this many, two. So what I did is in the custom control menu again, 
So we're custom, we're in the F group, go to F2 again, we're to customize where the buttons work in the camera. If you're following along at home, make sure that you know how to undo this. I don't do this on stage, okay? So you come in here. I'm gonna assign, in this particular case, I'm gonna assign function one, which is the front of the camera, as you can see here on the graphic, front of the camera, top button. I'm gonna make that one an autofocus activation button. So I'm going to the menu. I'm gonna scroll through the, I think now 60 plus options on this one. Da, 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 da. Oh, AF area plus autofocus on. Okay. Not to be confused with the autofocus area mode above that or the AF on below it. This is the one where you push, you actually program a button. When we push the button in, it's gonna turn on autofocus in a pre-selected autofocus area mode. Okay, in my case, it'll be dynamic area autofocus. My fallback, okay? Come in here, you have all the different options to choose from. So you come down to dynamic, for me, dynamic medium, because dynamic medium and wide area small have a similar size box. So visually, it doesn't startle me when I go between the two of them. The box I'm looking at is roughly the same size, just doing different kinds of focusing now, okay? Hit okay. The graphic shows we've actually pre-selected and confirmed we've actually done that one. So the way this now works, I've selected as my primary focus point, I've got wide area small. On my shutter button, because I'm a shutter button shooter, I know some of you aren't, I am. It's okay if you're not, I feel your pain. We feel like we're left out, we're not back button autofocus, we feel like we're left out. But right now I'm gonna shoot my shutter button. When I hold the shutter button down by itself, I get wide area small. If during the middle of composing, getting focused, getting ready to go, I decide it's not focusing the way I want it to. I hold my finger on the shutter button still, getting ready to go. Now I take my middle finger and move it towards F1 and press down F1, and now I am in dynamic area autofocus. When I'm done with that, I say, okay, okay, I think I'm done. Let's the surfer. Early in the morning, I like photographing surfing out at Huntington Beach. As the surfer paddles out towards the wave, they are laying down, face down on a surfboard in the ocean. It's early in the morning. They have a black wetsuit on a black ocean in the dark. My camera doesn't recognize that as a person. So the wide area with face finder can't see the face. It doesn't know what it's looking at. So it gets confused and starts jumping all over the place trying to find that face. I press in my middle finger onto the F1 button and all of a sudden it's now locked onto the surfer as it's face down. As she hits the top of the wave and starts to stand up, I can start seeing her face in her human form again. I let go of the F1 button and stay on the shutter button and now it jumps from dynamic back into wide area autofocus and face tracks. Okay. So it really is just that easy. Now if you're not a shutter button shooter, that's quite all right because we can actually assign all these different buttons. So maybe you are a, uh, the one I just talked about, see the front of the camera, you have the green as a secondary and the shutter button is the primary, autofocus. But if you're a back button shooter, you could totally do this backwards and do it all in the back. So you can do your primary and autofocus on. Your secondary could be the joystick button. You can press in on the joystick and activate autofocus on the joystick. So you see like, autofocus on, that's not working, slide down, joystick, that's working. And back and forth. Right now, I'm, going to, I'm a hybrid shooter. My secondary AF mode is currently not on F1 anymore, but I've actually moved it. So I have shutter button for the primary and AF on for the secondary. But you can do all of this. Just however your brain happens to work, okay? And you can do it for anything you want. So, make sense? Look at us, we're almost on time. All right, deja vu. No, that's spelled properly. Talk about playback. One of the things you can do in playback, as you know, you probably look, as you probably know, on a mirrorless camera, you can see the image through the viewfinder. A lot of you have pre-assigned a button to play back real quickly. What I did though is again in F2, I went and assigned a button. In this case, I'll use the same F1 example. I'm gonna actually change it from nothing. Now remember, this is, sorry. This is not F2 anymore, this is F3, my apologies. F3 is a playback customization. 
So your camera can be set up to do different things depending on what mode you're in. So now we're talking about the buttons just for playback because it's still programmed to do the autofocus thing over here, but the same button now in playback will be something totally different. So in F3, they're coming in here. It does nothing during playback currently. I can make it access the playback, make it play the image back. I'm gonna go up here instead to zoom. 100% magnification with one press of the button. It works on the back of the OK button has it also. I like it better up front. I can also program when I'm doing my landscapes and checking for fine critical focus and landscapes in studio. I'll assign number the function two button for 200% magnification to double check the fine focus. But here we're doing 100%. And so now I'm in playback. I want to check, make sure the face is tack sharp. I hit the function one button because assigned to 100% playback and I get a zoom up on the, the subject. It's really that fast and simple. Just by touching the button in the front of the camera. Okay. Our friend Jerry didn't know this. We were at uh, WPPI. And so I built this one just for Jerry. Deja review. There's been a, a function in the Nikon cameras for a very, very long time. It's one of those things we've, we've talked about it 17, 18 years ago for one whole generation camera. This is really cool. You can do this. It was a cool pics camera, but you can do this. We started putting in every single camera and we totally stopped talking about it. To the point where famous wedding photographers, maybe the best wedding photographer on the planet, actually there was three of them on stage that night, so none of them knew this. When you're actually looking at a picture, reviewing an image you made on your camera, one of the things you might want to do is double check faces and eyeballs, okay? So you, naturally you're gonna zoom up on the image, you're gonna zoom, 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 okay? But I see one set of eyeballs. I wanna check all the eyeballs in the picture. As you zoom up, when you get to the, the fill the face, of the, the face of the frame that you want, then take your index finger, slide it forward to the sub-command input dial, and rotate it, and it will jump between the faces in the frame, just like that. Doesn't work for animals, it's human face finders. Okay? No! No, that's just right out of the box! That, I know, I was stunned, I'm like, I, like I showed Jerry, I said, so let me double check the faces. He goes, let me check the faces. I'm like, I, I got them, we're all good. He goes, how'd you do that so fast? I showed him, he went, was that Z9 only? I said, no, all of them do it. All what? All the cameras for the past 20 years or so. So it's one of those, those weird things we keep doing and we keep forgetting we did them so we don't talk about them. So yeah, there you go. You zoom back and yeah. And notice there's a small little bird's eye view in the bottom right hand corner of the frame. It shows you what faces it detect. Sometimes it misses. Sometimes your face is turned halfway around it, doesn't see it as a face. Sometimes you have a helmet on or glasses on, doesn't notice it as a face. But yeah, if you want a quick, easy way to find all the faces in your frame quickly, this is a really good place to start. Okay? Yeah, so half, for those of you at home, half the front row just picked up their cameras and are taking pictures of people around here, checking all the faces. All right. Um, Landscape guys, who here shoots landscapes? Oh good, I have a cool thing for you then, just for you. I can make it so you can bracket with one press of one button. Not holding it down, touch it, it'll bracket, do your entire bracketing series. We're simply gonna en engage bracketing and self timer simultaneously, okay? So you can actually do this. You set your bracketing up, so you can set your frames, you set the interval between them. Then you go to your self timer. Add with your self timer. I usually use two seconds, not 10 seconds, but do whatever you want. So two seconds. And then you simply, you got the two seconds ready to go. You got a five stop bracket. You're going to touch the shutter button down to go. Okay, you touch the shutter button down. And you wait. There's a lot of light in the front flashing. 
It took me about an hour and a half to build the flashing light in PowerPoint, by the way. <laughs> takes the first picture, then automatically takes a second, third, fourth, fifth picture, and resets itself. Your cable release works, your remote control works, any way you activate your self-timer, it works. Okay, super easy, super fast. Okay. This one is different. Few Z9 owners, we just announced our sixth, seventh, sixth firmware for the Z9 in less than 12 months. We're now at firmware 3.0, we've added over four dozen new features to your camera. On 2.0, one of the new features was something called pre-release capture. Pre-release capture is kind of a mouthful to understand, but very, very cool once you get it. It lets you time travel. You go back in time and make a picture before you squeeze the button down. Seriously. So, getting a piece of a bat breaking off, wood off the bat, broken bat, it's really kind of cool. You get the right moment, you get the whole separation of the bat. Really hard to do, because most of us are going for bat on ball. It's not the bat breaking after the balls hit the bat the wrong way. Well, how do you get both the bat on ball and the breaking bat if you can't go back in time and get both of them? You can. So, uh, but birds, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a Z9 program. I'm required by law to show you a bird. There's now a bird. Uh, for those of you at home, the reason we do this is because when the Z9 was launched, we were all in pandemic lockdown, and the birds don't require moda releases. Or mask. So, to set this up, go into our, sh into our camera menu again. This time we're in our custom menu. We're going to be in the D group for shooting. Pre-release capture options is a new heading. You say C30 slash C120 options. And that says pre-release because then we have more than just those two. But settings are pretty simple. How many, how much time do you want to go back in time for the shot? Your options are none, which turns it off, a third of a second, a half second, or a full second. As you play with this, my suggestion would be to start with a full second. You'll have way more pictures than you want, but after a while you go, you know what? It seems like a half second would work for me. So you back it off to half second, okay? So you set this up, full second. Then you're gonna go over to post-release burst. How many pictures, how long do you want to take pictures as you squeeze the button down? Again, to start out, go to max. I leave mine set to max all the time, even now I've used it quite a bit. On the pre-release burst, I'm about a half a second, not a full second. But right now, this is my starting point. So what you have here is, is you squeeze the button down, you hold it, and after one second, two seconds, three seconds, or about four seconds, it'll stop taking pictures because it kind of buffers out. Okay, it needs to catch up. Doesn't slow down, just as a hard stop. It's not truly a buffer issue, but it feels like it, okay? Now, this only works, only works if you are in the super high capture rate. So 30 frames a second, 60 frames a second, or 120 frames a second. Now, because of the technology we're using, these are JPEG-only captures, and I'm okay with that because, A, I don't have to set my JPEGs up properly, and B, I'd rather have JPEGs that focus as opposed to a RAW file that is locked focus. 195 frames a second of a preset focus only works on a bowl of fruit, so I'm not going to do that. I'm gonna, I want this. So I'm okay with this. So you have to be in one of those three modes, 30, 60, or 120. If you're not, what you set in the menu a second ago will not apply at all. So you have to be in one of these three modes. Okay. Now, the way all this stuff works, up in the upper right-hand corner, you have this little icon, pre. When your finger rests on the shutter button, 
your autofocus activation button, whether it's the front button, back button, or one of the other buttons in your camera, you'll get a small little green dot saying that you are actually buffering. Now, this is a rolling buffer. So on my one second, my one second of pre-release, every one second is just rolling. So I can be there for an hour and I'll just keep re recycling the, the one second, okay? So I'm, I got, my, I got my, my lens up, I'm gonna dodge your game, and I got my lens up and I'm waiting for the pitcher and the batter to be in sync and actually start doing something. So I'm waiting for it, I got the batter ready, the batter ready, the batter ready. As the batter starts to go, I see through the viewfinder, he's starting to swing. I said, okay, here it comes. My neurons are starting to move my finger towards pressuring it. So I know that I want to get the bat on the ball, and I squeeze the button down, and I just miss bat on ball. And I hold the button down, I get some more pictures. And typically, I would say, darn, I'll wait for the next one. Or, or something like that. Wait for a bird to take off. I'm waiting for the Kentucky Derby gates to open and the horses to rush out. All these different little pieces. So what happens is I shot that picture. That's the picture I captured. But because I'm pre-release bursting, I'm actually, as soon as I squeeze the button down, it goes back in time that full second, takes all of those JPEGs and writes them to the memory card. And then it has the pictures that I actually shot with my finger on the button. So instead of ending up with, with a ball that's just missed the bat, I go back in time and get the one that's actually touching the bat. As a bird is just taking off, as a horse is just breaking for, as this, the, what all this is, this is just one of these more tools you get to use to make the, to grab the picture that you want to grab. So. Do you have to go back and select that picture? Yeah. We have all the pictures. You've got 100, 120 frames a second. You have 120 frames plus the one that I captured, plus that one, plus another 120, because I stayed on for a full second in case the bat broke. Okay? And so I had all that stuff. Okay? Then, yes, you get to go back and sort through them. Okay, I don't have to do anything when I get home. When you get home, you get, yeah, absolutely. When you get home, you got all these pictures to sort through. Um, I recommend extra hard drives. But yeah, it's, it's kind of it's cool. And you start to play with it, and you're like, wow, this is really kind of cool. I stopped missing the shot I wanted to get because I was a fraction of a second, a nanosecond too late with it. I found it. Did you No, you always get, they're all JPEGs. You, raw is not allowed in this one. What about raw and JPEG? Raw is not allowed in this one. The question was, what about raw and JPEG? Does it mean capture it in JPEG? It's all JPEG. Read my lips. JPEG. Now, JPEG is a good thing. <gasps> you print a JPEG. You post a JPEG. If you understand how to use your camera properly, you don't have to have a RAW file to make a JPEG. The camera will do it for you. My camera has the viewfinder and LC panel more or less color matched, visually color matched, to my monitor at home so I can preview my exposure and my saturations based on my exposure before I squeeze the button down. I'm making fewer mistakes so I don't need the backup of a raw file. Listen, I get it. For you guys at home, I totally get this. The whole industry has kind of turned our, our, our thinking and if you don't use back button autofocus, you don't use manual exposure mode, you don't shoot a raw file, you don't use the software, you don't use that plug-in, you're not a real photographer. No. Use what works well for you. Nikon and Canon and Sony and Panasonic Olympus, we've all spent collectively hundreds of millions of dollars to make all this technology work the way we want it to. Ask yourself, am I really smarter than all those people combined? If your answer is yes, I want to be your friend. <laughs> okay? So try pre-release. Just have some fun with it. See if it works for you. It doesn't work for everything. I don't use it for surfing because surfing really has no, no decisive moment. It can be a huge number of moments within the same wave, within the same kick on the top of the wave.
a bat on a ball is a very decisive moment. Okay? A punch in a boxing ring is a very decisive moment. All right. I get asked this all the time. So I'm going to share this with you. I'm going to preface this by saying you do not have to follow this. But shooting banks, some pretty cool stuff in the shooting banks. By now, most of you already know the shooting banks are four copies of that menu. You can create basically small four cameras inside that menu. So inside one body, you have four copies of the shooting menu. Because I'm lousy keeping things straight in my head, I'm going to rename it. In this case, I'm going to name it Sports. Hit OK, and I got a sports menu bank. So I've got a copy of the shooting menu just for sports. No landscape, no focus stacking, no studio, sports. Okay. Then I got one for studio, I've got one for landscape, I've got one for night sky. So I've got four copies of the menu for just that one thing that I want it to do. Okay. Four cameras, one body. Same thing happens. So I'm out, I'm out shooting. I'm doing my sports, that's what I do most often. And I'm in the sports mode. And then I keep hearing from everybody, Instagram, my boss, my boss's boss, my boss's boss's boss. We need to shoot more video. And all photographers here just cringed, except for Christy Odom, who loves it. Christy Odom's in the back of the room going, oh my gosh, video, okay. Well, Christy Odom will tell you that yes, we have to shoot more video. And shooting video with an icon is amazingly simple. I'm going to make it even easier for you. You take the selector on the back of the camera, go from still to video. You touch the shutter button down, because I've customized the shutter button to start video. It takes a video. So you go from this. Slow motion video, the gateway drug to video capture. Now we'd all do that. Because what you just saw there took less than three seconds to take a big, to capture. One, two, three, done. That's all it was. If I can make it that easy for you, wouldn't you do more of it? Okay. Don't have to pro. Not, she's like, no, I don't want to process it. Some of your cameras have built-in slow motion video, no process required. Darn it. All right. What I noticed was. As I switch from the still shooting menu down to the video shooting menu, to me, I switched one of the banks over. I went, when I came out of the video, went down to video, and I came back into the menu banks for the video shooting. I noticed on the Z9, they're exactly the same menu banks. Because they're two different menus that are kind of interconnected because of the shooting portion of them, I can have it do double duty. So I did, I set up all the stuff for 4K slow motion video, and then went in and renamed it. Sports slash 4K 120. And so now that menu bank switches both the still and the video shooting menu simultaneously. Whether you use, it, whether you use it, the other one or not, you'd be video only. Video, Christy's only in video right now. So she, her still shooting stuff gets dust on it, doesn't get used very much. The rest of you dust off the video portion of it, and it's ready to go. So I actually went through and actually, what I did is I actually ranks them in the order that I use the most often. Now, your order will be very, very different. If you're not new to that video, you probably only have the one. This is a good way to get started. But I put the rest of them up there. It's 8K24 is my second. Uh, I do a lot of stuff. For, I want to do just 1080s for a smaller size for the slow motion. And then I don't use it often because of the processing power required. But I do have the in raw video. Okay. So I'm able to switch back and forth on these things. I can do the same thing, and it's really Quite seriously, it's, it's I'm in a shooting menu bank. I flip the switch over and I touch the shutter button down. It's done. I'm shooting video. I'm back and forth on it. The way I have my cameras set up to do my shooting. If I'm shooting sports, the custom menu bank also has a customization menu bank on it for sports. The primary autofocus point is the horizontal and vertical buttons. Recall focus position. So I can actually pull the focus position back to a preset. Not very good for surfing, but amazing for baseball. 
I can actually pre, pre focus on second base, put that in my memory, and then as I'm shooting the batter, as I swing the camera around, I touch the button down, and the lens is already pre focused to second base before I get the lens over there. So I can get the play at second base in focus before the runner even gets close, before I get close to it. Okay. My menu, which actually lets me access the top items on my menu, the bottom one, function three, that's where I save the focus point into my, my system. Dun, 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 dun. For the exact same camera over on video side, it does something completely different now. When I switch it from the sports into the B bank, my studio bank, this is how my studio is set up. This is how I would do 8K capture, which is my video stuff, I'm very, very early into video, so it's basically the same settings over and over and over again for all the video stuff except for the frame rate and capture rate, frame size and capture rate. Okay, Landscape, there's my settings. And again, if you don't, I want my camera button to do something different, then ignore this. This is how my treasure map is set up. And that's the 120, which looks exactly the same as the 4K except for the resolution and the frame rate, or excuse me, resolution in this case. Night sky, so Milky Way shooting, a completely different setup for Milky Way that I do for landscape. It requires a different white balance, a different picture control, a different noise setting than I do in landscapes. And of course, in raw, so. So they asked me to be at 40 minutes and I'm exactly at 40 minutes. So any questions, please feel free to drop me a line at Instagram or come see me at the booth here. Um, want to do some questions? Yeah, we have uh, some time for some Q&A, but... Wait, sorry. Also, Curtsy. we'll be doing a meet and greet over at the Nikon booth right on the hour in about 20 minutes. So raise your hand if you have a question. I'll uh, try to spread the love here. Can you tell me how I can cancel a bracket in the middle of the series? Can you cancel a bracket in the middle of the series? Turn off the camera. Yeah, I don't want to do that. If you I use me? shooting banks and I make some change to the bank and then I turn it off, don't I go back to default in the shooting bank and lose my change? I'm sorry. You want to change a bracketing series? Yep. No, I, I don't want to change it. I want, I'm halfway through and I messed up and I want to restart it or cancel it. Okay, by turning it off, you simply stop the, the series and then you can turn off the series or restart it at that point. So yeah, but if, if it, I power cycle the camera, don't I lose the updates to the parameters of my shooting bank that will be get reset when I reload the? No, sir. The, turn the camera on. But if you're shooting menu banks, or you're shooting your menu, your menu selections will not change when you turn the camera on and off. Okay. That was cool. Anyone else? If you select a specific shooting bank. Will the custom bank for that same letter or same name follow with the shooting bank when you switch over to it? Only in my dreams. So the, the question was, if I change the, the shooting bank or the video shooting bank, will the, the custom bank follow suit? I have asked for it, I've begged for it, I've pleaded for it. I'm about to start bribing people to offer that option to do it. I think it's an important option to have it done. Right now I have some separately. So you have to set the, the, the shooting banks and the custom banks separately from each other. Um, they don't have to match. I'm anal enough. Mine all match. But so I have to select, I have to select the shooting bank, and I've shipped my custom bank separately. So I'm asking and beg. I, really, I'm talking to Japan right now. Uh, one of my, my friends, Ken, is the technical liaison for, for Japan here in the United States. And he and I, every time we get together, I look at him and go, connect my menu banks yet? He goes, no, not yet. So we're working on it. Hopefully it'll come. Wait, 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 just a second. Microphone. So now I'm confused about the custom banks and the menu banks. So when it Don't be confused. You ready? We're going to call an audible and freak B&H out completely, okay? We're going to unplug my computer. We're going to plug in my Nikon Z9. Hit the menu screen. Yes! All right, so I've got my shooting menu banks. So this, oops. There's my, sh there's my still shooting bank. If I come out and go down to my video shooting, it's the same banks. 
That's my shooting banks. There's two of them, still in video. However, the custom menu is independent of that currently. I have them labeled the same, but I can be down here and I can select C, and these are still set to A. I want them linked right now. Right now they're unlinked, and I, there's no way in the camera to currently link them. So if I, I want them to change as a group. So that's what the question was. Okay, hopefully that clears that up. Awesome. Christy Odom, Ambassador Odom. How to phrase this. I want to thank you so much for all the help. You were brilliant. <laughs> One of my favorite pieces of advice had to do with a lot of people play with my camera, they borrow my camera, my camera goes in for cleanings, and I've got all these custom settings. And you gave me amazing advice that I think you should pass on about what you do so that when you get your camera back, how you get all these custom settings back. Five bucks. <laughs> my mailing address, you can send me five dollars off YouTube. When you get all this stuff set, and I, I'm currently, I, I started a library because I started at, at version 1.11 and, and said, I want all these menu settings. Then as, as, they, as, they, as I grow as a photographer, as I understand the, the camera better, as they introduce new features, I keep adding to it and actually updating them. So I actually create a new series of, of menu options. Now, right now I'm in the setup menu. I can scroll through the three page of set menu or I can go up. So I start at the back to load, save, settings. So I can come in here and I can save a menu setting, hit OK. Then if I were unfortunate enough, or maybe it's really kind, and, and Ambassador Odom <laughs> came along and decided that, that my Sports Bank should be completely renamed, and that's a dumb name for it. So we did all of this, and she hit OK, and now I've got an empty menu bank. And she actually, even worse, went in here and decided to change this to that, and that, and sorry, this to that, and just made the camera hers, okay? I may not figure out what she did to my camera in totality for months. However, if I go back into my memory card, now I've taken that small little file, I saved the file, the file is about 100 kilobytes. So I have a file folder on my hard drive that says camera saves, Z9 camera saves. And each one is, is saved in a folder, you can't change the name on it, saved in a folder by date. And I make a firmware version too. So it's it's. 2022.11.04, firmware 3.0, okay? Inside that, I have my little itty bitty file that I put back in my memory card, came in here, and I can reload all the settings that were just overwritten by somebody who borrowed my camera, or because I was playing with something new and I didn't know any better and go back and want to reset. Hit the load menu settings. Now if I go back in here and check it, Look, they are all exactly where they were. And all of the settings we just screwed up are unscrewed up. So it's a really, really cool way to have a customized user reset of your entire camera. So once you get it the way you think you like it, save it. If you format the card, you will lose it, which is why I copy it into the hard drive on my computer in that file folder with the time and date on it so I know which version it is. So I can go back and actually say, you know what? I could go back a year and say, I really want to go back and I really enjoyed shooting it last year more than I do this year. Maybe it's the menu settings. I go back and then reload it as long as the firmware is the same version in the same camera. You can load and unload those things back and forth. It's one of the diagnostic tools that I use to help you if you're an NPS customer. And you call me up and say, hey, listen, I've got an issue. I need to know how my camera's not doing what I want to do. It stopped doing this. I will tell you to save the file, send it to me. I'll put your camera into my body and figure out which menu setting you have wrong. And then say, okay, try fixing this. You go, ah, you're brilliant. That, that's why I tricked Christy Odom into thinking I'm brilliant because of that. Okay. So 
totally tricked her. It's a pirate thing, okay? Last question, because we have to get off the stage for somebody else. Where is a good place to figure out all the different focusing settings and how they're best used? That is a great question. And like anything, as photographers, we don't retain things we read very well. We're visual learners. Okay? So unfortunately, the easy answer is also the hardest one. Go practice. There's, just, there's no other way around it. You've got to go practice. So get out there and try it. Try different things. Start what's going to work for you guys. Because the way I use this focus setting will be different than the way Chris uses the same exact focus setting. Or any of you. So. Go out there, have fun. If you're here, come see the booth. I'll see you guys later online. Thanks a lot. Hi, Mom. So if there are any more questions, you can catch Paul over at the Nikon booth, as well as the friendly people from Nikon. And that will be right at 1 o'clock, so just a few minutes. Next here on stage, we're going to have Erin Sullivan. She's going to be giving us a deep dive into the great outdoors, the little bit great, out, great indoors. Is that, that's a good trick. And that will be happening right at 1 o'clock. And just so you all know, there is a live demo happening with Erin at 2 o'clock over at the corner macro station with the fun little canoe scene, if you've seen it. So stick around. Quit, please. Sounds good.
Thanks, Sarah.
Hello, hello. So we are going to get started. We're jumping right in. I know the main stage is on a lunch break, but I know you guys are eager to keep learning. And this is a special one. And just so you know, before Aaron comes on stage, we are doing that live demo over at the macro table in the back. That's going to be a lot of fun to crowd around and get into her mindset and see how she built that scene. Um, and I know you guys are going to love it. So let's get ready for the next talk. And without further ado, Aaron Sullivan, come on stage. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much. Excited to be here with you. Um, I'm Erin, for those of you who don't know me. Nice to see some, some familiar faces um, and some new faces as well. So we'll get into it. So uh, first, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Erin Sullivan. I am an outdoor travel and miniature photographer. And over the next 40 minutes or so, we'll get into what that exactly means. Uh, and I also think it's important to tell you a little bit about what I'm about. So for me, meaningful images and experiences are what makes photography so important and so powerful. Um, and I also love the outdoors. I celebrate creativity whenever and however I can. Uh, and I think it's vital to humanity and I think it should be nurtured. Um, and before pursuing photography, I was a guide. I was, you can't hear? Can you guys turn me up? Oh, really? Now it is. Well, let's start better. I'm okay? Okay. I'll put it like that. All right. Anyway, I'm Erin. That's what you missed. Okay. <laughs> I'm a photographer, outdoor travel miniature. You're going to learn more about what that means in a bit. Um, and before I was a photographer, I was an adventure travel guide for teenagers. So I used to lead adventure trips for kids all over the world, canoeing, backpacking, rock climbing, um, all that kind of stuff. So I eventually started a blog called Aaron Outdoors to share my travels, and then that kind of led me back to photography, which I loved for my whole life. Um, and these are just some of my clients that I wanted to share with you. I'm, so I do photography for them. As I said, I do social media work. Um, I also create educational resources for my community, uh, for photographers and creatives. And I lead a couple of adventure trips every year based on photography and some element of mindfulness and personal development. And we're going to talk about this today. So these are my miniatures. We're not going to talk about ice cream necessarily, uh, but these are the ice cream mountains. Would anybody like to go? Yeah, I would too. Okay, I'll go with you. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to start just today by showing you some of my miniature images, and then we'll get into a bunch of other important facts and the story behind them and everything like that. So these are the ice cream mountains. I made them for a client. Here we have a mushroom grove, so I made this with a few different kinds of mushrooms and I wanted to create something imaginative, inspiring, that gives you that sense of wonder that I certainly feel when I'm outdoors and in nature. This is another client piece. This was for a company that makes technical fleece. So the whole landscape here is created with their fabric. And then we have a, fam a little friendly family of penguins there. And this one is cucumber terraces. So this one we used to advertise the, my talk today. And it's inspired by my time in Asia, specifically in China. And I thought that the cucumbers were really nice um, as, you know, to, to illustrate these terraces. And this one is a map world. So it's created with maps and with push pins. And this was for a print article. Uh, and that was for one of my clients as well. And then, of course, you have my models which are these tiny little figurines. OK, so a little bit more about what we're going to go over today. First, I'm going to tell you the story of how I started creating all of these uh, miniature worlds and why. And then, since I am a guide, I'll take you on a guided tour of my miniature worlds that I've made and all the scenes. Um, you'll also get a look at the behind the scenes, uh, which could may, might surprise you a little bit. Um, and lastly, we'll get to the lessons that working in miniature taught me and how I applied them to my work in the human-sized world and then how you can apply these lessons to your own creative journey, whether you're a photographer or not, and whether you do it professionally or just for fun. All right, 
So first I wanted to go and show you some of my other work. So um, this is work that I've shot before the miniatures and after the miniatures. I, I love it. I love this world. I think we live on such an amazing planet and I want to I share it through my photography and through my art. Uh, so on the left we have Balo Speech on Crete. You can already kind of see how the miniatures uh, started in my mind. These are actual human, human sized people. And then in the middle is a macro photograph of a glowworm in New Zealand. So you can see the light in its body illuminating its kind of, um, it's like a spider web. That's how it catches its prey. And then on the right, we have layers of hills in Tuscany at sunset. So I love these colors. I love the tools of repetition and layers. And I'm really interested in how this comes together to create a really compelling image. Does anybody know what a group of stingrays is called? A fever. A fever of rays. So this is a fever of several hundred mobula rays uh, in Mexico. And I mean, this is the, the feeling of wonder that if I've ever felt it in my life, it was this. And, and this is the kind of feeling that I want to communicate in all of my work. Here's the Milky Way over Texas. Uh, this was for the, the Texas Tourism Board this past year. And I got really lucky with this water, this still calm water, so I could get the reflection of the Milky Way. This is Namibia's dead vlay uh, from the air. I shot this next to Colby Brown, who's standing right there. <laughs> uh, and I love the abstraction here and how it looks like a tree or it looks like veins. Like things looking like other things, art imitating nature. Um, those kinds of themes I think are really amazing in art. I think that's what, what makes what we can create really special as humans. Here we have an antelope at sunrise in the Maasai Mara in Kenya. These are some olives on an olive grove in Tuscany. I just wanted to show you a bit of the macro on the right and then the texture, overall texture, color, exploration of depth on the left. And here's a chunk of ice on Iceland's famous diamond beach. And what I loved here was the contrast between the sharp and the clear texture of the ice against the soft movement of the water. So, how do all of these go to something like this? This is my rosemary forest. And this and all the other miniatures that I've showed you so far are from a project that I am still on, ongoing, creating in an ongoing fashion called Our Great Indoors. And this is a project, a series that I started at the start of the pandemic in March of 2020. And I've continued it ever since. And this project has taught me so much, way more than I ever thought it would have. And I want to let you in on something that I was thinking about a lot uh, at the start of this project, um, which was art school. I was thinking, like, why did I go to art school? What did I learn from it? Why did I want to go? Did it benefit me in any way? Um, so this is me at my senior thesis exhibition in college. And though I'm a photographer now, I didn't actually study photography in school. Um, I didn't have any formal photography training since about age 17, since a, since a couple courses that I took in high school. So I'm thinking about the experience of school, particularly art-related assignments and the process around them. And here are my observations about this. And I promise you it does connect to miniature, so stay with me. So first, art school gives you assignments. Assignments being usually a set of constraints, of parameters that you need to follow. Some examples, create a sculpture with some wire and some wood, a tabletop sculpture, or create a logo in black and white using your favorite animal, or paint the glass bottles in the middle of the room, but you can only use three colors. So these are actual assignments that I had in school personally. The next thing that you have, you have teachers that will give you these assignments and that will tell you when they're due and how to do them. And then art school, of course, usually comes with schedules and deadlines when you need to be in class, when you need to study, uh, when you need to practice your craft. There's some kind of schedule that you follow. And these things usually come with any type of schooling or coursework, um, which in theory then prepares you to go and do that thing out in the world. So art school prepares you to go out and be a working artist and to, uh, to be successful in theory. Personally, I'm really glad that I went. It gave me a lot. 
Um, so here I am, March of 2020, looking at all my screens and watching my schedule just absolutely evaporate. Um, everything's being canceled. It's the start of the pandemic. As a travel photographer, you know, my entire calendar is just going away. I was also hosting a micro series at the time. I was on camera hosting and just all my jobs are getting canceled. So I'm thinking, how am I going to stay creative? How am I going to stay creating? And what am I going to do for work as well? So I suddenly have like all of this free time. And I started to consider the really unique experience that we were in. Suddenly I had a lot of constraints. Really felt like an assignment. Right? And this is how I began to look at it. I had constraints and parameters in which I could work. So I can't travel. Right? And that's a place where I get a lot of inspiration. I can't spend a lot of money on whatever it is that I'm going to create. Uh, I have to spend much more time at home than I'm used to and much more time indoors. Um, if you follow me on social media, my handle is Aaron Outdoors. So I suddenly became Aaron Indoors. Um, I had to use materials that were easy to find or that I already had. And then as far as teachers or authority figures, really just limited to myself there. Um, but you know, I, I knew that potential clients could be looking at my work and like knew what I was going to be coming out with. So I wanted to be sharing my work. And then as far as the due date, well, there wasn't really a due date, but I know now that I need to create in order to stay like mentally healthy. And then of course, I'm also thinking eventually I have to generate some more income. So that's also in the back of my mind. Um, so where can I turn challenge into opportunity? This is a big question that I'm asking myself at this point in time. I went to art school. I paid money to be given assignments. And here I'm being given one for free. So maybe if I can reframe it in this way, then it will allow me to um, you know, create something. In a creative career, a cre creative journey, you are always going to have challenges. Everyone will run into challenges. And they'll be different for every single person. But it's really going to benefit you if you can reframe your challenge into an opportunity or see the opportunities within a challenge. I don't mean to invalidate that challenges are hard. They can be hard. They can be difficult. And as an, as an aside, the, so much of what's made my, me successful in my career has not been the technical stuff about how to do lights or what settings to use. It's these kinds of principles. So I'm a person that feels overwhelm and anxiety pretty easily. So I needed to focus my attention onto what I could control rather than focusing on, oh, this is really challenging. I'm really limited by this. So here we are. I had my assignment and I started to brainstorm. When I was a kid or when I couldn't when I was bored or when I couldn't sleep at night, I used to imagine these tiny little scenes in my house. So if I couldn't sleep, I'm like under my covers and I'm noticed, I'm, I'm acting like, okay, there's, there's a, the ski hill here and I can ski down this. I would imagine that. Or if I was outside, I'd imagine walking along tiny blades of grass. And so that's where this project really came from, is from childhood. And I thought to myself, how cool would it be to create these worlds in real life? How cool would it be to create them in images? So I Googled miniature figurines, um, and I didn't know anything about the model train world at that time. I know a lot about it now. Uh, so I ordered my first miniature figurines, which was these canoes here, and I also got a few hikers, and I got to work. And I brainstormed for a few days, and I had a few scenes that I wanted to create, and this was the first one. So this is the pillow ice caves. These are made out of pillows and sheets. And here's what it looked like. And this is a little video that I'm going to play. So there I am exploring the pillow ice caves. And as you can tell, as you can see, it doesn't really look like a very well put together studio. It's very much an experimental process. And isn't that the creative process in general? Yeah, so uh, a lot of how these go is I set something up, I, I make the photo. I put something else, I make the photo. I put something else, I take something away, and I'm always looking at what's in the back of my camera, what can I see? So that's how these first, uh, this first scene came about. Next, I went to Paper Bag Canyon. 
So what I like about this one is that it really does look like it's in the southwest. Uh, it looks like Antelope Canyon or like one of the one of the canyons in the American Southwest here. And people, when I shared this on social media, people thought that it was real. They made them do like a double take. Um, and then they swiped and they saw this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so this is uh, literally a paper bag taped to a cutting board. And obviously, I increased the saturation and I edited it a little bit. Um, but really, I, I do try to achieve the kind of optical illusion factor in camera. So people were very, uh, I'll say delighted and surprised by how simple these were. And as I said with, this, with the assignment that I had, right, I'm limited to what's in my house. So I'm kind of scouring my house, like what can I use? So Paper Bag Canyon. The broccoli forest. So every little kid looks at broccoli and sees trees, right? I did, and I still do. <laughs> uh, and, and also, most photographers working in miniature, which there are actually quite a few. I didn't invent this genre. Uh, there's miniature photographers, there's toy photographers. Everybody kind of has a version of a broccoli forest, which I think is delightful. Uh, so anyway, this is mine. And here's the behind the scenes of the broccoli forest. So uh, I realized that my bed was a really good kind of platform that was as close to a studio as I was going to get at that time. Um, and also keep in mind, I'm a travel photographer. I'm an outdoor photographer. I'm used to uh, shooting in natural light. So I'm still using natural light here. And I'm also applying everything that I've learned in the outdoors to the miniatures now. So I'm thinking, how can I create those same feelings of like what the outdoors makes me feel? Which is, man, I, I feel amazing outside. I feel this sense of wonder, I feel a sense of humility, and I wanted to communicate that in the miniatures as well. So there's a lot of layering that happens here. You can, um, I think in this behind the scenes photo, I had changed that backdrop, which is a jacket. I had changed it to a pillowcase, so it's blue instead. You can see the green sweater right there. So there's a lot of optical illusion that comes into play. It can look like a mess from the top and from above, but then when you get into the right angle, you see this um, really special and expansive scene. Nightstand astrophotography. Did you know that you can see the stars from the, your nightstand? <laughs> I did. Uh, so I thought about the idea of making uh, a nighttime scene, and I, and I was considering kind of how to do this. And so my idea was, well, if I take a piece of paper and I poke some holes in it, and then I put a, a light behind it, then maybe I could make some stars. So that's what I did. I took a little sheet from my journal and I poked holes in it with um, a needle and then I put the light behind it. The light it, uh, that I had at the time is like a smart light bulb that changed color. So I put it on blue, then I staged my adventurer and I did a long exposure with the lights off. Um, I don't think you're ready for this one. Um, so this is a very technical set up. The, the stars are being held up by a dry shampoo bottle. Um, so you have my journal, that's uh, instant coffee for the dirt. Then you've got the, the van, you've got the little figurine on top, and I would just turn off the lights and leave that blue light on when I was actually shooting it. And it's like a long exposure, just like being outside under the Milky Way. And this image I created after an image that I had actually created with a friend um, on a trip. So she's actually standing on a van. The Milky Way is behind her. It's a beautiful image. And so sometimes when I was creating these miniature scenes, and like I said, I still make them, I'm using, I'm, I'm using a memory that I have, or I'm using an image that I've made previously in the real world, and I want to translate that into miniature. Other times I'm looking to communicate a feeling. Other times I get really inspired by an object and I'm like, oh, this needs to be something. I don't, I don't know what yet, but it needs to be something. Uh, Pancake Canyon was a favorite. <laughs> so I realized, you know, I should, this is becoming a real thing for me, a hobby. So I should really get some more figurines, some more models. So I ordered some more hikers and a bunch of 
I became awakened to the model train world of how many figurines you can get. You can get tennis players, you can get scuba divers, you know, there's a lot of options. So anyway, my t they're HO scale or N scale. And I should also tell you guys, we are going to do a Q&A after. So if you do have a question, hold on to it and we'll, we'll get to it. Uh, these are N scale. They're the smallest ones that I use. But I do also use HO scale if you are a model train person. So Pancake Canyon, we visited on a weekend. We were making pancakes. And I thought, why not? And as you can see, it's pretty simple. So again, with that optical illusion factor, uh, you can see how I'm placing each of the stacks in a very specific place for the foreground, the background. Um, and, and this behind the scenes is from a slightly different angle than this, but that's also how the process goes. You know, you're, you're photographing this and then you go, oh, what would happen if I move this here? And then you move the camera slightly. And then you, you think, oh, what would happen if I moved this pancake over here? Okay, it's a, you're creating it. it it's, it's a really interesting experience because when you're a landscape photographer, you can't exactly be like, oh, you know, I'd really prefer that mountain over there. So this, this gives you kind of a, a new sense of control in a way. Okay, so one of my most favorite things I've ever seen is the glowworm caves in New Zealand. And I already showed you the macro photo that I have of the glowworms. But this is my glowworm cave that I made in my bedroom. So I'm going to tell you what it's made of, and I want you to think in your mind what you think this setup would have been. Okay? So it's rain jackets. It's the paper with holes poked in it and a light behind it. It's tin foil for the river. And then the rock is a hunk of rose quartz, because I have crystals at my house. And then I have little figurines. These are N-scale figurines as well. Okay. And there's no lights on. It's a long exposure. Ta-da! Looks like I just did laundry. <laughs> so you can see I've got the two rain jackets as this kind of like canyon. And then I have ooh, the rose quartz in the middle, the tin foil, which I realized by now makes really good water. Um, and then I have the light. And so much of it is, you know, this is the way it works. So this is how I'm going to shoot it. I think sometimes we get really boxed in in photography of needing to shoot something a certain way or needing to create something a certain way. But hey, this creates this. Why not? Fishing on Tinfoil Lake. Uh, this one is quite a sentimental one for me, actually. So uh, growing up, I used to go fishing with my grandfather. And that was a really wonderful time for me and so I wanted to create something that really evoked that feeling and that I had being as a kid. So the tin foil here is, is really effective water and then in the back you have a lampshade turned to the side and kind of pressed against a sheet so it creates that big sun. Here's the setup. So we have a cutting board with tin foil on it which is the, the cutting board gets a lot, of, a lot of play, a lot of use in the miniatures. And then the pier is a toothbrush. And then we have <laughs> the lampshade that you can see. You have the very technical chair and the uh, sheet draped over it to give us this. All right, a crowd favorite, the Rosemary Forest. This is also the cover of um, Westway's AAA magazine, if any of you get that. Um, the Rosemary Forest, I was pruning a rosemary bush, and I was looking at the cuttings, and I thought, oh, trees. This is a forest. This has to be a forest. So I took the bag inside, and I created this forest. I glued the little sprigs to, uh, to a paper plate. I poured some baking soda for snow. Here's the behind the scenes. So as you can see, I also taped some of the sprigs to this stool to give it some depth of field, right? Because that's what makes it successful, is on the right here, you can see those. You can see that nice bokeh, bokeh. I always call it bokeh, bokeh, in the front and in the back. The snow was added in post. Everything else is in camera. And the sheet. Yep. <laughs> Oh, and I wanted to tell you, um, I use a Sony 
90 millimeter f 2.8 macro. That's the lens that I use for these. And I use it for all of them. I've always used it. I love that lens and I shoot Sony. Okay, here's one of my personal favorites. This is my Christmas card to my community in 2020. I bought these figures, which are sheep and a shepherd, in, over the summer that year. And I was like, I don't know how, when I'm gonna use these, but I will use them. So I ended up making this. And then on the right, obviously, you have the behind the scenes uh, set up here. You have my stars, that's a poster board with holes in it. You have some candles holding that together. And then there's this sweat sweater that is a nice texture for these kind of rolling hills in the desert. And then the big star on the upper left, that is the only thing that I added in post on, that, on this image. A hot spring scene. So I, I also love this one. I created this with blue oyster mushrooms that I found at the farmer's market. I'm just gonna flip to the behind the scenes so you can see them. I saw these at the farmer's market. I was like, hot springs, we're going. You know, so I got them, I went home, and I started. Um, so what inspired these is Saturnia hot springs in Italy, in Tuscany. They're kind of these layered hot springs with very blue water. And so when I saw the mushrooms, I thought, that's, that's what this has to be. So I filled a spray bottle, or a squirt bottle, with water and blue food coloring. And then I added it into the mushrooms, I placed my figurines, and kind of held everything together, created a background with a towel. And that is also incense for the steam. So you can see the incense kind of on the lower left-hand corner. Here you can see that steam as well. The dragon fruit lakes. So I have a swimmer on the left and I have a kayaker on the right. And a tool that I really like to use for these is repetition. So when I'm purchasing my items or gathering my items, I'll look for a lot of them so that I can place something in the front, something in the back, and then you kind of creates a nice container for whatever the subject is in the middle. I also sometimes change the colors of things uh, in Photoshop, particularly this kayak is actually yellow, but I, I thought it would look better blue. I change skin tones, I change hair, I change body positioning, I change clothing items. If I think it's gonna make a stronger image, then I do it. Here's the behind the scenes of the dragon fruit lakes. And I had also moved to a bigger space. So obviously this isn't on my bed anymore. <laughs> this is in my office now. And I just have this plywood setup. It's very, very simple, where it's dedicated for, for my miniatures. All right, we have a couple more stops on our tour, and then we'll get to the lessons. So these are the cucumber terraces, as I showed you before, but I thought this was a really good example of showing you kind of how on the right kind of looks like a mess from the top, it's like your kid didn't clean up after an art project, which is kind of true. Um, but then when, when you position the camera, you can see this very expansive world and expansive scene. Here's fishing on a kale leaf on a kale lake. I was washing some kale leaves in my kitchen and I saw the way that the water beaded and I thought, oh, that's so interesting. I wonder, I, I wanna, first of all, I wanna photograph that in macro, but second of all, let me see if I can put a miniature figurine on it. So I had this fisher, fisherman and I thought he just looked so comfortable there. It looks like he was having a great time. So this is fishing on kale lake. And a lot of my clients came on this ride with me, which I'm really appreciative of. And this project also allowed me to generate some new clients. I was able to attract new clients that I otherwise wouldn't have shot for. You know, my clients prior to this were so were based in the outdoors and travel. If it wasn't outdoors and travel, then where did it really fit in? But this kind of exposed me to entirely new markets. So on the left, this is for Aspiration. They're an environmentally conscious banking alternative. And this is for their credit card. And the credit card plants a tree with every purchase. So this is like a literal focus of that, literal interpretation. The middle is for Salt and Straw. Does anybody have Salt and Straw? Where you're from? Yeah, OK. Salt and Straw is an ice cream company. They're known for making like kooky ice cream flavors. And 
this was a series that they did that were camping inspired flavors. So it was huckleberry cornbread flavor, which was delicious. And I did get to eat it and I had a lot of it, which was awesome. And there were like three different flavors. Uh, and then on the right, this is for Chevrolet. They needed some artwork for a print article that they were doing and they didn't have a way to actually photograph these cars in person. So they needed to get creative. So that's where I came in. So I printed this photo of the cars um, and then put it on a billboard. And then of course we have the Brussels sprout trees and then their text then went on the bottom. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit. Hope you enjoyed the tour. What makes a good photograph? The word good is obviously a subjective word. I consider good in the context of photography to mean compelling or effective, meaning that it effectively communicates whatever its intended feeling is. So here are two images with a similar feeling. I created one in Myanmar and one in my apartment. But they both have this peaceful, thoughtful, reflective, calm, warm feeling to them. And the same things that make a compelling photograph on the left also make a compelling photograph on the right. And these are some of those things for me. Subject, composition, light, color, depth. And I'm not saying those are the only things that matter, but there's some things that matter. And there's some things that really matter. Because if you do all of those things with intention, you get feeling out of it. And feeling is something that we have a lot of power to convey as photographers. And this applies to all kinds of photography. Whether you're making miniatures on your bed like me or you're out uh, photographing wildlife. And also if you're a storyteller, if you wanna tell a story, this is super important. Okay. Let's get into the learning. So what are the lessons that I got from this project? And here I'm also gonna offer some questions for you to take home. So in this font on the bottom, the handwritten stuff, that's for you, okay? So I encourage you to write those down, take a photo of the slides, write them down in the, your notes, um, or just sit in a moment of reflection for yourself. Um, my creativity personally and my photography career I owe a lot of that to my mindfulness practices, so meditation and journaling. Journaling has had a huge benefit on my creativity. So I encourage you to write these down, to reflect on later. You can do that in your journal. You can do that, like I said, in the notes section of your phone, or you could do it in a conversation with a friend, maybe who you came here with, or maybe somebody you meet here. It's a great conversation starter. Okay, number one. You can create assignments for yourself at any time. Who knew? Constraints and structure make room for creative freedom. Creativity is like this wild energy. It doesn't want to color inside the lines, but it really benefits from lines. Okay, it's really good to have a sandbox to play in, a dedicated sandbox. Um, and, and what often makes, keeps us stuck is a feeling of overwhelm. So if you give yourself some constraints, that can be a remedy for this. So the question that I'm offering to you is, what's an assignment that you can give to yourself now? Doesn't, don't wait for it to be perfect. It doesn't have to be something big, it's something small. You could limit time, material, working location, subject matter, the gear that you're using. So some examples. You gotta make a still life with only stuff in your kitchen or only things that are blue. Or you gotta go on a walk and make a series of three to five images in 20 minutes. Something like that. Uh, and my advice would be brainstorm a bunch, circle some that are exciting, and then pick one and go for it. Number two, the creative process requires both structure and freedom. And you probably lean towards one or the other. I personally lean toward that wild creative energy. I'm like, I don't want structure, I don't want discipline, but I really, really benefit from it. And how do I know that? Because I've thrived within constraints, within assignments. So whichever question that you reflect on here, uh, it depends on which one is more applicable to you. So which one do you need? Do you find that you have a lot of structure and discipline in your practice already and that you need to kind of give yourself more freedom, loosen up, play? Or do you feel like, ooh, I'm, I'm that free energy. I'm that, that um, kind of more chaotic energy and I could benefit from structure. 
So the question will either be, where can you create more structure in your process, or where can you allow more freedom and experimentation in your process? Third, your imagination is free and unlimited. So think back to being a kid, what your imagination was like then. We had so many ideas, and we still do, but it's just kind of trapped in this adult uh, conditioning. Um, it's, it's no wonder why we don't feel like we have the imagination we used to. But all that playfulness is still there. So the question for your reflection, two questions for your reflection, where have you limited yourself? And it's okay if you have, everyone has. And where can you invite more imagination back into your life? So how could this look? This could be incorporating more creative activities. This could be watching a movie that you liked as a kid or buying like a cereal that you liked as a kid. This could be cooking something new, baking something new, going to a museum, going to an exhibit, uh, going on a walk, looking at the flowers, looking at animals, anything that nurtures the imagination. Number four, and we got two more. Pay attention to your ideas and treat them all as valid. So sometimes we judge our ideas so hard and rule them out before we even have a chance to bring them to life. And that would have been really easy for me to do with our grade indoors. Like I had so many reasons not to do that project. I still do. The first one, why would I make miniatures? I'm a travel and outdoor photographer. How is that supposed to fit into my portfolio? How is that gonna fit with my work, you know? I could have rolled it out that way. I could have said, oh, there's so many people doing miniatures. Why would I do them? Or I could have thought, oh, it's not gonna lead towards work, so, so why pursue that? But I'm, obviously, I'm very, very happy I didn't let those doubts or judgments win. So what I'm asking us all here to consider is what would happen if you paused any critical judgment on your ideas? What if you treated them all as worthy of your consideration? Not that you have to pursue all of them, but just treat, treating them all as worthy. Um, has anybody read or heard of The Artist's Way? Okay, some of you, great. The Artist's Way is a book and a course by Julia Cameron that I really highly recommend. And she has a lot of really important ideas in there, but one of them that I really like is that your creativity comes from something way bigger than yourself and you're just the conduit. You're just like the middle ground and it's just gonna come through you. So that can be a really cool reframe of thinking, oh, I have this idea, it's coming from something else, it's my job to listen to it and send it through, right, to put it into the world. All right, and the last learning that I'll share with you today, compelling images can be created anywhere. Personally, I'm very grateful for the fresh perspective that Miniature gave me. I saw that, wow, I don't need to be somewhere outdoors or traveling in the world that I, just, that I think is beautiful in order to create a beautiful image. I can create a beautiful image in a very mundane and routine place. And working in miniature really proves this. So the question is, where can you challenge yourself to get a fresh perspective? Because you just have to be open to see things in a new way. So that is what I'll leave you with today. And we'll get into a Q&A. Thank you very much. It was really fun. And Michael will be here with the microphone at some point. Yeah. Attention. Which one? The feelings and attention slide. It had the five things, and then it said the. Uh, yes. Yeah, this is it. The question was just that he wanted to see this uh, slide again. Any other questions? Raise your hand. Here. Can you guys pass the mic around? Um, I just wondered if, uh, since you were uh, kind enough to share your COVID experience, if you saw the special by Bo Burnham about Inside. <sighs> I loved Bo Burnham, and I loved his special. Yeah, wasn't yeah. that great? And yeah, it was amazing. I think yours is uh, equally good. Thank you, thanks. 
Uh, the special, he was asking about Bur Bo Burnham's special Inside, if I had seen it. It's on Netflix. It's wonderful. The, it was called Bo Burnham's Inside. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, hold on. She's got it. I'm just curious about how you got from playing around this in your apartment yeah. to turning it into, obviously, you've become a name in the field and you have a good reputation that didn't happen in your bedroom. Yeah. Right. Well, it's interesting because some of it did. It started there. And it started with my clients saying, oh, this is a creative way to do it. And it was super engaging as well, like sharing that work. People were very interested to see the behind the scenes because it's like such a surprise. You don't know what, what it's going to look like. So I think it started by a few of my clients saying, oh, yeah, we, we want to get in on this. And then it kind of like proved the concept. Um, and now, yes, I do them in a studio or I do them in my office, which is a bit more um, like legitimized. But, but yeah, it did, it did start in my bedroom. And then I should also say I am going to do a demo. I have a table back there for the people that are here in person uh, that I built this morning. It's a winter forest of rock candy with a tinfoil river. So uh, we'll do a, a look at that over there in a little bit at 2 o'clock. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. We had a lot of fun.
try to hit one of these two buttons that will black out the screen. This might take you out, but it looks like here, yeah, they will take you out. So if you hit that play button again, it takes you right back in. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six.
Good afternoon, and we're rolling again right into the next one. Is everyone having some fun? Come on, I need more energy. Is everyone having some fun? Yeah, great. Thanks for joining us. So next up, we have Peter Lee, who's going to be on stage talking about Canon. And if you have any questions, we'll do a quick Q&A at the end. But we'll be doing a meet and greet over at the Canon booth with Peter. Bring all those questions. Try to stump them, right? I, I think Peter probably knows a lot about these cameras. Um, but bring those questions. I know they're ready for it, not only Peter, but the whole team over at the Canon booth. So without further ado, Peter, come take the stage. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me OK? It's a big room, but uh, today we'll be talking about, oh, I don't want that. Okay. <laughs> we'll be talking about landscape. So this one is not necessarily, I talk about a few Canon things, and I have a list of a few Canon cameras that do something fancy that I mentioned at the front row for the gentleman and the lady. But overall, it's more about concept and how we approach it in the 21st century. So I'm a Canon product educator. I'm one of the techs. So just like uh, Paul Van Allen, my coworker, my, my competitor from Nikon, we do a lot of education. And we teach a lot of concepts to customers across the country. So just a quick one, just to recap, something simple. So ISO. So this is something that is least important, realistically. I put it up front because I want to get by it right away and never talk about it again. So hopefully, if you're doing landscape photography, how many of you use a tripod? I want to kind of want to know this all right away. So the almost everyone. So realistically, for most landscape photography, you should set your ISO at 100 and leave it there. And from the knots in the audience, I would say yes. You already know how to do this. So I skipped this really quick because you already know this. The higher we set our ISO, the noisier it'll be. And these are just test shots that are appropriate. Okay. Shutter speed we use for one of two reasons. We either freeze motion, and sometimes that can be challenging if things are moving around. And sometimes we want to have fun with showing some motion. And so Seascape is a good example of showing motion in landscape photography. Okay. There and there. We all know what it looks like. So I skipped through the easy part first. F-stop is a critical selection because this controls your depth of field. Let's be realistic about what it is. We know what it looks like. This completely makes sense, yes? Very obvious, without me walking you through like a baby through what this is supposed to mean. Okay. What we want to really think about is when we typically, how many of you use maybe some longer lenses in landscape photography? Something maybe more than 50 millimeter sometimes. Okay. An advanced audience I can clearly see. Because often when you're out there doing landscape photography, I see it a lot, and I'm sure you see it a lot. You see a lot of people only using wide lenses. And that's not necessarily always the right approach for the subject matter. So depth of field is focal length dependent. That is one of the three big variables that affects how much depth of field we have. So if we approach it shorter and shorter lenses, we have more and more depth of field. The f-stop doesn't change. The distance to the subject doesn't change. You just naturally have more depth of field whenever you substitute a shorter focal length lens. Or some of you may use zoom lenses. I use zoom lenses a lot in landscape photography. You have choice. Less or more depth of field based purely off I'm here, and this is the focal length I choose to use to compose for this particular scene. There is also another thing, is subject distance is the most, one of the biggest things for depth of field. This has the single biggest impact. So if I focus on something much farther away, I have substantially more depth of field. This is just how all the math of the optics work. This comes into play because some of you might do this, hyperfocal. Who does a little bit with hyperfocal? A lot less hands go up normally, and that's OK. I don't expect a ton of hands to go up. All that means is there's a certain distance that's relatively close. You use that as the point you're focusing. And then half the distance between you and that point is in focus all the way to infinity. So this gives you a lot of stuff that's going to be within depth of field. Okay, Pretty straightforward. And you get apps for it. Uh, this is PhotoPills, just a pull from their website. You can get it as mobile makes your life very easy in the 21st century when you can have an app on a phone that can do it in the box. You don't even need a data connection for that. Okay. On a Canon camera, so this is very brand specific because it does not work this way necessarily for all cameras of all brands. 
for Canon cameras when you're looking through a viewfinder or you turn on the live view, look at the back of the screen, or it's a mirrorless camera. It does not matter if it's an SLR or it's mirrorless. You are always viewing the scene at the maximum possible aperture of that lens, period. That's always how it works. It's a techie thing. The engineers decided to program it this way. Therefore, you need to press a depth of field preview button to see the stop down aperture for the actual exposure itself, which is important because in landscape photography, it would be very rare to shoot wide open with a lens, period. It is really uncommon. In fact, I can't think of a single landscape photograph that I have is f2.8. F <laughs> and I use f2.8 lenses for landscape photography, pretty much. So that's what it looks like. Just a quick recap, if you're using tripod, which you should be using, 100 ISO, and then manage your shutter speed, and then f-stop for your depth of field. Easy stuff. So I want to skip by all the easy peasy type stuff. Focus is always a big question I get asked about. We just talked about hyperfocal. That's why I wanted to end with f-stop, because it's very important, because composition is about where we look to help keep things sharp. Hopefully, you're using some of these tools. How many of you use, use a, just a wire remote? I'm used to using a wire remote. So I don't normally use a smartphone to do the triggering, which you can now if you want, because you can trick with the app, the smartphone, it be a Bluetooth trigger for all these modern cameras. I don't like to drain my smartphone battery. That's just my choice, your choice, how, depending on how you want to use it. I am kind of classic old school that way. I like wired remote, simple. The remote itself has power from the camera's battery. There is nothing special about it. It never runs out of battery power. Live view is how I would recommend anyone to approach modern landscape photography, even if you own a DSLR. So this is not exclusive to mirrorless. It makes your life much easier to determine critical focus and to see what's going on in your scene. And it gives you access to histograms, which are kind of cool. And because we're going to talk about that for a moment. This is the thing I promised a gentleman in the front, and that is focus peaking. So focus peaking is something that very new cameras have that older. If you have an SLR that is six, seven years old, you will not have this feature. This comes from video, digital video, but we've adopted it now for still photography. What it does is it literally shows you on the screen, if it's an SLR live view screen, what is in focus and what is not in focus by highlighting it in red by default. You can change the color, but the normal default color for all cameras industry-wide for this function is red. You can change it to blue or yellow if you want. It's a very easy way to see in landscape photography or any other type of photography very quickly. On a Canon system, you press that to field preview. What's red and what's not red? Red is a good choice for landscape because it stands out against the green and blues you see. Okay. This is what's got it. So basically a few very late generation SLRs and then all the new mirrorless stuff. And I didn't put the new camera on here, but yes. R6 Mark II, of course, has this function as well. All the new stuff has got it. So in terms of focus, the big things to think about will be managing depth of field, because it'd be very challenging sometimes to get lots of things in focus, especially if you need something very close to you in the foreground in focus. It can be very challenging now to get sufficient depth of field. So just manage it on a Canon system. Always remember to use your depth of field preview to check it out. Okay. Metering and exposure. I would say it is a deeply misunderstood subject. Okay. So Canon offers you four automatic ways of doing it. So evaluative spot realistically are the two in landscape photography I would suggest you using. Evaluative works very well for landscape photography more generally, unless you've got one thing in the image, which I will show you in a moment. But realistically, how many, since you're out there, I gotta ask, and that's why I included this type of picture. While you're out there doing landscape, do any of you also take pictures of wildlife? About half the hands go up. I'm not surprised, and that's why I have little tidbits in there for you. Because with evaluated metering, you just have to understand on a Canon system, it's a tech thing again. So this is a brand thing that Canon cares about where you focus when you are in the default factory evaluative metering. That's always the easiest way to remember it. Spot metering is the other one that I would consider for landscape photography in general. Why might you want to do that? And I have an image that explains why you might want to do that. So waterfalls tend to give you 
a very bright exposure on the thing that's most important, right? Because if you have a picture of a waterfall, it's big, it's filling the frame, that's probably kind of important. So we want to make sure our exposure for the most important thing is correct. Spot metering will be the way to approach that more generally. It's not a bad way to approach it generally for all waterfall type pictures, where waterfall is very dominant. Who knows histogram? Who thinks they know histogram already? And that's okay, don't be shy, okay? Because it's good for me to know that. So this is the camera's computer telling you in a graph about how, how many dark pixels and how many not so dark pixels may be in your image. And this is applied both in live view before you take a picture. This is saved as part of metadata. So you can review it on any image you've taken already on your camera. And this is the same across all brands. So this is clearly not Canon specific. All of our competitors have this as well. In a digital environment, what you need to be concerned about is not having highlights of things that are important to be blown out, which means we lose detail. So where can you see it? You see it everywhere. So live view on a DSLR, you can see histogram. In a mirrorless camera, it's all of these available as an option. You can review it as part of the metadata in any save file. Again, all brands accommodate this. That's not an issue. Why might it be important? I took this picture here years ago. This is Garapada. Who, who is local to this part of California? So you know, so this is a wild Calale. Okay. I had trouble finding it yesterday. It was very sad because I've not been here in a while. I couldn't find the right turnout to get to the cat lilies. It was disappointing. Oh well, my coworkers can blame me later about that one. So this is the histogram for this picture. When you have a subject like a cat, who does flowers while they're out there in nature doing landscape? So it's the other half of the people that don't do wildlife maybe are interested in flowers. Okay, I, I do both. So the subject itself has detail, it has texture. If you make the exposure too bright, you will lose that. Completely makes sense. This is completely unrecoverable. So this is an example of a Japanese garden and the exposure is very reasonable. It's pretty straightforward. The visual of the graph should match the visual of the image. So lots of midtones, nothing super bright, nothing super dark. And it kind of matches this. This is something I always like to show. So this one is an intentionally too bright of an exposure. That's part of a bracket. So it's part of a bracket, and this one was supposed to be super bright. And then people, who shoots raw? Almost everyone, yes? For landscape, I would expect almost everyone here to shoot raw. Okay. So can you recover it? This is the histogram for it. Can you recover from that if you shoot raw? Because a lot of people are lazy, and the lady is right in the front because she's shaking her head. Absolutely, you cannot recover it, because this is what it looks like when you try to recover with raw. The file is already overexposed, and the parts of the image that are pure white remain pure white. And there's nothing you can do about that. You cannot fix it in post. So always be aware of it, because you may run into this type of subject matter if you like taking pictures of wildlife when you're doing landscape. And the most important thing in this image is the brightest thing. And that brightest thing has feathers that have details on them, and you don't want to lose that. And I barely made it, so there you go. Okay. Same thing here. Who does, who has macro, who brings a macro lens also when they do landscape? I've talked to a few customers already that are doing this. Not the worst thing in the world. You see lots of interesting things out there. Okay, you get the point. So this is Yosemite. I would suspect more than half this audience has been to Yosemite, yes? Lots, lots and lots and lots and lots, okay. So this is a classic example of longer lens because this is from Tunnel View. So from Tunnel View. The normal classic, I think the official name is still Expedition Point, yes? So Expedition Point is the official name. That's the histogram. The reason I like to show this image is it looks like I have some headroom. So headroom meaning I can make the image brighter by choosing a longer exposure time and not blow out highlights. So that's the terminology I'm gonna choose to use. Be very careful with that because who is using RGB Histogram, that is not the fault, and a lot of your hands normally go up when I go there. Be cognizant of this. There might be some subject matter out there that is primary color dominant. Red, green, blue, that fact may be obscured by the brightness histogram, which is always the default. Be mindful, especially of those of you interested in macro and flower photography and doing nature and landscape photography. Blue, so snow can be blue, rather, at times be mindful that blue may be a little bit too bright, and here it would be snow. 
and you'd lose detail in the snow. And this would be not so obvious on a computer screen. Much more obvious if you make a large print. Then you'll see some issues where there should be detail in the snow. It's not there because your exposure is too bright, because you left your histogram on brightness alone. Okay. Classic picture of a rose. I thought it was fine, lovely, but not fine, because the most important color is a red primary. And there's texture in the detail of the petals that you cannot see anymore. And I thought it was fine back in the day. So there you go. So there are reasons to think about if you're not already doing it. Personally, I always do it to every camera I use. It's one of the first things I do is I change the histogram to RGB because I want us to be able to see this. Aurora Borealis, green dominant. And I want to get rid of my work nagger thing. If you just only pay attention to brightness, you might have an issue. So this one is safe, but you don't have much headroom. So this is something where it is motion, and you have to massage your shutter speed. Who has done a little bit of this, Northern Lights? Was it Alaska, or Canada, or Iceland, or Norway, or somewhere like that? I think I've covered all the bases. Probably not Russia. I wouldn't recommend Russia, necessarily. OK. Just a quick recap. The thing you always have to appreciate about histograms is it's a reflection of any setting that would affect a JPEG. Even if you set your camera up to only record raw, the histogram that you see is a reflection of JPEG settings. You are seeing a JPEG thumbnail. So anything in the camera that you can change, especially on a mirrorless camera, oh, it changes how the preview looks on my screen inside the viewfinder or on the back of the screen. Anything that changes that will affect your histogram. It's something to be careful to manage. All right, I'm done with all the techie stuff, and we can talk about the fun things like composition. Because oftentimes, especially because I'm a tech, I am quite bombarded by questions about the tool and how to work the tool and how to manage the tool. And the tool is the camera. But the tool is not the end of the game. Hopefully not. Hopefully not for you. It's definitely not for me. So this is a means to an end and not an ends of its own and of itself. The whole point is to do something creative to communicate visually. And that is what photography is. We're just doing it with still images. So this is, everyone literally has heard of this, yes? And I'm not going to say the words, because some people think they're naughty words. <laughs> I'm not going to say these words. This image actually works quite well for this type of composition, because we can kind of use this one thing to kind of approach it that way. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Because reflections are something fun that we can definitely play with. This is here. So this is Big Sur, so just down the south on the coast. It's very craggy. There is no real beach to actually speak of. And the water is really cold. So don't get dunked in the water. And watch for rogue waves also. So I would always never recommend turning your back to the ocean when you're this close. So sometimes you're actually really close like this. This is super wide lens. Because it's an 11 to 24 at 11 millimeter on a full frame camera, which is super, super wide. The classic, the most single classic way to approach landscape is to use layers. So I'm sure some of you have already heard of this before, and that is to have interesting elements in the foreground, something in the midground. Here it'd be surf and the rocks that are farther away. And then background for landscape usually involves sky. So that's why who golden hour, yes? That's why we always love golden hour because you're more likely to get an interesting sky. Because otherwise, a clear blue sky is, well, there's no other way to put it. It's kind of boring to have a clear blue sky for landscape photography. If you intend to have that and you want a calm, boring image, I call it boring, but we can take that word away, then we have a clear blue sky. There's no way around that. So this is also Yosemite. From what they tell me, I've not been back to this exact location. This tree is still up and about. Classic tree portrait, another classic example of we've got detail in the foreground. The tree is the main subject. But we've got a lot of fun background elements now. That includes sunbursts and also half dome on the back. Plus, it's morning. You can tell it's morning. Morning is good if you want more mist and fog. I think you've experienced this already. You're more likely to see it. Evening, less likely to see such things. Just weather. Just dealing with weather now. Quick recap, this is Valley View. That's what I call it. This is actually a, a turnout 
along the circle road in Yosemite Valley when you're about to exit, except you're not actually exiting because you can circle back the other way. I think it actually is the last turnout. It's been a while since I've been to this exact location. Uh, there was some photographer being super naughty. This is my funny story about it. There was a photographer that was already camped out in front of the normal shooting spot along the bank of the river and valley because it's one of the most famous views of Yosemite Valley it will be the Merced River along right on its edge looking back towards El Capitan. That will be one of the most famous. This is right underneath Tunnel View. And there was a photographer that had uh, traveled from another country, I'm not going to name the country, that had camped out there and then he was kind of, he was unwilling to move for any other photographer. So I had to uh, hopscotch over rocks into the middle of the river to avoid him because otherwise I'd be photoshopping him out of the image because he wasn't going to move, period, for anyone. Very unpleasant guy, but there you go. So in general, this is one of the fun things to do to emphasize foreground will be not squaring your image with your camera, with your subject matter. So squaring is something, does anyone, this is kind of a weird thing to ask, does anyone do pictures of buildings or architecture or artwork? So I'm going to name all the things you kind of want to square it with. Squaring means you want to have your camera parallel to the subject. You might imagine that's somewhat important for a building, or if you're trying to take a, piece, piece of, a picture of a piece of artwork, like a painting, it's also kind of important, or a copy work, if anyone's done copy work in the past at some point. These are kind of important things. So this is taking advantage of the fact that we are not squaring with our subject, which means when you take a wide lens, you do not square with their subject. Things that are physically closer to you become disproportionately large. We can totally take advantage of that with landscape photography. So aim the camera down a little bit, your foreground becomes disproportionately engaged and large, and it talks to you more. This is a classic example of horizon line. Are we thoughtful about where we put our horizon lines in landscape? It's kind of important. Do you think this is a good idea? I don't like it, right? Because it's, there's a lot of boring. I mean, clear sky. There's a lot of clear sky in this image. But all the interest is in the dunes because that's where all the texture is. So how do we manage that? One of the most classic ways is you manage your horizon line. You typically want to show more of what's interesting and maybe a little bit less of anything that is more boring. So the easiest way to do it typically for landscape would be place the horizon line where you think it feels best to convey things of interest and to hide things that are distracting or uninteresting. Same thing here. The reason it's, I would probably rather, I would rather have this have been a pretty sky. It was not a pretty sky. And that's because it's weather. So one of the consequences of liking this type of photography is you have to be a little bit patient sometimes because you can only do what the weather gives you if you want lots of sky in your image. It is its nature. Same thing here. This is a clear sky. So this is in Oregon, if you've ever been there, along the beach, if you can arrange the sun. So this is, this is always a thing. The easiest way to get a sun star is to get it on the edge of something solid. It could be a tree branch, or in this case, a gigantic rock in the structure. And then you have to stop down a lot. So this one, I'm sure it was, because that's how I always do it. This was F-16. So I'll always go there as my default if I want a sun star, for example. Who shoots outside of golden hour? Outside of golden hour. Okay. Good for you, because there are lots and lots of interesting landscape images that you can approach when you're not in the most favorable light. So if you're shooting sunset and sunrise, that sometimes can be challenging if you're staying up at night. Does anyone also do night sky? I'm really curious now. Okay, if you do sunrise, sunset, and night sky, you're probably sleeping in the middle of the day. Let's be realistic about this now. Okay, I get that. But oftentimes a lot of people, especially when they're beginning in landscape photography, they're thinking, I've got to just do sunrises and sunsets. Because it's eye candy, it's a lot of color. If you have good ones, lots and lots of color. And color is complete eye candy now. So it's an easy, cheaty way to get more interesting compositions. But what if your background is not sky, but it's rock? So anytime in landscape photography you can get natural structure, it usually means rock, but it could be trees, it could be other elements, 
you get that to be the background. And this is very famous. This is a crazy famous location out in Yosemite. Many millions of images have been taken that are almost identical to this, by the way. And mostly in black and white, I would say, as well. Yes. Um, no sky. It doesn't matter if the sky is boring. But also, it doesn't matter if it's the middle of the day. This is actually the middle of the day. Okay. You see where I'm going with this. This, this is, this is, it depends on your point of view. If a reflection is important to you, then this is not a good image. If you want to show debris, if debris is the star of this image, then this is actually very good because it really gets you to look at the debris. It's always a matter of storytelling. So in classic landscape photography, this would be not a good image solely because we've got lots of debris in the reflection, in the very sharp reflection of something very famous. And that's something very famous we would decide would be the most important thing. The next most important thing would be the reflection. So always distractions are things to think about in composition. In nature, usually it means debris, something that are, would interrupt the natural flow of a composition. This would be the counter example. So I always like to show example, counter example. Uh, Mount Rainier, if you want reflection and you want this really mirror-like reflection, I would plan on trying to do sunrise because it tends to be less windy. Always pay attention to weather forecasts, but if you plan on golden hour reflection, your better bet typically for most locations will be sunrise because weather patterns for most places in the world will tend to be windier golden hour at sunset and the more people to shoot around, which is very annoying these days. This is a good example of I was there to take pictures of Mount Rainier, but there are other examples you can play with to make things interesting because the clouds are the interesting thing here. Okay. So this is just a series in a big bracket of images I took at this location. This is a good example of rain. You don't see rain because I'm using a neutral density filter. So neutral density filter is a good way to make hard reflections softer. It's a great way to get some kind of reflection out of water that will not give you anything at all. So this happens to be just a big, big uh, ND, a very long exposure on a tripod. Okay. And you don't see the rain anymore. This is tunnel view. There you go. So classic, I want to show the classic one because this is super wide. But this is 200 millimeter now. Same exact location, same day, same morning, snow. Just you can get much more interesting compositions that are not normal, the thing that everyone else is doing is the normal thing. It's okay to do that, but it's also a great thing to think about what are some other compositions I can get with longer lenses that are not the normal composition. So this one, who has been here? Who knows actually what this is? This one is more obscure. You know what this is. So there are a handful of people. So this is in the middle of Oregon in the middle of nowhere, by the way. So the closest civilization is quite a ways, if I remember right, including rest stops and including gas. And there were warnings saying that for the next 70 miles, there's no gas station. So you got to be a little bit careful. It's out in the middle of nowhere. I brought lots and lots of lenses. The reason I always like to show this one is that, yes, it's a 400 millimeter lens I'm using for landscape. Because if you've been here, you already know that it's very challenging to have a good composition at this location if you use a wide lens because all of mine sucked. Maybe someone can do it, it's just not gonna be me because I tried and they all are not good. And it was actually, I liked the clouds this day. I got there on a nice day with broken, partly, partly clouded, cloudy day and that was actually fun. Super windy, good example of long lens, tripod, landscape with super windy and there's some funny things that can happen with stabilizers when it gets super windy. So with modern cameras, I think the old rule used to be, and this is why I used to always tell people many years ago, was that if you put a lens and a camera on a tripod and that lens had an image stabilizer to turn it off. That was always the old rule. With modern cameras, I would say don't necessarily always stay hard and fast to that rule. You should use the live view of a modern camera to evaluate which is better. Because sometimes it's actually better with a stabilizer on and active while your camera's sitting on a tripod doing exactly this sort of thing because that's what I did. So my images with image stabilizer at this scene, it was crazy windy by the way, 
the ones with stabilizer on with the whole camera on a tripod, they were sharper than the ones that were with a stabilizer off on the tripod because everything was vibrating slightly because, yes, it was that windy. Okay. So just be mindful of that. Modern cameras tend to work this way. So on our mirrorless cameras, by default, a lot of our modern cameras use electronic first curtain. Some of you may remember the macro people that are Canon people, will, they will know exactly what this means and why it's beneficial. But I'll explain to everyone. So by default on an R5, R6, this is how Canon cameras work. It just means that instead of having two physical focal plane shutters opening and then following and closing, the first curtain is completely synthetic. It's electronic. So you know have no vibration from anything moving just before the exposure. So this is pretty cool. So this is default on like an R5, R6, R6 Mark II, default. That's how it works. My general suggestion is to just leave it that way. In general, for a landscape, nature, macro photography, just keep it there. There's no reason to choose these other things for you. And if you have other questions about that, ask me. Either afterwards, I'm making time, I'm making headway, or afterwards at the table for Canon. So waterfalls are especially tricky. I personally love them. The two states with the most waterfalls in the United States should be fairly obvious. It's Oregon. She already knows that she's been everywhere in Oregon, apparently, and also Washington State. So these are the two big states with humongous. I think each state has over 400 waterfalls. Crazy, crazy number. So waterfall, I used to do this a lot, which is what's the earliest rule you learn in composition is to fill the frame with things that are interesting. So I always like to use this as the counter example because I ended up liking these a lot more. It's the same subject, the same day, but I like the greenery of framing the main subject rather than having the whole main subject fill up the frame. So just a quick reminder that even though in landscape photography, oftentimes we shoot landscape orientation, don't forget about also shooting vertical and vice versa. If you think vertical is best, don't forget to try this because you may never know. Later when you re-look at these images, wait a minute, I like the other one a lot better. And it's like, I wasted my time doing too much of the other one. I don't have many good images the other way. Because sometimes it can be very difficult on the scene to evaluate what's going on and what might be preferred. With a digital camera, it doesn't cost you. That's the thing. Storage is cheap. Take extra images just in case you prefer it the other way. If you don't like it, you can always delete it off your hard drive later. It's no big deal. Okay, so oftentimes the default in the waterfall is to show something smooth. This is smooth and chunky. I like it. It's one of those smooth and chunky ones. It's very classic. This can be also useful. Same subject, same day. The difference is instead of wide lens, long lens, fast shutter speed. Water that falls never looks the same second to second. That's the interesting thing. So technically here, I took a lot of images because each image looks slightly different on its own. And this is where you can see the shapes of water as it falls that vary from moment to moment. And that's something fun. And I was the only one doing it. I'm, only, I'm always the only one doing this. But someone else might be interested in doing this once in a while. Okay. This one. Polarizers. Who uses polarizers? Who at least packs them? Sometimes I get lazy, but it's probably a good idea. Okay, so the whole point of this is I want to show you the difference. Okay, this is not fakery because I think that's so cheesy when people say it's a, it's a sim simulated view. Those words I don't like. I like showing the real things, and the real things sometimes mean the difference isn't big. Um, in this case, the real thing means that this difference is rather substantial in this instance. And that is the whole point of the polarizer, and you see that on the left, is to suppress polarizing light. And you can see much more of the detail of the rocks in the foreground. It becomes immediately obvious. It's a different type of image. For some of you, you may prefer the image on the right for this certain aesthetic, but it's different. It's just different. I prefer the left. And that's how I normally would do it. I had to go find this one. It was stuck in some hard drive from like eight years ago. I had to go find it. I knew I did it in the past. This one also is fairly close because it is notable for being one of the few waterfalls that empties into the Pacific Ocean. So this stuff, the, the water you see is Pacific Ocean water. This is about an hour and a half south of here. Some of you have been to this exact location, by the way. It's crazy touristy. This is the one other reason I bring long lenses to 
places I believe might be tourist ridden is because I can shoot around people. Because there's like people hovering all around me and I'm not there to take a cell phone picture. I'd actually try to get a better one. And there, when I visited there last, this is the only time of day I get there. So it was the middle of the day. So it sucks to be me, but there you go. Because I was going somewhere else for um, sunset. This one, I like this one a lot because this, for this park in Oregon, this is the best waterfall in that park. The thing I never liked about this particular image was the, the log in the foreground that got stripped of its bark because its color really stands out. So unless the story of this image is about the log, this is not a good image. So one of the easiest fixes is, of course, to go monochromatic because we're neutralizing color. It's always a cheesy thing I used to do with uh, concert photography. It's just cheat, get rid of the obnoxious color, make it monochromatic instead. So it's, a, it's an easy save of an otherwise unusable image. There you go. Macro, I know a number of you, who owns a macro lens? Wow, okay, good. I have more stuff I can talk to you about at the table because it can get a little complicated. But you can do all sorts of fun things with macro because natural subject matter is all around you when you're around for landscape photography. It's one of the easiest things to do because it sits everywhere around you. And I know a number of you do something like this. Okay, so something like this, you're already out there the key to this is always about finding skies that are darker. The darker the sky, the more of the Milky Way you will see. So in the Northern Hemisphere, you have to face south to see the Milky Way. So you have to think about what other man-made subject matter may be off in the distance that is bright. Because if you have a city to the south, that will have a lot of artificial light that will make it more difficult to see the Milky Way. So just be aware of that. I do always like to mention it because a lot of people who do landscape, they don't mind staying. Those of the those folks, a lot of them don't mind staying overnight to do some Milky Way because this has gotten way more popular over the last 10 years. This is Yosemite. I only bring this up because many of you have been to Yosemite. This is one of the few places where I have found the use of tilt shift lenses to be quite interesting because the valley itself is quite narrow. Who has used a tilt shift lens? at some point in the past. It's the normal small number, and I expected you, sir, to use a tilt shift lens, of course. All right, so anytime you are in a space where you want to maintain the perspective of a subject and not change it, now, I'll keep my language very simple like this, the shifting aspect of a tilt shift lens can be rather handy in natural photography. I promise someone this, and I think he might be in the audience, actually. I promise to show you vert vertical panel. So each image is from a one tilt shift lens that has been shifted out of place, up and down. And then each individual one of these three is actually a bracket, an exposure bracket. So this is HDR panel. So 21 images ended up making these three, which ends up making one image that's like that. So this is good for a, like a banner. If I want to make a really large banner, because there's a ton of resolution in here. So anytime you're doing panel, I know a number of you do panel. Do any of you own like a, a slider for nodal point? Do we know what nodal point is? It is very specific to panel. So I explain very quickly. That's oh, OK. I have a few minutes, so I can explain this. OK, visual aid. So when you're doing panel, oftentimes we Mostly horizontal. That's why I wanted to show you a vertical example, at least. A lot of horizontal. But if you rotate the view from the camera, from the tripod, there could be some issues in terms of things that are a little bit straighter in the image and being difficult to make them look the way they should. I will leave it at that, because I'm not going to show you a bad example of this sort of thing. Uh, a nodal point slider is to accommodate the fact that when you rotate a camera for pano, you should rotate it around the optical center of your imaging system. Now, the optical center of your imaging system is physically within the lens. So you can actually rotate from underneath the lens. So there are tools that allow you to reposition the camera over a tripod such that when you rotate, you're rotating right the, the optical center where you should be and you avoid some parallax issues. That is the technical term to avoid. And so if you're doing hardcore pano, that is, for those of you doing hardcore, you already know this. You probably have a tool like this already, and that's pretty normal to use it that way. Uh, the tilt shift is always the quick and easy way of doing it, because you don't need to even accommodate for that. 
I'm just shifting a lens in order to produce a panel in this circumstance. And then finally, this. This is probably the most challenging thing to explain. So, because I'm ahead of time, I will spend a minute to explain this. So, have you attempted to take a picture? Spring, this will be spring. Flowers, windy day. What have you noticed when you try to take a picture of a field of flowers, super windy on a spring day? You notice that you tr if you want flowers to be sharp, you may not always want that. If you want flowers to be sharp like this, you have to use a faster shutter speed. There is no way around that. You have to use a faster shutter speed if you want sharp flowers on a windy day. That combination. Given that you have all of that, there's a conflicting interest, and you see it in this image. What if you also want flowers in the foreground to be sharp, and you want the trees in the background to also be sharp? What do we normally do for that? We stop down a lot, yes? So what happens when you use a fast shutter speed and you stop down a lot? Not much light gets to the camera, and then we use some crazy high ISO now. So this is a kind of a weird combination. In a natural world, this is the only example I can think of where we would encounter it. So this is where tilt shift can be somewhat advantageous for those of you who've never tried it, because it's the one lens where you can flip around your focal plane. It is so bizarre. Every other lens we make, anyone makes, your focus plane is always parallel to the imaging sensor, imaging area. If it's film, it's film. If it's a digital sensor, digital sensor. It doesn't matter. Always parallel. When you're using a tilt shift lens, it's not necessarily always parallel, really super cool, because we can tilt to change what's in focus in the scene in front of us. And we're just tilting so that the focus plane actually lies along the ground in front of us. It is bizarre. It is very cool. If you have more questions, you ask me at the table, because that requires a long explanation now. But in the natural world, this would be a very practical application. It is incredibly specific. So this would only apply if you know you're going to take a picture of flowers, and you want them to be sharp, and you want lots of depth of field, and you know it's going to be windy. There you go. <laughs> then you use this one. OK. And that's me. If you have any questions, I probably have five minutes to take questions before I need to vacate the podium. You know, feel free to ask them. I will repeat them, because it would be very hard for anyone else to hear your questions. Does anyone have a question right now? Are we doing OK? Yes, ma'am. TSCs work just like all the other OEMs. Oh, yes. So the question is for Canon tilt shift lenses, they are EF mount. Having said that, if some of you, and I know some of you do, some of you own a modern Canon mirrorless camera, like an R5, R6, doesn't matter, R7, just use the adapter. It's regular EF mount. Nothing tricky. It works as it should. Um, Canon currently does not make any RF mount tilt shift lenses. And that's all I can say about that. Thank you. So the, the picture of the calla lily in Garapata State Beach, where, where did you, what part of the flower did you decide to focus on? Oh, fancy one. OK, yeah, so I took a, it was a sunset where the, you could actually see sun in Garapata, which is weird, because it's mostly cloudy and marine layer in Garapata. So that one, uh, it's a little tip on the end of the calla lily as a profile. Because the rest of it is very translucent, and you can't see much detail. I was OK with the rest of it being soft. So where did I focus on it? Just a little tip where you see that little edge coming out on the end of it. Uh, reference to shooting birds in flight. I understand that people use a mechanical shutter over electronic because of the rolling shutter effect. Could you please? Fancy Ex questions all day today. That? I am a tech, right? So I can answer all. And supposedly, That's they great. pay me to answer these questions. And you're wearing right? a okay. Canon shirt, too. So the rolling shutter, I don't have good examples to show you because it was more of a landscape-oriented class. So I, I will describe it this way. Have you ever seen a picture of a golf club where it was bent the wrong way in a picture? That is rolling shutter. Okay. Rolling shutter comes from the fact that when you capture a still image, not all parts of the capturing area capture everything out there at the identical moment in time. Because of this fact, and that's because the shutter has to move out of the way, by the way. There you go. That's the technical explanation of how this all works. All cameras have some degree of rolling shutter, except for one. I'm not going to even mention it. 
because still cameras don't have that, that, that feature. There are a few video cameras with it. We have some consequence. So generally, electronic shutters have more rolling shutter. So for those of you interested in flying birds, because the wings are moving around, and you want to keep the shape the way it's supposed to be, because you're very picky about such things, I would avoid electronic shutter except for the few very expensive cameras from Canon and Nikon and Sony that have very fast electronic shutters now. So I would generally avoid that for most cameras. I would use mechanical shutter, mechanical shutter or electronic first curtain. But I would definitely avoid a fully electronic shutter for most cameras. Any additional questions before I vacate? OK, so that's a wrap. Thank you, Peter. If you do have more questions, you can go visit Peter at, um, for the next hour at the Canon booth and chat with the rest of the Canon professionals. They'll answer all your questions. I said before, let's stump them. They're tech refs. They should know everything. So bring those, bring those hard questions. Write them down and bring them on over. Thanks. They should know everything, so bring those, bring those hard questions. Write them down and bring them on over. Thanks.
Tired of playing, playing with his bow and his arrow. Yeah, I'm gonna get my heart away, leave it to the other boys I never played. Been tempted too long, gone. Give me a reason to love you.
doesn't look like some woman. Take a little look from the outside if you can. Look at me now, my little gentleman. Thank <laughs> you. 
end up across the street in half a room with no divide to block the view. My concentration was in jeopardy. Had to head up north, but went looking for you. Am I on? Whoop. Yes. Greetings, young Skywalker. The Force is strong with you. All right. So in your pocket? That's fine. Yeah, I got it. Okay. So what I want to do is to show you something that all modern cameras do, and I believe the Sony now does it. I didn't quite mean it the way it came out, but... The, I, whatever the latest number is, my understanding is that what I'm about to talk about, it now does. The previous ones do not. Which is called focus shift or um, focus stacking. You can now do it in the computer. I created a technique called image harvesting. And I made a lot of money teaching it. And then camera companies put me out of business. And to which I say, yes! What you can get a camera to do, and once we get this to do this, is you can get a camera to take up to 300 different slices of a picture. You can then, in software, assemble said 300 slices of the picture. And if you want, you can literally defy physics and have absolutely everything in focus. Cool, huh? Why you would want everything in focus, I don't know. But you can, and as soon as I get this back, I can show you and I can't move except for here. Because right here is where I don't cross the speakers. Okay. I have to make it more complicated. This was my idea. It worked at home. You kind of feel like the, you know, the, the great British baking show where they always say, you know, but it works so well the entire week. Um, if not, can we, I, can I manually do that, like hop to the camera, then hop to the computer? Um, just trying to get a signal from your laptop. Yeah. Okay, so what I want to do is I'm going to show you there's near focus photography, macro focus photography, extension tube photography, and diopter close up photography. And what those look like is. This is, a set of ex this is a set of extension tubes. Now, I bought two sets, and the reason why I, I bought two sets is because I have found that what I have to do is sometimes extend that far. There's macro photography, which is where I can zoom right in, and then there's near focus photography. And what near focus photography is for close up is where you find the point at which the camera focused closest. For example, I want to use an 85 1.8 because I want the 1.8 bokeh. That word's pronounced bokeh. Boca is a city in Florida. Bokeh rhymes with okay. So bokeh is a quality of blur. Now, a, a thing that we do is we are taught to pay attention to focus. Focus, 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 it has to be in focus. Focus, 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 focus. But if physics is really clear on this, um, there's only one thing that's in focus when you're using a fixed lens like this, not a one that can do tilt shift. And my, use my favorite word in photography, introduces the Scheim-Flug principle. 
It's a hell of a word, isn't it? Scheinflug, which is being able to do this. The only thing that's in focus is that which the lens is physically focused upon and anything that crosses the plane of focus. Stopping the lens down doesn't give you more stuff in focus. Stopping the lens down just increases the area of acceptable out of focus. If you want four things in focus, you need four photographs. If you want the whole photograph in photo focus, you need up to 300 photographs. It's true. <gasps> it's mirrored, so it's not extended. It's mirrored, so whatever you see here will go up on that's, the That's okay. Can I get the camera? Of course I do. Do you have a, where's that long, I can do it. Where's that, I think I can do it. The long um, uh, USB-C cable. Okay. What, you're, what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna show you how to do this photograph. This is 72 slices. And what I'm going to show you here is Focus, particularly in focus and in blur. Now, 1% of your picture is in focus. 99% of your fo picture is out of focus. What should you actually be paying attention to? In focus or in blur? You sure? If only 1% of your picture is in focus and the rest of the pictures are varying levels of blur, paying attention to how the quality of blur is controlled and handled becomes a much more important aesthetic consideration. The pretty is always to be found, I think. I'm mad, I've always been, I'm oh, sorry, 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 sorry. It's been a long day. Um, the pretty is always in the blur. When you look at a picture, it is the softness and the geometric patterns that the blur causes that becomes the area of retreat in a photograph. When you're looking at a photograph, and tomorrow I'm gonna to talk about this at great length, when you're looking at a photograph, you want to control where the eye goes. You wanna have a point of attack, the in focus element, and you wanna have a point of retreat, the in blur element. If the majority of your picture is in blur, it's how you handle the blur to get it back to the point of attack, which is the area of focus that matters. Because it's all an illusion, it's a coin trick. That's all it is. And how you control the way the eye perceives will dictate how your picture will be received. It's not 17th century painting theory that's looking at this picture. It is a pair of eyeballs that is looking at this picture. I'm afraid of those speakers, truly afraid. Um, The speaker gods are mad at me. <laughs> Sorry. So, how am I doing? I was afraid you were going to say that. All right. Can you give me, Can you give me that like you had it, and then we'll hop to the camera, which is this. Okay. The camera is on which one? The cam. The camera is this. Yep. This is all planned. Truly. Really. All right, so blur. Back to this topic. Bokeh. Can I? I'm running out of things to say. <laughs> you had it, baby. I did, yeah. Well, um, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. I, uh, well, I can have your laptop. You mean my laptop right now? Laptop. Yeah, I can have your laptop. Now. And then we'll figure out the camera in a second. Okay. I just, need the, I just need the laptop. This is what we're going to do. We're going to do all the laptop stuff, and I'm going to show you all the stuff in the beginning that I'm going to do. Then I'm going to switch over to the camera and show you how to shoot it. Does that work? Yay. I love it when a plan comes together. Organization is the key to success. Be prepared. So in doing this, what we can do with modern cameras is we can do something called focus shift. And Nikon does it, Olympus does it, Canon does it, and Fuji does it. And Sony, my understanding is, will do it. 
There is a way to do it if your camera doesn't do it, which is you pick a series of points, you make decisions about it, and then you shoot. The key is to know some things about your lens. First, what is its maximum aperture and what is its critical aperture? Critical aperture is where the light is most evenly distributed across the sensor plane, which derives or delivers the sharpest picture. Stopping a lens down to f16 does not give you the sharpest picture. It increases the area of acceptable out of focus, but it can actually soften the edges of the sharp parts of the picture. That's diffraction. So determining what the critical aperture of a lens is, is important. Basically, anything below 2.8 is f4.5, f5.6. 2.8 is f8, 4.5 is f11. So between f8 and f11, and that's the rule of thumb, that's, if you do the math, gives you the sharpest possible picture. So you need to make some decisions about the picture. <gasps> Say it isn't so. <laughs> OK, so bokeh. I'm using camera. a camera. Okay, unplug that, plug to my camera. We're good. Bokeh. Okay. You hear that? Okay. I went on the internet and found somebody that could say it correctly that spoke Japanese. Bokeh is the correct way, and it's a quality of blur. So, to show you this picture, this is the BTS. This is how much effort went into it, and I'm using a ring light. This is everything in focus. Is this picture interesting or does it look like a seed packet? <laughs> or something from the Encyclopedia uh, Berica? This is the same image, except this is at F14, and then this is at F56. How did you do that? Focus shift. The beauty of focus shift is, and I'm going to show you as soon as I get the camera, that I can slice it, slice it to where I like the focus at f1.4, and then I can come back and slice it at f5.6 to get the critical aperture of the lens so I have the sharpest elements and I have the prettiest blur. The beauty of where we are today is that impossible is just an opinion. And that opinion of impossibility is derived by the person that is sitting in the same chair you are. You define impossible. If you can imagine it, you can create it. Which I think is the coolest thing in the world. So, what I did here with this image I'm not asking you to do that is I took 150 slices of this image come on Jeez. Let's try this. I took 150 slices of this image and then picked the 75 that I liked. And how I determined that was where was the edge of the focus here and where was the pretty of the blur here. I found the nearest element in the picture. And I'm going to show you how to do that using something called focus peaking. How many people know what focus peaking is? Okay. Pretty much everybody's camera does it. I don't know of a modern camera that doesn't do it. This was one of those, you know how you, you make, accidentally do something and you go, no way. <laughs> but I'll take total credit for brilliance on this. So what I do is I use the manual focusing capability of the lens and I move it using focus peaking to find the thing nearest the camera. You got it. OK, that's exactly what I did. Because you never guess what's closest to the lens. Have you noticed that? It's always, how did, no, that can't possibly be. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the Godox ring light. And what's cool about this ring light is that it has the ability to have a left side, 
a right side, and I can dim it. Now, what I came up with was a way to side light it. I have a way to top light it, but the deal here is I want to keep you under $150. I gave myself a whole list of things because we can throw a lot of money and going, see how cool it is? It's only $1,500. To which you're going to go, see ya. So this is, you can do what I'm about to do with, we all have one of these, right? We all have one of these, right? OK. And this is a shout out to Paul Van Allen. This is not my idea, but I am going to steal it from this moment forward. And the only reason why I am telling you that it's Paul Van Allen that came up with the idea is he's here. <laughs> this was his idea. And what I'm going to do, come on, that's cool. Let's give an applause to Paul Van Allen. <laughs> Remember this, talent copies, genius steals. <laughs> and we're going to take a picture of this flower, and I'm going to show you all the different things you can do with the way in which the camera meters, and we're going to sh I'll show you how to make it a black and white. I'll also show you, time permitting, how to make the berries warm and the berries cool, all in camera. But wait. There's more. So let's first start with this. Which one? Let's first. I did mention I hate technology, right? Is that long enough? OK. Have you ever noticed that cords grow? <laughs> like underneath your desk? You start with two, and the next thing you know, you have a small little rat's nest underneath there. All right, so what we're going to do is, are you sure? Yes, yay. Let me show you how you set your camera up, and then we'll set the camera up. So this is pretty much true for more or less every camera. The, the theory behind it is true. How many are Nikon shooters? I love you. The rest of you are OK. Have you updated to 3.0 if you're a Z9 shooter? OK, uh, this, I don't know if the update for the Z62 and the Z72 do this, but I believe they do. This one feature is very, very cool. What we're going to do. is go to focus shift. You see that? Now, the reason why I'm using this monitor here in conjunction to these two is this is a calibrated color accurate monitor. And what I have found over the years is that these type of projectors or screens are not necessarily as truthful about color as one would like. So that's focus shift. It has a different name in a Canon Fuji and um, Olympus, but it's still the same. So you have start, number of pictures. So I can pick up to 300 slices. So let's say for this, for this, are you going to fix my? Can, can you follow me everywhere I go? Because if it isn't Photoshop or a camera, I'm doomed. So you can pick up to however many slices you want, 150, 100. So generally what I will do until I figure out what it's going to be is I'll shoot 200 shots. And I'll look at it and go, oh, I don't need that many. But I don't know, but you can go up to 300. If I want the whole picture in focus, I will do the whole 300 because the camera will stop if it determines that it does ha doesn't have anything to shoot. But if you're dealing with the 45 megapixel camera, 345 megapixel files is a lot of, a lot of file. So 
Let's set it for 100, click OK. Now, you have your choice of focus step width. From narrow, which is these little tiny slices, all the way up to big movement. The bigger movements are if you're doing um, landscape. I've not had as much success with landscape as I've had with close up and still life and things inside. Flowers, that sort of stuff. Um, I've seen people that do it. I've just not been one of those lucky ones to win the focus shift lottery for landscape. So I set it to narrow if you're doing this type of photography. Probably in the middle five. Okay, I think 10 would be too wide. That would be like you're shooting the Grand Canyon from one end to the other this way. So that, intervals until next shot. Um, I want this to go as quickly as it possibly can. And the reason why I want it to go as quickly as it possibly can is if it's on a tripod, right, it ain't going anywhere. And if I want to play with light and exposure, I can bring it down to a two second or three second exposure because if I'm in a contained place, there's no wind and stuff. Do be mindful though of your floor where you walk because if you walk, sometimes you can cause a vibration. So one of the things that I'll do is I'll hit it with a, if it's like a three second exposure, I'll hit it with a pencil and then chew the cats out of the kitchen and all of that. So just be, that's something to be mindful of is the vibration. But at fast shutter speeds, it doesn't matter. At slow shutter speeds, it does. Most important, of, of the most important, first frame exposure lock. You want all the exposures to match, correct? So once it determines the exposure, let's hold that exposure so we don't have any variation. This is new to the update. And to be perfectly honest with you, this was a gift from, to all of us for, that do this. First position auto reset. So once you determine what is the closest element, you never have to determine where that is again because it will, the camera will automatically go back to that point. I can't speak to the other brands, but I can speak to Nikon, and I suspect that if they don't, they will because this is one of those things that it should. This is the other thing to do, particularly if you are going to do multiple aperture, variable aperture exposures, f8, f2.8, f5.6, f1.8, is you want to do the following. New folder, yes. Reset file numbering, yes. Why, you ask? Why, oh, I'll tell you, okay. The reason why you want to do this is if you're doing this uh, uh, 150 images, the camera will do the same 100 or 150 images at exactly the same spot. So if you're doing multiple aperture capture or multiple exposure at different, uh, you know, light, dark, N1, N minus, that, by having it start at the same place and having everyone be in exactly the same place when it takes a picture, that means that everything will exactly line up. We can't do that but the Terminator over here can. It can always line back up. So you can save yourself all sorts of issues. One of the things you can also save yourself doing is when you load this into the camera, um, you don't have to use auto align the images in um, Photoshop because if you do that, you will pass a birthday. So you don't have to do that because they're already all lined up because you did this here. So it's all about getting life back and saving time to be able to go out into, the, into nature and see pretty things. So now that all of that is done, let us set up the picture. This is near focus photography. Now one of the things that I have that I use is I use the 
Nisi diopter, which we're not going to do today because that changes the configuration of the lens. And as much as I like to play with it, I, I like extension tubes and this. Um, now what we're going to do here is we're going to frame our photograph. Let's bring you down a little bit more. And this is also made by Nisi, which I think is a cool little thing. It's not inexpensive, but what it does is it saves you all sorts of hassle, which is macro rails. To do what I'm going to talk about, you don't need them. But if you get into this, this makes life so much easier. So let's first frame this up. Now what I can do here is I can move this in or I can move this back and then I can also move this side to side. You see how I can fine adjust this? The issue with doing this type of imagery the way I, I've found it is, oh shoot, oh no, oh shoot, oh no, oh, damn, oh no, versus being able to simply Now, the problem at hand here, watch, watch the screens. Did you see that blue line? I'm going to find what is the closest thing. That's where the closest thing is. If you only get one thing out of this class, please get that. This has saved me so much hassle and so much pain and misery. And also, please feel free to steal it and claim that it's yours. Because talent copies, genius steals. Now, what I want you to watch is the plane of focus. Because it, 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 I, I find that it tends to be a literary event with people. Oh, yeah, the plane of focus. And we think that it's the focus point that we're focusing on. Watch the blue line as I move it. That's the plane of focus, and it goes all the way up the lens, or so all the way up the frame. So as I cross this, see this? Anything that crosses the plane of focus will be in focus. This is an important concept to get. So we're right there. We have that. OK, let's go to the menu, focus shift. Now I pet the cats, make a cup of coffee, wax the car, don't move. So right now it's going to be black. Can you, can you see the green flashing light? OK, it's taking a picture. And what's happening is the lens is being moved like this. So I don't have to do this, and it's going to do it all the way through. Now one of the things that I, I do, and I know that this is, you're going to gasp, because those that know my work know that I always shoot in the raw, but not in the buff. Oh, come on. Right, no. So, but you notice where am I? I'm right back at the beginning. Now, one of the things that I can do, what I do is I will now turn off focus so that if I touch the button, it doesn't automatically focus. And you see, what f-stop am I at? 3.2. So what I'm going to do is go to f8. Now f8 is going to be one second. So that means that 100 seconds from when I push the button, we'll have a picture. So let's go to menu. Let's kick focusing back on. Let's start focus shift and hit start. Now, why I did that is I have one set of shots that is at maximum aperture, wide open. And I now have one set of shots that's at critical aperture, sharpest it can be. I now have my cake and eat it too. I can have the blurriest the camera can be, 
and the sharpest the camera can be, and I can put the two pictures together, and people will do this. How come my pictures never look like yours? Don't know. It's because I understand resolution and I understand focus, and the camera is now capable of doing this. All cameras that are capable of doing focus shift are now capable of this particular aesthetic choice. You can have the tack sharp shot. You can have the beautiful bouquet. You can have both, and you can have the improbable probability, or the probable problem, no, it'd be improbable probability, because you can't do it, but you believe that it happens. Are there any questions at this point? Because this is how simple that is. Okay. Do I have a question over here? Ah, there you are. Sir. Am I using a Z lens? I no longer own any F glass. This is the 105 2.8 macro, micro Nikkor. And I have this at near focus. I'm not doing um, macro yet. Macro is next. And what we're going to do, once I get this back, is we're going to use my favorite flower holder, the binder clip. I mean, we all have binder clips, right? Particularly if you bought a house, you've got a contract, you sign that big with the bank. Um, I'm now going to use one, oh, thank God, two rubber bands. Everybody got this? Now what I would do is I would go over here. I would then go to scripts, once I've loaded this into the camera. Load files into stacks. There is a step before this, and once I show you this, I'll show you that step. OK. I click that. This is in Photoshop. You cannot do this in uh, Lightroom or um, RAW processors. It's not something they do. This is a Photoshop thing. I load this in. I then will, everybody got this? You want to take a cell phone picture of this for those that are? This will also be rebroadcasted so you can watch this. No. You're right. It's not on the screen. One second. Come on. There you go. OK. So you go to scripts, load file into stack in the Photoshop part of this. How many people have um, Photo Mechanic? Right, for those of you who don't, it will be the best $80 you spend. You don't need the expensive one, the cheap one. Why that is is it's, the, it's, a, it's a browser. And what it does is it reads the high resolution thumbnail of your raw file which means that you can edit raw files instead of waiting for it to be ingested into the raw processor of your choices database and looking at it. You can pick what it is that you want, and then you can open it up in whatever software you use. I recommend using the camera manufacturer's software because it will give you the best color, but if you use a third-party uh, raw processor, I would invite you to do it that way. Um, so what that is, is it's you put it in, it opens it up, you pick the 75, or whatever number that is. You then transfer this over here, and if we look at this, let me turn this off, this is Photoshop coming in. Oops. This is Photoshop coming in and picking The, all the segments that are in focus. So you see how it says, oh, this part's in focus, and it takes all the sharp parts of those 75 pictures and puts it together and then leaves the blur where you want it. So what I wanted was the face of this watch in focus. This is my great, 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 great grandfather's pocket watch. And so I figured that would be cool. And so I have the face in focus and I have the blur here. And I have the cufflinks out of focus. And what I'm able to do when it's all done is have that. I can see how this matches up perfectly and it's blurred in the back. 
And you see how this is all in focus, but I have beautiful bokeh here. That's an improbable image. There is really no way to do this other than that. So now let's go to the next picture. Which is going to be quickly setting up a photograph using one. Grid, how many of you have these? You can buy these, Godox makes them, they're inexpensive, and you get a whole set of them for like, I think it's $45, $50, plus a, um, a reflector that you can use my favorite tool, Velcro invented by the Vulcans. And you can make a, a, Vulc, a, a thing to fit. So what I'm going to do here with my tripod and my rubber band is I now have a grid spot with the ring light that is capable of that. So let's do the same thing over here. Let's use the finer grid. And the finer grid will give me even less light. Somebody didn't put his batteries in right. Now, let's really, let's go macro. Okay, I like that, but I have some problems with it. What would those problems be? Boring? Out. You're with my friend John over there. No one likes you. No. This is a problem, right? So, one. Boring. <laughs> Here's what's really cool about my flower holder. Still boring? Okay. No, okay, good. Whew. Thank God for that.
All right. Here's a thing that I've observed over the years that I've never done, ever, is I make the mistake of, I see this. What's the camera see? This. So rather than going, oh my god, everything's ever, you see, you see what's happening when I move? That's the thing I say you need to pay attention to, is the pretty in this image will be how I play with a slight level of detail in the blur. The area of attack on this image is going to be how I hold your eye with these nooks and cranny hard elements. Because a very important thing to keep in mind about the way the eye tracks a photograph is the eye is always in a seek mode. It doesn't want to look at the picture. It's always so what's your job as a visual artist? OK, my job is to grab you, hold you, put two fingers in your nose and go, look here, look here, look here, and then have you thank me for it. OK? My other job, pardon me? Oh. 47 arrests, not one conviction. Just keep that in mind. So. You're not supposed to laugh at your own jokes. OK. So what I'm going to do here is I'm already seeing where the edges are. So I'm going to go to where I, according to this, that's the first element of focus. What's the most important, one of the most important things in this picture? That knowledge. And it will always go back. Now, what I can do here is, just by the way the camera meters, center weight, what happened to the picture? Matrix, center weight. We haven't gotten to playing with the light yet. I just want you to see this. Spot and highlight. So what's happening here is, and I can with this move it so that I can get the picture right where I want it, which is right there. OK. Let's move this over just a hair. You see how this is now a lot easier? OK. Oh, that's too much in that one lower corner. Do do do. OK. Problem solved. Now, what I'm going to do is let's go back to finding what is the nearest focus on this picture. Right there. It's that one right here when I don't walk and move, that was in focus. All right. So apparently, for the entire shot, I'm going to have to stand here. All right, so we got all that, right? Now the other thing that I can do is I can now dial up this light. That's too much. That's plenty. I think what I want over here is I think I want more light. See what happened? That's what's cool about these lights is I can control them. And if I have ways to modify them, what I can then do is paint with light. This was a, a lesson that my mentor gave me, a, a, a guy named Jamie Zell. He approached light this way. He approached light, he approaches light as if it is a solid object. Yes, if you're a physicist, we can argue that it's not solid, it's a particle or a wave and all that. But conceptually, if you treat it like it's a solid object and your subject interrupts the light, if the light's pretty, everything that interrupts the pretty light will be what? Pretty. I have a friend, my friend Lee, who's an interior designer, and he 
I stole this and I claim it's mine. Um, light are the jewels of the room. Light is the jewel of the photograph. The word photography, photographis, means to write with light. You are all light writers, and you wield a lightsaber. You have some other advantages here. You freeze time. Now, with this, you see how I'm playing with the light and dark of the image? And with just changing the different exposure modes, See how I change the image? By how the camera measures the light and how this is highlight metering. So what it does is it compensates for highlights. This is, I use this a lot when I photograph film sets, particularly with dark backgrounds, because I'll have all this light and I blow the subject out. What this part, this system does is it goes, oh, you want me to go for the highlights? OK. So this becomes interesting. And what I would do, what we're doing here is I would shoot the shot this way. Then I would shoot the shot another way with a metering system with different light. And then what do I have the ability to do? Blend them together. Using a piece of software that's not designed to do this, which is HDR software. Right? Because this isn't really an HDR photograph, but I can use the technology to be able to marry it all together. Because one of the things that I think is important to allow yourself to do is to not put your knowledge of things into boxes. Look at what something does, observe what it does, and go, huh, if I do this, it does that. That means that if I do this, it should do that. Don't just say, oh, well, I can only use this for HDR. No. I can make an HDR out of one file. I can it, go 1 plus, N, and N minus. And then I can use the software to put together an extended dynamic range, because I have two and a half stops of information in the shadow. I have 14 stops of dynamic range in the total file. So if I do that, I can extend my dynamic range, and I can fill in my shadows. So it's all about not getting busted. It's all about when you're done. When people look at this flower, my job is to make it so that what you see first is my picture of, the, of this type of flower, then you see the flower. If I can accomplish that task as an artist, I did my job. I made it so that you can see everything. Wow. I, I landed this plane. Okay, I have, I have one more because it would not be a Versace demonstration of focus shift without blueberries and strawberries, of which you're all welcome to eat some when we're done. So any questions about what I did here? I, I did two. This one here is Highlight spot metering, OK? And if I go here, this is spot, this is center right. In this instance, they're more or less the same. And this is matrix. I would probably shoot one of each. Why? Because I'm here. No, I'm serious. I'm here. And I'm never going to be able to line this all up again. So why not? You bought the camera, right? You bought the, f the, the card, right? You bought the lens. So how much did you pay for all this? Get that number in your head. If you only took one shot, how much did that one shot cost you? Your return on investment. But if you do 10,000 shots, your ROI is a dollar per shot. You saved money. You can buy more camera gear. <laughs> Try that on your spouses. See if that works. <laughs> I'm saying that you should look and determine what you like. OK, in this instance, I like highlight and I like um, matrix. It's not a, there's not a if then always, OK? It's a what do I like? Whose picture is it? Your picture. Does it matter what anybody else thinks? Well, I know if you're going to contest and you want the judge, I can tell you how you win contests and get more work. And I know this sounds like I'm an absolute ego pig when I say this, but this was a discovery that I made. I don't care what you think. I didn't make the picture for you. I made the picture for me because it felt like when I saw it. And if I can be true to my heart in my work, others will look at that and go, damn, 
that's cool. And that's what I'm after, because if you're trying to make a picture for somebody that you've never met, you'd best hope that they have good taste, because you've never met them. You have no idea what they like, but you do have an idea of what you like. And you got into photography for who? OK. So that at 4.37 in the morning, when you're finally done and the cat's tired of sitting on the keyboard going, it's time to go to bed, you have a picture that blows you away first. Because once you make the print, and I, I have uh, some prints up at the Epson booth and some stuff up at the Nikon booth, those prints are on their own little journey in life. Nothing makes my day more, don't get me wrong, when somebody looks at my pictures and go, wow. But if you don't like my pictures, my attitude really is, I know something about you. <laughs> to which I'm sure, in the comments, I am going to hear endless grief about that statement. But my point is, they're your pictures. Embrace them, love them, enjoy them, and make them for you. You will be happier. And you'll spend less money on therapy. Trust me. All right, the berries. Too close, you say. Pshaw. Pshaw. Now, the reason why I turned the camera off was so that I could do what? Hold on. This is at one of those weird angles that I can't see. All right. There we go. So right there, it's that green leaf. We don't like that green leaf. You may go. So I have my lead strawberry. See how close I can get? <laughs> Thank you. That almost was an expensive accident. Um, I now can take my 105 and get it even closer because what I'm doing is I'm changing the physics of the way the lens works without disrupting the optics. You sure you, you don't want to follow me wherever I go? Sorry. So I love these because this is a quick, makes any lens macro. 100, 105 bucks. Um, oh, do this, please do this. Got it. Please do this. This is my super secret email address. If you have a question, please feel free to send me an email. I will eventually answer it. Ready? Vincent at VersacePhotography.com. If you can't remember that, or my name, tough. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm there to help. Do, I, I'm going to be out of the country for the next six weeks, so I may be a little slow getting back. Here's the other thing you can do for me. If I don't get back to you in a timely fashion, you hammer me and pester me until I answer your question. You are doing me a favor. I'm not blowing you off like I'm going to be in Cuba for uh, 10 days and then I'm in Portugal on Madeira. So I don't know what my cell coverage is or my internet is. So I know that in Cuba I will get internet twice. Things are different down there. But I want, I'm here to help. That's my job. I live a blessed life and my job is to make your life as easy as I can possibly can if I can. Are there any questions here? Vincent at 
VersacePhotography.com. All right, I'll give you the other sec really secret one. Vincent.Versace at gmail.com. So send me an email. I'm there to help. I have three minutes before I get shooed off the stage. How can I, any questions here? Anything I can, was this, did I explain it in a way in which made sense? Is it, do you see how, much, how really easy it actually is? It's just tedious, but it's fun. These pictures are an absolute utter blast. And on that note, thank you very much for sharing some time with me. Thank you, Vincent. You're also doing a meet and greet over at the Godox booth. So if you have those questions, you can catch them for the next hour or so. Now you know.
Are you going to get a cocktail? Oh. Apparently, this mic is hot. <laughs> Everyone's heads turn, though. They're like, yeah, yeah. I'd. Oh. Why? Well, So that, that's how it works, right? So you click on that? Yeah. Yep. OK. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Is everyone having fun today? Yes. All right. I've been having fun. I've been over at the booth all day. So I've been talking all day, so I'm a little hoarse. Um, if you need me to speak up, just say louder. Uh, today we're going to be talking adventure photography. This is, this is what I do. So we're going to just dive right in. Here we go. Uh, quick introduction. Who am I? My name is Liam Duran. I live in Breckenridge, Colorado. If anyone has been to Breckenridge, Colorado, as you can imagine, for an adventure photographer, it's pretty much the ideal spot to live. Right out my door, I can, get, uh, I can be backcountry skiing, mountain biking, fly fishing. I have access to great landscapes uh, and wildlife, all within a 50-mile radius, even less than that, 20-mile radius of my house. So it's a good spot to be. So what do I shoot? I shoot well, adventure sports, adventure. I shoot a lot of backcountry skiing. I shoot a lot of mountain biking. I shoot a lot of kayaking and fly fishing. But in addition to that, I also do the landscape and the wildlife as well. Who do I shoot for? I shoot a lot for brands and magazines, uh, DMOs, at destination marketing organizations. Um, and I shoot for tourism boards. So that's kind of like, that, that, that's my general pool of folks that I work for. My inspiration is easy. Um, as a kid, I grew up in Colorado, and on my coffee table every day, I had National Geographic. You guys probably had the same. You probably had Life. I had Powder Magazine, Ski Magazine. I had the Patagonia catalog. Back then, it was called the, I believe it was called Chenard. I had all that stuff right in front of me, and I always wondered how these people did this. How are they making a living out of, be, out of adventure? How do you do it? But those are the people that inspired me, or those are the magazines that inspired me, and the photographers, Galen Rowell, Art Wolf, uh, Franz, who's here, those are the guys that I looked up to and, and, and that inspired me to do what I do today. So first off, a big thank you to B&H for making this all happen, and a huge shout out to Sigma for bringing me here to talk to you guys today. Um, so how, <laughs> how, do, how do I get here? Well. I was, you know, I was shooting on a, 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 an old crop sensor camera. I was at a 1.6 crop, and I needed a super wide-angle lens. So the brand name lens was, I'm sure it's a phenomenal lens, but it was quite expensive. It was more than I could afford as a young man trying to figure out his way through, you know, the adventure photography world. So I took a little bit of a gamble, and I got this uh, Sigma lens. It's Sigma 1020 f3.5. I put it on my camera. The photo on the left right there is the first cover, the first shoot I did with that lens, we landed a nice little cover with it. Same thing with the 7200, I wanted to upgrade to a 7200 2.8. The brand name one, phenomenal lens, but a little more expensive than I could, you know, swallow, more that I could want to pay for, really. So I bought the, uh, the Sigma 7200 2.8, and we got this next powder cover. Um, and if you look at it, it actually says, Colorado, we're looking at you. And the reason they named that cover that is because if you look, you can see his eye right through the goggle. So I'm saving a few bucks, and I'm getting great shots. So I'm in. Uh, at that point, Sigma called me and said, who are you? What do you do? What's your story? And I've been with Sigma ever since. So that's that little story. Thank you, guys. 
So this is what I do now. Um, all those things that were, all those magazines and ads and the adventures that I saw on my coffee table are on other people's coffee tables now. And that's pretty exciting for me. So how did I get started in this? Well, to be honest, it was like basically the pure fear of a desk job. <laughs> and it's kind of a joke, but it's actually kind of true, too. Um, you know, at this point in my life, I'm in my mid to late 20s. All my friends back home have real jobs. They have things like healthcare, 401k, dental. I'm making 12 bucks an hour in a ski shop. But I love it. I love what I'm doing. I'm having real adventures. I'm out there and I'm skiing all the time and biking and fishing and putting together all these adventures. And the whole time, you know what I have with me? Camera. So that time making 12 bucks an hour was not wasted. It was not in vain. That was how I cut my teeth in the world of adventure photography. Back then, there was no YouTube. Well, let me think about that. Um, where was I? So a career that almost wasn't. This is, um, adventure photography is very challenging. It's hard to make your way in this world. And I've had numerous times when I was almost bounced out either because I wanted to quit or someone was wanting to quit me. And I'm going to tell you a couple of those stories. The first one is that as we go through this presentation, you're going to notice that a lot of the adventures I have require much more than photo skills. You need, you know, you need to learn how to manage uh, avalanche terrain. You need to know how to rock climb. You need to know how to manage whitewater. There's all these different skills. So the way I learned all these different skills was at the National Outdoor Leadership School. Does anyone know what that is, Knowles? So I do a Knowles trip, and my dad buys me a little camera, two little kit lenses, 20 rolls of film. So for two and a half months, I'm out there shooting, right? I'm like having so much fun, I'm doing it. Here I am, I'm early 20s, I'm like shooting the backpacking, I'm shooting the landscapes, I'm shooting the wildlife, I'm shooting details. I'm like, this is it, I'm doing it, this is great. Load up all my gear, we're, we're, we're in Arizona rock climbing, all the bags go on top of the van. We get down to Tucson, there's one bag missing. My bag, with it, all the rolls of film that I had shot for two and a half months, gone. That was a big, big setback that really hurt. And it kind of put me back and I didn't really continue with my photography for quite a while. The second big one was, well, we're gonna fast forward now to the $12 an hour ski shop days. Ski bum, if you will. And I'm shooting, I'm getting better. I think my work is good enough to turn in. I'm gonna send my slides, yes, slides, send my slides to Powder Magazine and they're gonna publish me. It's gonna be great. Send in my slides. And I get this letter back and it says, Dear Mr. Duran, please take a look at our magazine and notice how good our photographs are. Notice that they are sharp in focus. Notice the composition and, and attention to detail, the whole nine yards, right? I get this thing back, it's basically, you are terrible. <laughs> but I didn't give up. I kept shooting because I have a massive passion for photography. I love it, it's so exciting to me. And you know, I've learned to basically embrace the failures and learn from them. And when you do get the wins, you know, chalk that up to, to basically a testament to all your hard work and, and, and not quitting. We'll come back to that story later at the end of the presentation. Okay, what we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna define the genre a little bit, tell you exactly what adventure photography is. I'm going to talk a little bit about what makes a good adventure photo. I'm going to talk a little bit about gear and techniques, and also some of the business of adventure. Okay, defining the genre. Does anyone have any questions? You guys, I, I'm used to these small rooms where people are always like raising their hands, so if you have a question, just feel free to raise your hand. Um, okay, well, I guess I should tell you more about the photography that's going on as I go through these slides, too. This is part of a big editorial piece that I'm working on for uh, Free Hub magazine. It'll be out in the, uh, in the, when will it be out? In the spring. Anyhow, outdoor photography is, or sorry, adventure photography is outdoor, outdoor photography that focuses on sports like climbing, surfing, uh, mountain biking, skiing, of course, that's a big part of what I do. Ski is a, a huge part of it. Um, but it can also be landscape and wildlife as too. That is definitely part of adventure photography. The other part of it is that, you know, Vincent was up here and he's got, he's doing the fruit and he's got the lights. You kind of know what you're going to get 
when you're doing indoor photography and things like that. With, with adventure photography, there's a big element of what's going to happen. You have no idea. If you fly halfway, halfway around the globe to chase a storm and it doesn't show up, what are you going to do? But a good adventure photographer, you fight through that and you get shots no matter what. There is no complaining. There is no whining. There's no such thing as bad light in my world. You go out and you get the shot. The other thing is that you're very much an active participant in the sports that you photograph. If you want to, if you want to be a rock climbing photographer, guess what you need to know how to do? If you want to be a backcountry skiing photographer, all that stuff. You are very much a participant in the sport that you are shooting. Okay, so I, I do have a couple little videos here. We're going to cross our fingers and hope that like everything works and it doesn't, I don't know, like sound crazy. But these are just like little cheap little quick phone and GoPro videos, but it's going to kind of bring you into my world. So you don't just see me here in a, like a collared shirt looking fancy. You can see what it really looks like out there. So here we go. Of course, there's no audio. OK, well, I'll narrate. How about that? OK, so what had happened just here is that, well, first of all, my 1424 lens that I rely on, and I bring it in the backcountry with me all the time, had just popped out of my pack and rolled down that 2,000-foot chute all the way to the bottom of the mountain. So I'm a little bit in like, oh my god, I just totally lost a lens. This is terrible. But the oh, wait. Aha, uh -huh, my man. Whoop. We'll start over. Okay, come on up, fellas. Hopefully, I can get in a shot now without the wide angle. I'll have you guys kind of come through here, but I needed that super wide view. Oh, I thought you played baseball, dude. I know. <laughs> You're like, I'm gonna be a hero. I'm oh, sorry, Liam. So, kind of go a little jog hard left. in there. Where we just ride the shadow and Yeah, down. exactly. But like kind of come from the shadow and then angle back from left to right through there. Okay, so that's what I do. That's, that's my job. That was an editorial and commercial shoot that I did for a brand and a magazine combined. We're multiple days out in the backcountry. So as you can imagine, there are all sorts of additional skills you need to be able to pull off a shoot like that. But that's what I live for. That's what I love to do. Um, it's fantastic. Okay, here we are. Now we're above the Arctic Circle. This is in Norway. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. Ah, I totally forgot. Yes, uh, the lens was fine. I found it at the bottom of the chute, picked it up, put it on my camera, took a picture, totally fine. Used it the rest of the trip. So there you go. Testament to Sigma build quality right there. Um, so anyway, here we are. We're going to kind of go through like the genre a little bit of adventure photography. We're up in Norway. This is earlier this spring. We're above the Arctic Circle. I see my four buds are in front of me. And I was like, oh my gosh, we have this flat lake and this amazing backdrop. I'm going to get up there, like scooch up the hill a little bit and shoot down so they look tiny in this giant scene. In addition to that, we had to take a boat to get us there. This is an island. So we we're like boating through the Arctic Sea and then they, you know, come into this inlet, drop us off and off we go. So that to me, it kind of epitomizes what adventure photography is. But you don't have to go far from home. This is basically my backyard. You know, I had to drive and do a little four wheel drive action to get up there, but essentially this is the backyard. You guys, anyone living here in Central California, you don't have to travel the world to be an adventure photographer. You can literally do it right here. So don't, be, don't think that you have to go to Antarctica or Africa or anything else. You can do it here. So what makes this an adventure photo? One, um, the headlamp, right? Like we've created this feeling of adventure by going up at sunrise, 
super early in the morning, it's dark, she's got her headlamp on. That's where all the adventure comes in. That makes it fun and interesting and unique. You shoot this in the middle of the day, oh, it's still a nice shot, but it's far more interesting when you do that. So, intense action. Oh, I love the good intense action. This is absolutely a part of what adventure photography is. So this is, and the other thing I want to note on this is micro composition. And this is really important to me. This is one of the reasons why I shoot at a really high frame rate. And I'm also moving. As my kayaker's coming down the hill, or down the hill, down the river, uh, I'm moving a little bit so I can keep him. If you'll notice, not his entire boat and all his paddles are free and clear of anything. There's no trees in front of him. There's no leaves in front of him. He's got the one spot that he can be. And that's not an accident. One, I'm moving with him like, uh-oh. Hey, that it? Well, there we go. One, I'm kind of moving with him so that I keep him in that clean spot as long as possible. And two, I'm shooting at 20 frames, well, 20-ish frames a second so I can make sure that I can capture that. OK, there we go. But again, it doesn't have to be extreme. It doesn't have to be hardcore. It doesn't have to be gnarly. Uh, it can be totally sublime. A multi-day backpacking trip through southeast Utah is a total adventure. But anyone can really do this. Your skill level, I mean, if you can walk and sleep outside, you can do this. And that's what makes it really fun. That's what makes it an adventure. This is a, does anyone know where this is? Coyote, wow, OK. Coyote Gulch in southeast Utah is one of the coolest hikes, multi-day hikes you will ever do. It's fantastic. The other thing I've done here is this is a five-shot pano. So I needed a wider angle lens. I had a 2470 with me, but it's not quite wide enough. So what do you do? Turn it vertical, shoot a pano, stitch it in post, and then you can get your full scene. A little trick there. So here's like four days condensed into about 15 seconds. I don't know what's going on. There's like something right here that's like shorting everything out. Well, you saw just about the whole thing. You get the idea though, right? It doesn't have to be gnarly. It doesn't have to be extreme. You can go out and shoot landscapes and wildlife close to home and it's still an absolute adventure. Okay, so I'm gonna try, maybe I'll move over here. Maybe I won't trigger that little short. Um, so what makes a good adventure photo? And this is important. Um, is it you know, for me, it's you have to be shooting with intent, and that's really important. Why did you pull out the camera in the first place? What drew your eye to the scene? Is it great action? Is it beautiful light? Is it uh, an amazing backdrop? Is it a storytelling situation? Why did you pull your camera out of the pack? Intent. Shoot with intent, and that will make that alone will help your photos get better. Okay, right here, this is pretty obvious what the intent is. Really intense action. Uh, there's no story component, storytelling component to this at all. This could be in the Zambezi River, the Colorado River, it could be anywhere, right? But all that matters is that we captured the action. Notice the shutter speed too, 32 hundredth of a second. You guys might think that 1 800th or 1 1,000th of a second is a really fast shutter speed. When it comes to stuff like this and you wanna freeze every water droplet and every piece of snow, Really high shutter speeds are going to do that for you. Anyhow, this is also a branding image. I was not actually on assignment uh, for any brand when I shot this. But you can imagine, if you were the owner of Waka Kayaks, that's the image they want to see. It, it sells their product very, very well. I should have probably contacted them and, and made a sale on that. Great light. Um, this might not seem like great light to you, but it was really good light to me. This is, um, this is a client shoot uh, I did in Taos, New Mexico. And all day it had been snowing super hard, and it was dark and stormy and kind of moody. And we were getting some really good shots out of it, but we didn't have any light at all. Then all of a sudden, as we were traversing, uh, my friend Amy, she's up above me, and I'm underneath. And all of a sudden, we get this glow, this really cool, beautiful glow. And we both stop, and we like, she sees the light as I do, you know? We, we work together as a team. We're like, oh my gosh, light! 
So all I did was, I was shooting in the dark. So how much time do you think I spent figuring out my exposure? Almost none. Almost none. All I know is that I need a faster exposure than 1 1,600th of a second. I need to darken it down a little bit. Just got really bright. And so I don't care. I'm shooting at what? 1 125th 1 of a second. I basically just spun the dial and watched my histogram move a little to the left. That's all I need to do. I don't care about anything else. I just, just make sure it's exposed properly. Have her come through the scene. She's a professional skier. If anyone knows Warren Miller, do you guys know Warren Miller movies? She's one of the women that stars in those, all those movies. Um, she gets it. She gets the shot, and we walk away. Client couldn't be happier. Now we're getting some storytelling here. This is a, a shot that I was working on for a story that ended up not running. That's always heartbreaking when you work on a story that doesn't run. Have you had that happen? Yeah, it's, it's tough. But the point of this story is if anyone's been through the Eisenhower Tunnel, if you're coming up from Denver and you're going to Breckenridge and Vail, if you look in the shadows there, you can actually see the tunnel right there and the highway. So it was all about, the story was about skiing in that area. So at some point, I have to put my ski action, I have to connect the road and the tunnel with the ski action. So that's how I did it here. Another thing we have going on, we have some beautiful light, sunset light. We stayed out, we're super cold, our fingers are like numb inside our gloves. But that's what we wanted. We're going to wait until that light gets perfect. One more thing I did here. Look at, the, look at the corner on the left. How do you think I got that snow to be like right up in it? You got it. I am laying down in the snow. And I generally do that quite a bit. I almost never take a photo standing here like this. Click, click. I am always down in a bush somewhere, or I'm laying in the snow, I'm crawled down as low as I can get into the snow, I crawl up into a tree. I'm doing something to create depth. I'm doing something to create interest. I'm trying to frame the action in some way, shape, or form, but rarely do I take a photo like this. Details, always show the details. They're really important as well. You gotta show the big picture, you gotta show the small picture. Not much too more to say about that one. Storytelling is really important. I'm going to tell you a little quick story. Years ago, and this is, I don't know, the early 2000s, and I'm trying to get jobs. I want to do more work for brands and magazines, and I'm showing my book, right? I have all my photos in my book, and everything is like rad skier guy, rad mountain biker gal, rad this. And, and the editor's looking at me, he's like, okay, okay, we get it. You can shoot action, but I need someone that can tell the complete story. What, what was the food that you were eating? What did the place look like? Was the hotel nice? But, you know, I need the whole story. So from a young part of my career, I started shooting this complete story. And that's what we have here. So the, you know, we got fine dining. We got a little travel scapes. We got the fish drying. So always shoot the complete story. Don't concentrate on just the action. Here's a really classic uh, storytelling image. This is a shoot I did for Bike Magazine a few years ago, and the story was all about avalanches and how they uh, may or may not be affecting mountain biking. We had come through this massive avalanche cycle the winter before, and so we had to find evidence of avalanches hitting bike terrain. So, once again, I crawling into this this is basically av avalanche debris, right? All the snow comes down, it smashes the trees, they're all over the place, they're buckled, and Snapped, I crawl into that broken tree, like cutting myself. It's totally miserable getting in there. And I just take that 1424, I put it right on the tree so you get the leading line and there's one spot for the athlete to be. One clean spot. And I just wait for, you know, I yell down, hey John, okay, I'm ready for you. He comes up through those little one clean spot. I pull the trigger, there's your shot. Um, it's also storytelling because it gives us time of year. It's fall, obviously. And in the mountain bike world, that mountain, that mountain back there is gothic in Crested Butte. And if you're a mountain biker, you know exactly where that is. So I've landed the viewer in time and place really quickly. And lots of all that micro uh, composition is going on too. I made sure that I had uh, gothic totally clean. I made sure that my mountain biker was totally clean. Okay, photo gear. What am I shooting these days? So the last few shoots I've been on, I've been shooting all contemporary lenses. I shoot a 16-28C lens. That's a brand new lens that Sigma just put out. Shoot the 2870, another new lens they put out, and the 100-400.
That's been my go-to for the last few months. More on that in a minute. You also need a good pack to carry all your camera gear, but you, you need a pack that doesn't just carry camera gear, it has to carry all your other stuff. What is that? Oh, wait. Well, like I said, I, this, is, this is the first time I've given this presentation. I'll show you this one. This is kind of fun. This is just me and my buddy cruising out doing some fly fishing photography in the mountains, using all that gear. Okay, so that was just me using all that stuff, having a good old time, um, putting the gear through the paces. I was kind of testing it out. I had just gotten the stuff, and I was like, ah, we'll just make a little quick video. So I hope that brings you into the field with me a little bit. You can kind of smell the fire and feel the coldness and all that good stuff. Okay, so this is what my pack looks like on a typical day if I'm going to go out for ski photography. I have my trifecta of lenses. In this case, I'm using 14, 24, 24, 70, and 7200. That's going to be, if I'm on assignment, that setup is going to be with me basically every day. In addition, my pack is going to carry uh, climbing skins. Those attach to the bottom of my skis so I can walk uphill. I have avalanche gear. I have the shovel and the probe. That helps me if we do have an avalanche. That's our rescue gear for getting us out of sticky situations. I have food. I have water. I have extra clothing. I have, oh, and I have a radio. That's another really important part of all this. We generally always have two-way radios with us so that we can communicate, both for safety and for art. So it kind of hits both things there. My pack probably weighs about, it's not as heavy as you'd think, but I would guess about 30 to 35 pounds, depending, uh, which is a lot when you consider I'm climbing mountains at 10, 12, 14,000 feet. Um, it's a lot. Um, you know, like, I think the funniest thing about this is people are always like, what are these little loops at the bottom of the backpack? You know what those are for? Does anyone know what those are for? Those are ice axe loops. <laughs> and you're probably like, what are they here for? So that's what, I, I'm like one of the few photographers that would probably actually use an ice axe, but that's what, that's, that's what those are for, in case you're wondering. Okay, but gear doesn't mean anything unless you're willing to do the work to get the shot. You can have the greatest gear set up in the world, but if you don't get up at 4.30 in the morning or if you don't stay out until sunset, shot's not coming to you. Uh, you've got to do the work. In addition to doing the work, you have to have the vision and the skill, the photo skills, to get the shot that you want. So that's really important. So why do we buy all this pro gear? Why are we here today? Everyone's going to buy new lenses and new cameras and all the pro gear. Um, well, you're going to see in a minute, this might shock you some people, but we buy it because it lasts. It's going to last us 10, 15 years. We buy it because it lasts the day. It's going to last a day like this. Oh, my God. There's more snow in your pack than on the mountain. <laughs> Whoa. Fucking camera's pitted. 18 inches at the top of seven. That's what it takes. <laughs> That's what it takes. So that might be a little bit excessive, but that's not out of the question for a typical day that my gear goes through. So when people come up to the booth and they're like, well, is it weather sealed? And, well, now you know. It is very well sealed. Um, it can take a beating. You know, I, I took everything out. I dried it off. I have a chamois with me. We went and got some lunch. 40 minutes, we come back later. We go out and shoot the rest of the day. It's fine. I don't think people realize just how much of a beating your gear can take. Not that I'm saying go abuse your gear. But it can do more than you think. OK, a typical day. This is just a screenshot from a shoot I did for K2 up in British Columbia. Um, 
but let's just go through a typical day. We get up early. We get on snowmobiles. We snowmobile 18K up into the backcountry. Come home. We shoot all day. We do all that stuff. We come home. First thing I do is what? Download all my images. Then what do I? Well, I'll tell you what I don't do. I don't clear cards ever when I'm in the field. I have enough card space to make sure that I never delete anything. I have what, I don't even know how many, let's call it five or six 64 gig cards and five or six 32 gig cards. I shoot those during the day. I flip them around in my little, you know, your little pack that you put your, uh, your SD cards in and I never delete them. So I come home, I download to this computer right here. I have another backup drive that I drop those into there and then I also have the cards themselves. So that's three points of protection for all my stuff. This is all assignment work, right? I can't come home, I can't lose it, I can't delete anything, it's gotta be done right. So three points of protection for all my stuff. Then when I'm flying home, I also separate that. So my camera pack is always with me. Never put your camera under the plane. Do anything you can to uh, avoid putting your camera pack under the plane. I've broken a lens doing that before. Actually, it was on this shoot. Uh, it was on this very shoot right here, I forgot that. They made me check my bag, and when we got there, a 12, what was it, a, a 1224 F4 was smashed, so I was out of lens. Um, good thing to know. Anyhow, I charge all my batteries, I clean all my gear. You guys saw me beating the heck out of my gear. I, I do take very good care of it. When I get home, I, I, I dry it all off, I pull the rear lens cap off, the front lens cap, dust it all down, I have my blower and also take a, you know, I have you know, a little bit of liquid. I clean off the front elements. Uh, I let everything dry overnight. I charge the batteries and as, as important as charging the, the gear batteries, I charge my batteries. I make sure to hydrate, make sure to have a good meal and make sure I get some good rest. Um, all that stuff is really important. If you're out for eight, nine, 10 days beating yourself up, you will start, your performance will go down if you're not taking care of your body. So that's really important too. Okay, anatomy of a shoot, the business of adventure photography. Oh man, the dark art of business. <laughs> um, every photo shoot is completely different. Every way, I've put it together in, in, in 10 different ways of, of how you get paid to do this stuff. Um, this photo right here actually isn't even out yet, but if anyone gets Osprey packs, th this will be in your mailbox in probably two or three weeks, well, actually sooner than that, probably next week you'll see that in your mailbox. Um, but I wasn't there for Osprey at the time. They are a client of mine. I do work with Osprey quite a bit. We were there for the ski area in South America. Um, well, let me, let me take a step back. When I go somewhere to work, I am never paying to be anywhere. If I'm gonna leave the country or even leave the state on a shoot, I make sure I'm at least, at the bare minimum, I'm at zero. I'm at break even when I, when I land. So somebody's already taken care of my flights, my hotels, rental cars, all that kind of stuff. It's already taken care of. Some, some client is doing that first. Ideally, I'm already making money before I even get there, but you never know. For this particular shoot, um, I was there for the ski area. I had two brands that were already supporting the trip, so they're making sure I'm getting paid. Then I come home and I take those images, and it all depends on how your contract is sorted out, right? Like some people want exclusive stuff, um, which is fine, they can have that. Uh, but generally, that's not how it works. I come home, I give client A their images, I give client B their images, C gets their images, and then I have, still have tons of photos. So what do I do? I sell those out to all the other brands that maybe didn't support it to, be, to begin with. I'm mean, like, hey, check out what we got in South America. That's how we got this cover, the Osprey catalog. Osprey stopped the presses, pulled out the other photo, put in that photo, and started the presses again. They're like, whoa, we're using that. Uh, and there were a couple other brands. Oh, and then editorial. So then I take the rest of that stuff and I move it into editorial. So it'll go into all the different magazines. Yes, magazines are still very much a thing today. I was talking to another photographer about that. Um, there's some great new magazines out there. Um, check out Mountain Gazette if you like this world of adventure. Mountain Gazette, Adventure Journal are two that are kind of new and really awesome. Uh, put that in your notes because they do really cool stuff. Big, large format, very little advertising, beautiful magazines. 
Um, so the bottom line here is that you want to have multiple revenue streams for every shoot that you go out on. I never go out and just have like, oh, I'm working for client A, end of story. Never do I do that. You want to have, oh, I'm working for client A, but athlete also has this sponsor, so I'm going to be sure that they get some images, and then I'm going to send it to the magazine. So you have multiple revenue streams coming in from every, any given shoot that you go out on. So again, it is a little bit of a dark art because people are like, well, what do you charge? I'm like, well, what do you got? <laughs> now, I don't have a rate anymore. Um, I just work within budget at this point. So if you ask me, that's going to be my answer. I'm like, I really don't have a rate anymore. I work within a client's budget. OK, Outdoor Photo 101, these are just some of the basic elements that you guys will need to master to get any of this kind of stuff shot. Um, first off, camera settings, RAW. Is everyone shooting in RAW? Is anyone not shooting in RAW? I shoot RAW. I have to shoot in RAW. Almost all my clients demand that I shoot in RAW. Typically, I have to turn in all my images as DNGs. That means they can see every, when I send in my DNG, they can go in and look at the history of the image and see every move I've made. They know, they know what I've lightened, they know what I've darkened, they know what I've removed or added. Well, I don't really add anything, but I would remove maybe spots and things like that. I'm generally shooting in my fastest frame rate. Your camera, whatever it is, it's going to shoot in five frames a second, eight frames, 10, 15, 20 now, and even faster. Um, I'm generally shooting in that fastest frame rate. I'm shooting at my lowest ISO possible, but that doesn't mean I'm afraid to shoot at ISO 2000 or 6400. I will use whatever I need, but when, as soon as I'm done needing that high ISO, I will dial it back down to whatever, 400, 200, 100 ideally. But don't be afraid to use those high ISOs. Um, back button autofocus. This is a classic do as I say, not as I do. I, like I said, I never had a mentor. I never was properly trained in photography. I had to figure this out myself. So I'm horrible old school using the, the shutter to do my autofocus. Don't do that. Learn to use your back button autofocus. It is way more efficient and a way smarter way. I'm just old and belligerent and yeah, I'm just stuck in my old ways. But that's the way to do it. Autofocus settings. The two main ways I shoot. Good old fashioned FLR, who knows what that is? Focus, lock, recompose. That's an old like film thing. I think I must have read it in a book because, well, because I didn't have a mentor. But anyhow, single shot, if, I, if, if the setting is more important than the action, that's how I'm probably gonna shoot. The backdrop is incredible. I'm gonna pre-focus to a point. I've got everything set up. I'm probably not standing here. I told you I'm not standing here like this. I'm down in the snow or doing whatever I'm doing. Pre-focus to that spot, call up to the athlete, hey Sven, I need you 15 feet right of the, uh, the, the last tree at the bottom of the slope, whatever it is. You should hear, our, I, sh I need to have one of those because like us communicating is pure comedy. Um, so I make the, the, make the call, we figure out where he's going to be, I know exactly where he's going to be and the communication is important, right, because I'm pre-focused. If he goes 15 feet to the right of where I'm focused, we don't have a shot. If he comes 15 feet inside, Shot's gone. So it's really important that we're communicating very, very well. Anyhow, I'm there, focus lock, I got it all recomposed. Okay, you're in, he comes in, makes his turn, there's the shot. That's how we do those. The other way we do it is AI, uh, autofocus servo, AI servo. And that's when the action is more important than the backdrop. I mean, this is all general, right? There's also times when I use servo and the, I'm shooting the backdrop too. but. Generally, if the action is more important than the backdrop, I'm going to shoot in servo mode. And really, at that point, I'm just letting the, the autofocus of the camera track the athlete as he, comes, he, or he or she comes down the mountain at me. So that's the other way. And an important note about that is that most people don't realize this or they don't utilize it, but your autofocus points on all your cameras, you can move them anywhere you want on that screen. Don't be stuck in the middle. If you want your athlete in the upper left corner, boop, 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 move that autofocus point right over there. If you want it in the bottom left, do the same thing. You can move it anywhere you want. Don't get stuck shooting everything perfectly in the middle. This is the key to composition when you're shooting uh, in AI servo. So here's a little quick video about that. Uh, one thing that's like super important um, for me at least when I'm shooting, especially in AFC mode and continuous focus mode, is to um, is that I'm, I'm sure to move my focus point out of center because I don't want my 
athlete center punched all the time, right in the middle of the frame. So on your particular camera, whatever you have, you can move that around, move that autofocus point out of center and put it wherever you want the athlete to be in your picture. So for me here, I'm moving it left and up. So that way she's gonna be kind of on the left side of the frame and then it's tracking her, her head so her eyes are in focus and that way I get all that background back there too. That's right across the street from my house too. It's a nice little spot that I can run to and get photos all the time. Um, okay, so going back to single shot or servo, what do you think this was shot on, servo or single shot? Single shot? Single shot it is, that's what it was. So this is a really easy one for me. Actually, I told you earlier that I'm, I'm always a, uh, an active participant in all these shoots. This particular day, I was on a hut with a cup of coffee on my hand and my camera on a tripod as these guys are risking their life basically skiing this vertical wall. And I'm just on the radio and the filmers are next to me and we're just like, all right, Corey, let's go. Come on, the coffee's getting cold. And uh, so we call him in. All I have to do is, pre I know where he's going to be. He's up top and he just throws a snowball and he shows me exactly where his line's going to be. Pre-focus to the snow right there, recompose, let him come through, get the shot. The other thing that's going on here, and you guys might not think about this, is there's a lot of safety. This is a really dangerous situation. There is so much snow that if he catches an edge and goes head over tea kettle, however you want to call it, um, he ain't getting out. It is so deep, if he goes head first, he cannot get out. So just out of frame on the left and just out of frame on the bottom are two people sitting there ready to go if something goes wrong. Now he's a pro skier and he did just fine. He stuck the landing and it was great. But we do have all that safety and almost all this kind of photography you see out there, there's, there is an element of safety going on in the background that you might not see or might not think about. Yes, sir? No, I don't use manual focus. Um, I mean, you could, you certainly could, but you know, and it is tough sometimes when you're shooting on a hot white snow. But I'm always able to pull up a little autofocus point. I bet I focused right here because there's a little bit of contrast there, and it'll pick that up. It's fine. No, full full manual. Oh, did I not go over that in my settings? I'm shooting in full manual all the time. I want control over, well, we'll just do that right now. Full manual, because I want complete control over what the image looks like. Uh, especially when you're shooting on snow, you have to actually overexpose, which some people, is very counterintuitive. You think it's so bright, you need to like dial down your setting, but that's wrong, because your, your, uh, your, your meter wants everything to be 18% gray. So you'll have gray snow if you shoot it right in the middle. You want to overexpose about a stop. Same goes for anything bright. OK, uh, same thing. This is a very easy photo. You notice I'm kind of shooting through the aspen trees there. I'm framing up the athlete, framing up the situation. All I have to do is pre-focus right to that spot. I know where the kayaker is going to be. He comes through the scene. I just hit the trigger. Uh, and we get our frames, and then I just go back and pick the best one, that being my favorite of them. AI servo or single shot? I heard servos. I did hear a couple servos. You'd be right. Yeah, that's a really easy photo, right? He's just coming right at me. I just want that dark background. It's a nice morning shot. He's coming right at me. The camera does a really good job of picking him up, and I get, I don't just get this shot, I get all 40 shots of him riding the bike back and forth, left and right. So then I can pick out the one that looks best for me, the one that I want to use. But yes, AI servo. Servo or a single shot? Same thing, servo. Amy's up the hill. All I really care about, there's no backdrop, there's nothing else to see. She's going to be coming skiing right at me at full speed ahead. All I have to do is keep that red autofocus point right on her goggles. That's the skill, right? You can't move it behind her or anywhere else. You've got to keep it right on them. And as she comes at me, I capture the entire sequence as she comes down the hill. This is actually part of a, um, a client shoot that also went into editorial. Again, I'm like trying to maximize the amount of revenue streams I get from every shoot that I'm on. Another interesting point here. 
Almost every cover I've ever shot has been cut out of a horizontal. Everyone thinks that you have to shoot vertically to get a cover, and that's, I mean, I do have a few vertical covers, but 90% of my covers have been cut out of an image just like that. Okay, flash. Flash used to be really cool and really important in outdoor sports photography. When I first started, it was like a huge thing, and people were carrying like Ellen Chrome Rangers miles into the backcountry, and they would make their athletes carry. Do you know what an Ellen Chrome Ranger is? A massive battery pack. And everyone was doing it, so I had to do it. I didn't really want to do it, but if you wanted to get published, you had to know how to, to, to use Flash. So I still use it today. It's still a good skill to have, and it's still very useful for getting published and just for creating unique looks. Um, I think I have a video for you here. Using, again, this is a focus lock recompose. There's a trail right there. I know exactly where he's going to be. I can pre-focus to that trail, and then all I have to do is move at the same speed as him and let the flash do the rest. So here's what that looks like. So panning shots like this without a flash are really hard. You just kind of have to get a little bit lucky. Um, you can't move your camera faster than they're moving. You have to keep them on the exact same plane as you. If you're moving faster than they are or they're moving faster than you, it'll be blurry. So generally when we shoot these kind of shots, um, we would shoot a lot of them just to make sure we get it. The other thing we can do, and I don't know if we're going to do it today or not, maybe we will, is we can introduce a flash. And what a flash will do is guarantee that our athlete is going to be super sharp. So we'll think about adding some flash in here and decide if we want to do it or not. But until then, we're going to do one or two more passes through, and hopefully we get a nice sharp shot without the flash. We'll see. When you see my flash set up, don't laugh. It's the jankiest thing. But that's not how I usually roll, I swear. All right, so we decided we are going to fire off a few flashes here and see how that looks. But um, to do so, I had to steal the <laughs> tripod that I was using for the GoPro. So here it is right here. Oh. Here's my little setup. I'm going to have to reshoot that crooked at the moment. We'll get that straightened out. But um, I'm using the Nissan system here. Uh, the Air 10S works really well. It's super easy. It's way easier than I ever, um, way easier time than I ever had with my, uh, what was it, the Pocket Wizard stuff. Those were terrible. Those did not work for me at all. So this is what we're going to use right now. We got the flash set up. We got everything going. So you're going to see a big difference between how we shot it without flash and how we shot it with. And you might like one versus the other. You might like both. I don't know. But we're going to shoot them both. So here we go. Okay, so that's shooting flash. Um, if you are shooting for commercial and editorial clients, one thing, one thing that you need to know is that you always have to have room for copy. There has to be a place for the words to go. Two things going on here. One, I, I very deliberately use the entire left side of this image for copy. That's where the words go. The other thing I did here is that I'm shooting through. So the dog came out of nowhere, got in front of the scene, totally wrecked it, but instead of just like standing up and be like, oh, dog wrecked everything, I shot through. I had this idea. I was like, oh, if Zuni moves over just a little bit, I'm going to get my photo of Michelle, and she's going to be right underneath the dog. Um, and and it, it came out exactly as I wanted it. When I, as I'm shooting, I think it's messed up. I'm like, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, and there it is, and then it happened. So shoot through every scene. I was just given the five minute warning, so we're going to like go pretty quick here. Um, same idea, commercial, you always have to have a place for all the, all the words to go. So if you do end up in that world, make sure that you're thinking about that stuff. Negative space is really important. Uh, writing is also really important. Um, back in the day, they always segregated the work between writer and photographer. Now it's a little bit less so. There are writers that are doing the photography and there are photographers that are doing the writing. So I think if you can write well and convey your story well in words, it's really just going to help out your photography as well. So, and if you're a writer, keep working on your photography because that, that's kind of just that world is getting a little more mushed up than it used to be. Okay, illegitimate non-carborundum. We'll just say, don't let the bad guys get you down. Um, 
Earlier in this presentation, I told you about that horrendous rejection letter, my very first time I submitted photos to a magazine. Well, I didn't quit. I told you I didn't quit, and I kept with it. And 10 years later, after shooting and learning and, and doing my damnedest to just get better at this thing, 10 years later, in front of about 1,000 of, of my peers, the entire ski community, that same editor brought me on stage and handed me the Photo of the Year award for this image here. So, 10 full years from the absolute worst to at least for one night, the best. I'm not going to say the best, but that night, the best. So that's, that's, that's what it's all about. It's this kind of photography. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's all about passion. It's all about the love of photography. I still love it. I'm going to guess that all of you guys have a strong passion for photography as well. Uh, because you're here. You wouldn't be here if you didn't care about it. You wouldn't be here if you didn't love it. Um, you know, how to get better, just keep shooting and keep shooting and persevere and don't let a little bit of rejection or don't let 20 ro rolls of lost film end your career. Persevere, push through, and enjoy it. Um, you might think at this point that I just get to like hang out and all of a sudden these great jobs come in and I just am always traveling the world. That is not true. The hustle never ends. I still have to have my foot on the gas pedal every day to get work. And I make the calls and I do the emails and I create adventures and a lot of them don't happen, but a few of them do. But the hustle never ends. It's always a job. You're always, your job is always to look for another job. I love that what it says right here. Where do we go from here? Um, I don't know where we go from here. This year I turned 50, marking basically pretty much halfway through my photographic life. Um, and I think more than ever I've realized that photography, adventure photography, is way more than a trip. It's way more than a single adventure. It's really the arc of our entire photographic lives summed up. Um, it's about making friends in, in, in random places around the world. It's about suffering a little bit. It's about the rejection, but it's about the wins too, right? Like the wins feel so good after a few losses. Um, it's just a way of life, and I, and I love doing it. And I think that you guys here can understand that because I bet it's a way of life for a lot of you guys as well. So that's what I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for coming out. I really hope you enjoyed that. Um, I'll be over at the Sigma booth to answer any questions you have. Come say hi. Tell me your story because I want to hear your photo life story because everyone has one. Um, and then they're doing cocktails over here in a few minutes. So, One more time. Let's hear it for Liam. Yeah. And if you're here in the audience, the fun continues with our cocktail reception. But if you're watching from home, we are saying goodbye today, and we will catch you tomorrow for a lot more fun, education, inspiration, and all that good stuff. So thank you for joining digitally. And if you can hop in the car and make it here tomorrow, we'll be back. All of you in the audience, we hope you're back tomorrow. We have so much more fun planned. And that concludes the Explorer stage on day one. Thank you.